Uh, okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we are ready to start uh, the proceeding of our annual Swahili study conference, uh, uh, the, Bar the Baraza, as you, many of you, uh, familiar faces, you've been here before. Uh, this is our uh, fifth, no, sixth Baraza, actually, organized by the SOA Center of African Studies. My name is Angelica Basquiat, I'm the manager of the uh, SOA Center of African Studies. And um, uh, with my colleague, Ida, uh, Dr. Ida Ajavayanis, uh, she is the, as you all know, uh, lecturer in Swahili uh, language at SOAS, as well as uh, um, head of the Africa section of the Faculty of Languages and Cultures. And we are very pleased uh, uh, to be back on campus because uh, due to the pandemic, as you know, we had to uh, um, we had to put on hold the, the Baraza, and uh, we are very pleased to have all of you here today. And also, this is the first time that we are actually going to have a hybrid Baraza. Uh, so we have uh, uh, quite a big audience online. Uh, I hope you can all see us. Uh, hello, uh, online audience, online speakers as well. We have quite a few speakers that will be presenting uh, online. So uh, we hope the technology will work. Uh, it's a first time for all of us, but um, hopefully Zoom uh, will uh, will hold on to it. Um, we are also uh, obviously very pleased to have today with us uh, uh, Nobel laureate um, uh, Professor Abdurraza Gurna. He's welcome back to SOAS because he's, uh, he's been at SOAS many, many times before. Uh, a lot more will be said about him by Ida uh, and by our the chair of our first panel, Dr. Lutz Martin. Uh, without further ado, I'll now pass on to Ida, who is going to say a welcome in Swahili, because yesterday the proceedings are going to be a mix of English and Swahili. So we hope that uh, those of you um, yeah, who are like maybe not so um, fluent <laughs> like me, <laughs> will learn quite a lot today. Uh, and so I'll pass on to Ida, who's going to take over, and then to our uh, chair of our first panel, uh, Professor Lutzmate, also our SOAS colleague. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for anything, you know, we are here and we hope you, you enjoy the day. Thank you. Yeah, habari zenu, assalamu alaikum, habari za asbui. Tuashukuru sana kwa mba meweza kuja leo, meamka mapema, mewahi, metoka marikani, ufaransa, na semu nyingine. Nafikiri watu wengi zaida watafika hapa mchana wakati wa biriani. Lakini <laughs> sasa hivi tupo sisi tunaopenda masumu ya kiswahili. Kwa hivyo mtaka tukusema kwa mba leo tutazungumza kiswahili na kiingereza. Kwa sababu hili ni baraza la kimataifa. Na tunakumbua kwa mba alisema malimnyerere kwa mba uh, kiingereza ndiyo kiswahili cha dunia. Kwa hivyo inabii tukubali kwa mba um, hata mimi nitakapo zungumza presentation yangu nitasema kwa kiingereza. Kwa hivyo karibuni sana na jisikia mpo nyumbani, leo ni siku ya waswahili ya kiswahili na Abdurazak tumefurahi mno kwa mba umekuja, hapa kuna wazanzibari, wa oman, wa mefika, wa mefurahi sana leo. Karibu sana. Lutz karibu. <laughs> Um, Santa Santa, my baby number one, um, ham jumbo. How about that? Boy, so I come, come out of your same man, Biangele, Camimi, Gina Lango, the Lutz Martin, and in the Mualimo Hapa, so as Katika, Chucha, um, Lura Atuma Utamaduni, na Isimu, um, na Furahisana, and Sisha, he matokeo, um, yeah, he has a boy. Um, Ah, Karibuni Water, Wam Kutanu Hubaraza, Hapa Soas, Nadena, Karibuna, Karibuni Water, Amba, Wana Giungana Nasi, Katika Duniani, Katika Tandao. Kama to Yusema to a hybrid Leo, Yani Kunawato Hapa, Hapa Soas, Nadena, Watuengi Nafikiri, Huku, Huku Katika Tandani. Um, welcome, good morning, everyone. I'm Lutz Martin. I'm teaching here at uh, SOAS in the School of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics, um, and I'm very pleased to uh, be opening our proceedings. Uh, we, ha we have a packed program, and actually, I'm very pleased. This is, like Ida said, the first Baraza after we come from the pandemic, and we've learned our lesson because we're hybrid now. And this is the biggest Baraza I think I've seen. We're usually in uh, the Paul Webley wing, uh, which is also a big room, but this is, this is bigger. It's really nice to see the Baraza growing this way. Um, our first panel is on translation. You will have seen that for the program. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is at SOAS, we have a long and strong tradition working on translation. We have a center of translation study, which is very, very active. We run a master's program in translation studies. 
Um, we have a BA program in linguistics with the translation pathway. Um, and of course, also we have a very strong center for African studies, uh, which Angelica is strongly involved in. Um, and we run a master's program in African studies. Um, and just this year, a new undergraduate program, BA in African studies and black diaspora, which has been, has been started very, very well. So I'm very pleased about that. So it sits very much in, in the, the remit of our, our school. Um, in terms of translation practitioners, we have a long distinguished history there as well. Um, a former colleague of ours, uh, William Radice, uh, was a translator of Bengali poetry. He translated the work of Rabrinda Tagore um, and was very, very acclaimed. Um, we have um, Mohammed Abdul Halim, who's uh, translated the Quran into English. So there is that, that tradition. Um, we have our former colleague and still very warm and close colleague, Shaggy Githyora, who is translated, I think a few years ago, um, Kaburi Bilam Salaba, the unmarked grave, as he called it, the, the Mau Mau um, Kenyan novel. Um, and of course, Ida Hajibarianis, who we just saw, she's translated um, Alice in Wonderland, which if you know Alice in Wonderland, it's not a mean feat, and she has talked a lot about the intricacies in there. Um, and of course, rumor has it, and actually we've just seen proof, I, I wasn't quite sure, but now I believe it. Um, she, she also has translated Paradise, um, up to, up to Gurna, Gurna's novel. And that we are launching that later to SP Pony. So we are very pleased to have also up to Razak with us today. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And of course, Ida to talk about her experience. Um, and that sort of motivates the panel. And then we have Adam Habib, our director, coming later to welcome us. Um, and then the official launch of the Peponi. And then in the afternoon, there's a number of talks on different aspects of Swahili, with the focus maybe also on, on diaspora, Indian Ocean, connecting cultures and going back to translation. Um, so I'm very pleased. To, to welcome you all here. Um, let us move to the, to the first panel. We have, again, a hybrid panel. We have with us today, um, Ida, please, if you could join us in the front and, and share um, your expertise. Um, we also have Salah Hamdani, if you please also, Karibu uh, Sana um, We have Clarissa Firke, who is joining us online. I'm sure we can see her in a moment. Wangui um, Wagoro. Uh, and also online, if joining us from Tanzania, Walter Mgoya. Now, let me say a little bit about that. Ida, I've already mentioned she is, and you've met her, and she is here at SOAS. You know, you know, I think probably the up and coming rising star of the next generation translators, if that's, <laughs> that's a good way of, of to describe it. And also a very, I mean, a very valued and warm colleagues. Her students can testify to her deep engagement with her subject and as a, as a colleague working with Ida for a number of years now, it's really a pleasure to be in the same, same unit. Um, Salah Hamdani is a former fellow of the World Food Program of the United Nations and has worked extensively as a consultant and in different projects and programs. Um, mainly on, on food, but also wider issues of development. Um, and she will, she will uh, you know, her, her career spans different places and continents. So we, she will contribute here today also a little bit on, on the, the cult cultural interpretation and cultural translation of issues in, in paradise um, and issues of Swahili translation more widely. Um, then Clarissa Fieke joining us from Bayrock Online is a professor of African language literatures at the University of Bayreuth. Um, and she has worked extensively, I'm sure many of you have come across her work, um, in particular on Swahili poetry. So she works on old Swahili, on this huge legacy of Swahili poetry. Lots of manuscripts are housed here in Soas Library, which are now being digitized. Um, and she has worked on, on manuscript traditions, on interpretations. She has translated and edited a number of old Swahili works herself. So we're very pleased to have her here uh, with us today. Um, then we have uh, Walter Broja, who is the uh, or was the general manager of the famous Tanzanian publishing house. So that was really instrumental of bringing African literatures on, you know, into the world, if you if you like. Um, and then even more more famously, maybe uh, he founded in the 1990s, and he is still the managing director of the publishing house in Kukina Nyota, which has established itself very much over the last 30 years, I think, as a major player in publishing African texts. Um, um, and also he then can speak specifically on questions of translation with relation to publishing and what that means in terms of a, a, a wider uh, literature market. Um, 
And I'm pleased to say we have Wangu Iwagoro <laughs> on, on time, on cue, <laughs> Asante Sana, perfect, perfect, um, who is, of course, from, from SOAS as well. She is a professor of practice here at SOAS. And we are very pleased that that came to pass. Wangu has been working in the area of translation for a very long time. She's been involved in different associations. Um, she has been involved with the African Literature Association, specifically there. Um, having a working group on translation and promoting that. Um, she has a, a project called Africa in Translation, which champions translation as a mean of, means of cultural, cultural engagement and, and uh, cultural communication. Um, so with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists, three here in the room, two online. Um, and I think I've hand on to Ida as the first speaker. Um, I should say maybe, let me check the time. If you, if you have maybe you know, five minutes to just maybe introduce your contribution, then we open the floor and the, the virtual floor uh, for questions. And then we continue, I think, um, at 10.45 when our director, Adam Habib, joins us. Is that okay? Very good, Ida, please. Yeah, um, hi, so I'm Ida Hajibayanis and I'll be talking um, about Tafsiri translation. I have five minutes, but I think I've timed myself. I think I'm gonna speak for six minutes. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that will be okay. So uh, just to start off, um, the Hamzia is, um, is just the oldest surviving piece of written work that we have in Swahili. And uh, this is a Utenzi, it is a prose poem. It's written in the Arabic um, or, or tradition. Um, and this was translated in the 17th century by a man called Diderus um, Uthaima. Um, this piece was written in Egypt in the 13th century. So it had arrived um, to the East African coast by the 17th century written, which means the oral version of it might have been circulating centuries before that. Um, and then I have, uh, we also know that we have a very strong and established uh, 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 a, tra a tradition of translating the Bible dating from 1847 and also later the Quran, although um, this has always been seen with a lot of suspicion. Uh, the first Quran translation into Swahili was Pastor, uh, um, Dale, no, that's not Dale, um, this, is, this is crap, was by Pastor Godfrey Dale, and he translated this from English into, uh, into Swahili, and, and he, he did not include any Arabic um, uh, script, which means that, of course, it was questioned from the outset, it did not have the original to, 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 okay, to carry it um, along. Now, I start by mentioning this. Uh, so this was the translation that he did um, of, of the Quran. I start by mentioning this because these historic moments are also captured very, very well in paradise. Uh, in paradise, we have a society that is cosmopolitan, established, and it is witnessing the onset of colonialism in East Africa. We have a character called Kalasinga, one of my favorite, who proposes that he wants to translate the Quran um, into Swahili but he would use the English as, as his source. And so a copy. And so, but he does not know Arabic, just like Pastor, Pastor Dale. And, um, and also similar to, 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 to Pastor Dale, he is not a, a Muslim, which also puts everything uh, sort of under, under suspicion. Um, you also have um, the Mtapta or interpreter, Mtapta. The one um, I have here, his name is um, Salim bin Abakari. He was born in the Comoro Islands and um, he lived in Zanzibar. And then later he traveled to, to Germany and Russia and all the way to the border of China. And he wrote um, um, this, this travelogue, a Swahili travelogue that is also mentioned in, in Paradise. Um, and this is then another intriguing moment in history where you have the, the chapter, um, the, the first in interpreter who translates impromptu and um, they're seen as the go-between, the go-between between the imperial powers and the people. And so there's, they're always they're okay, referred to as well as chief informants. And so you, you have um, these people who are seen as uh, part of the people, but also traitors. There's, there's, there's this idea of like, they're, they're under suspicion, like you cannot really trust them. Um, and then we, we have a lot of these mtaptas um, in East Africa. Um, I believe uh, Stanley had one called Darlington Mafta. And um, there was also an mtapta at, uh, at the court of Kabaka of, uh, of Buganda. So these people are there. So I say all this because um, in Peponi, you have a lot of these um, people that I see as mtaptas. Um, uh, my favorite is Nyundo. And um, without his voice, uh, there would not be a caravan going into the interior. 
Uh, Nyundo speaks a number of Bantu languages, and I think they are Kiswahili, Kinyamwezi, Kiha, and Kimanyema. <laughs> I think, I mean, this is not in paradise, but I, I think from uh, this is something we can all debate. Um, he's happy to make the target language sound wiser. So when you speak, he's very happy to, to make you sound cleverer than you are. So for example, at one time he tells Yusuf, I changed the words to make you sound wiser than you are, but there's no need to thank me. <laughs> so in Swahili, anasema kusema kweli, mimi nilibagili maneno yako, ili we uonekane mtu wa busara kuliko ulivyo. Hata hivyo, huna haja kunishkuru. Um, so you have this 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 suspicion, this um, this person who is who is changing what, whatever he said in the in the in the source. Um, Nyundo then later makes a fellow chapter, uh, and in this case, it is uh, it is the Askari uh, who 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 was the German officer, uh, the chief Askari. And um, and so here you, I mean, this is one of, of the of, of the best linguistic performances I think you have in the book, where you have the German speaking German to his chief Ascari, the chief and the Nyundo translating the chief Ascari saying to what I call Ami Aziz, and so you have these languages sort of like performing and and working together in in in, in the same space, um, and. Um, that's it. Um, there are also lots of translators in the novel. So you have Khalil. We are now in the Khalil lecture theater. That's so possibly named after him. I don't know. Um, so he translates the, the mistress's longing and, and flirtations uh, with Yusuf. Although he's also far from being uh, a faithful translator. There's Amina who is seen as more faithful. Um, although she is also she also has her own longing uh, in terms of, of Yusuf, etc. So um, now the, the thing I was going to say as well is that some scholars argue that paradise can be read as a translation and references is, is often made to Abdul Razak's use of Swahili diction at times, uh, a number of Swahili words, Arabic, etc. that showcase the complex uh, society that you have uh, in East Africa. I'm not very sure of that, but um, what I believe, what I, what I found was a highly sophisticated um, English. Um, I found that um, I needed a dictionary a lot. Um, I, I had to cross check <laughs> meanings and uh, sub meanings all the time. So I'm not sure how, I, I mean, maybe that is the process of translation, I don't know, but um, I just found the, the turn of phrases, the vocabulary extremely refined, just beautiful. And, um, and then, so the last thing I would say is paradise has also um, embedded um, the history of Sahili translation at various moments. So we have the chapters there. We also have um, the originals um, being translated in, into copies or not, etc. Now, before I finish very quickly, I just wanted to show you some of the things. So this is the translation that we have published with Mkuki Nanyota, uh, with Mkuki and Walter Goya. And um, I just absolutely love it. I think, I mean, that's that's the garden, you know, like you've got the pomegranates there, you've got the Mhatur Lail, you've got, oh, everything's there. Masumini <laughs> Kilakitu. So um, now, um, there, there was a lot, of, so in terms of the language now, um, so for example, you have this sentence such as, uh, his father and uncle Aziz came home together at one in the afternoon. He could see their bodies shimmering in the liquid light um, as they approached slowly on the stony path which led to the house. Liquid light. I took a long time to, <laughs> and in the end, I tried to paraphrase and explain. And I said, Baba yake na miyazi zole rudi pamoja nyumbani, sasa bamchana, aliona milia olive meremeta, kwenye mwangaza, uliokumbatiwa na miyazi ya yua, na kuonekana kama unyevu nyevu. Why na fulani? Walikuwa kitembea kwenye kijia chamawe, kichuelekea kwao. So, yes. Um, and this is the most loved uh, quote from Paradise. Um, respect yourself and others will come to respect you. That is true about all of us, but especially true about women. Um, that's the meaning of, 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 of honor. So, ni heshimu na mwagini yotaku heshimu, haya ni kweli kwa sisi sote, lakini hasa kwa wanawake. Hii ndiyo maana ya utukufu, nye heshima, mali mwa wali wambia. And I think th these are the kind of, um, this is the last thing I will say, uh, translating Abdul Razak into Swahili has been um, a journey, uh, okay, translating, so sort of like bringing the, the text home because such phrases might be regarded with quite a different eye in the West, but with a Swahili milieu, it makes absolute sense. The woman, lazima ujiheshimu. 
because you carry the household and it makes absolute sense right away. And so I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, for this round table, I've been uh, invited to speak about Sahili women specifically is portrayed in paradise. So it's Swahili women. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are women that are immediately thought of. These are Bizuleha, and then the rich wife of Uncle Aziz. Also, you have the wife of the shopkeeper in the mountains. Uh, this is Maimuna. And then you have also her daughter, Asha. Also, you have Yusuf's mother in Kawa. And then we have, of course, Amina in Bati. And uh, for me, I have two main points here that I wish to touch upon, and hopefully you'll bring in your thoughts. These two points uh, that I want to raise are invisibility and representation. So this is basically what I'm going to talk about. Actually, I have always known that news spread very quickly amongst women, and uh, even women, uh, they stay indoors, still news spread very quickly behind their walls, and they tend to be more updated, actually, although they are behind their walls, but they're quite updated. And uh, I experienced this all the time when I'm in Zanzibar. But uh, this summer, more than ever, after reading uh, Gurna's Paradise, actually rereading, I should say, because I read it for the first time, then I read it again. And then I thought, this really makes sense. Almost daily, while I'm sitting in my room, I would hear my husband conversing on the baraza outside. And uh, the conversation topics in the Baraz, actually, they range to different topics from travel, food, uh, sometimes even impolite banter, you know, etc. <laughs> and uh, really, these conversations would get animated and at times very controversial. And uh, I found myself laughing in disbelief that here's my husband and other men, you know, talking. I was really sometimes amazed. And in hindsight, in hindsight, I thought this is not far fetched. That now I understand how many of Gurna's characters felt exactly as I felt. Maimuna, Amina, Asha, Bizuleha. These are some of the women that found themselves behind the walls, and uh, they were invisible. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I hope you heard me. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, I have to speak fast. Oh my God. I hope you won't stop me. Uh, yeah, because I'm a bit slow, yeah. So I, I imagine Maimuna and her daughter must have had bits of conversations from the travelers who stopped their place. They, you know, they conversed about Russia, about all these things in faraway countries. But always because of this good behavior or what goodness, the story, they didn't, it, they couldn't join that baraza. So we always have, you know, Amina talking or watching Yusuf in the, in the garden, as did uh, Zulecha, mistress. Again. Yes, again, they couldn't cross the walls. And uh, even when Zulecha wanted to cry wolf, when uh, saying that Yusuf had tried to seduce her, she couldn't do it herself. She remained behind those walls and she needed a man to, you know, to intervene on her behalf and call the townspeople. So when I think of this invisibility of these women, it occurs to me that in my perspective, generally, it is not negative. It's not a negative experience. It is simply accepted as a civilized way of, of being. And I remember clearly in the 50s with my mother, my mother would not step outside without her veil, black veil, you know, the, the bui-bui. She stayed in, in, inside. And even when her visitors came, the other women came, they would all, you know, sit there in the, in, the, in the room, and then they would talk. And these were women whose hands, just like they talk in, in, the, in paradise, they had henna on their hands, they had the perfume allowed, you know, all of them. And then if you're a child, you have to go and kiss the hand and say che che. So these are the women. So actually, when I read about women visiting Bizulecha in paradise, I knew their faces, I knew them. I could see them clearly. 
And even though they were not described, but I knew them, I had the exact representation who they were. And whenever my mother spoke of her childhood, for example, she would always be behind the curtain because when she was reaching, you know, when she was adolescent, she wasn't allowed to see the men. This was the culture in that time. So she would always hear from men with her, with her, from who were talking to her grandfather. And then what I wanted to say, I have observed in this book that there's actually a class of women who could be taken care of. And these were women such as, you know, who are, who are rich, but they are also very poor women, like Ayusa. She, she, she actually had to fend for herself. And uh, in fact, there is a very interesting class representation with, in this book, really. That's, that's what I think. There were very rich husbands, you know, those women who had rich husbands, like, for example, Uncle Aziz. Bizulecha, that was Bizulecha's husband, very rich, and she was herself also quite, quite rich. And there was the young Amina. Amina was the junior wife. And of course, she was serving the mistress of the household. But there are also other women, you know, the middle class women whose husbands were middle class, like shopkeepers. For example, Bibaimuna. Bibaimuna and her, and her children, including her daughter Aisha, they are not, you know, they are not rich, just middle class. And then you had other women, other women like, you know, Beajusa, as, as I talked about. She didn't have a she didn't have a husband. She was you know one one of those poorer women. They were without husband. I mean she was not they were she was without husband. Beajusa was without husband. She covered herself in veil, but not her face. So what she did, she came to the shop very freely, and she would talk about each and every topic, and all sorts of you know provocative jokes without any fear in front of men. And these men were sitting on the baraza, and she would just talk. She was just happy. She didn't have any property. She didn't have a husband. She had nothing to lose. So actually, in the, and then I found also there were other women in the hinterland. I hope I can continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm reading, you know, very fast. <laughs> I don't want to be, he might stop me. Okay. Let me continue. Okay. So there are women also in the hinterland, you know, the Chattu's land. The likes of Bati. Very interesting. Yeah. They had no veils. No veils at all, because culturally, this was not considered to portray any respect. You know, a veil was not considered to portray any respect for women. So in that area, but it didn't have to put on any veil. These were cultivators and hunters. And uh, it was a different, different civilization from the coast, completely different. And uh, strictly, they didn't remain behind walls. However, they were not part of the masculine voice. Why they did not form? They didn't form part of the ruling assembly. There was assembly, but there were no women. I think this is true. I hope I'm not mistaken. And uh, what I want to say is that uh, women they had their own their own place, and they, they however they moved together, they moved together to collect water, to collect whatever whatever errand they had as a group. But they had their own freedom, and still, of course. There are, different, there are differences between the, all these classes of women. However, one thing that is very common is that generally women were expected to be as invisible as possible all along, all of them. Now, this position of women is actually uh, inherited, uh, which culturally accepted, depending on the specific context, not all contexts. Some Western scholars have portrayed this as subordination or exploitation of women, et cetera. But the perception along the East Coast, East African coast actually is quite different. Remaining behind the walls and covering in veil was considered very respectful. And uh, uh, actually women visited each other. They participated in their own activities. They had their own freedom. They were behind the walls, but they were not behind the walls when they were together. And historically, actually women who stayed indoors and were invisible to the outside world were actually very visible in their own world. So they were very visible in their own world, uh, in their own world of fellow women, in their own world of their family, of their children. And so the supposed invisibility is actually a status in itself. This is what I think. And in terms of translating uh, the lives of these women, I believe that the Swahili speaking audience would know and understand and accept that this is how it is. Actually, Abrazak Gurna is said to have books 
where the masculine voice is much more present than the female one. The truth actually is that the feminine voice is portrayed in its authenticity. And I say that Gurna says that he writes what he knows. What he knows is our believed experience or the truth to speak in generally and the expected way of, of being. This is what I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Reverend. This was this was too good to interrupt. I, it was it was very nice. Thank you. Um, I think we are now moving online, and ask uh, Clarissa to join us. Thank you. Oh yes. I hope you can hear me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very right. Good. Um, well, thanks a lot, first of all, um, for having me um, in this kind of distinguished round. I don't think I'm. Um, I can call myself really a translator, definitely not in comparison to all the esteemed translators in the audience and in the Zoom. And let me also add Hongera Sana Ida and, of course, also um, Abdul Razak for, um, well, first of all, a beautiful novel and what we've seen also wonderful um, translation. And actually, when I was thinking about what to what to talk about, um, I started in a similar way like you, um, Ida, thinking about how the novel itself talks about um, translation and I reflected a lot about the character Nyundo, well the hammer, the hammer of translation probably, and in the novel it actually says Nyundo would also have to go as their voice. His good humor was on the mend with his new importance, but the men teased him that he was making up translations as he went along. So Nyundo has this very crucial role, he negotiates with um, Chatu, the very unpredictable ruler, and well, so literally the trade depends on Yundu, but also people's lives. So he is suspicious, as you also said, um, Ida, but he is also malicious sometimes, and at least he's very unreliable. And um, you also refer to um, the travelogues that actually Paradise draws on. It's definitely not a translation, but um, it draws on a lot of these very early travelogues by Felton, who was the first translator of the German governor, to Germany, East Africa, who was also very much concerned um, with the question of reliability of translation. So in his Safari Zawaswahili, um, where, well, one of these, uh, well, a number of actually travels are recorded by him, um, he reflects in the introduction, um, which he later then, or well, he later translated the Safari Zawaswahili into German, and he reflects about, um, about translation. So this is now my bad translation. So with regard to the German translation of the travelogues, I have tried to be as loyal to the world as possible in order to convey even in the translation the natural impression which the Swahili text leaves on everyone who knows the language so that even those who do not know Swahili can immerse themselves into the naive thought of the African. Although the German style has suffered quite a bit from it, I do still hope and that I succeeded in creating a pleasurable and enlightening read for all those interested in our colonies and the inhabitants. So we can, we can clearly hear a, a condescending tone here, the naivety, and I could talk much more about, about that as well and the violence in there. But on the other hand, there's also lots of admiration actually for the narrator's talent in, in Felton. So he talks about such eloquence. So, and the narration is such a pleasure. So referring on the one hand um, to Munye Chande and to Sleiman Bakari, you saw the picture in, in Ida's um, PowerPoint earlier on. Uh, well, and, and that actually, he admires it so much that he wants to be as loyal to the text as possible, as close as possible um, to the narration. Uh, and if we compare that, for instance, to the later translation, the English translation of by Lyndon Harris, he actually uh, from 1965, so this is the context of um, independence, where obviously it didn't fit the zeitgeist to talk about the Arabs and um, then Af Bada Africans anymore and gratitude to the Germans, so he reduced the text by one third and he rearranged paragraphs, he introduced new titles. So there is a whole kind of, um, well, we could talk about the reliability um, here as well. So that even Allen, um, John W.T. Allen, he writes in a review, so the Harris version is a European way of telling a story and, and modeling it. And the, the Felton version is the Swahili way. Well, Felton, that's certainly an exaggeration. It's not a Swahili way, because after all, he was um, speaking to a German colonial audience and one could have more critical comments about that as well. But still, 
I want to think about Felton's concern to make the German sound Swahili. So how does one make Monye um, Chande then sound in German as Felton actually seems to ask? In Paradise, as I said already, I mean, Abdul Razak definitely does not strictly translate um, Wenya Chandi's prosaic account into, um, into English, but still one can still wonder, so to, to quote Felton, how does Abdul Razak give a natural impression of Swahili in English? Or then um, with regard to Ida's translation, so how did Ida carry over the tone of Paradise, an English Swahili or an Swahili English tone into Swahili and, and which Swahili exactly? So translation literally to cross over also means, or to, to, to carry across also means to, to make the narrator and the narrative enter in dialogue with other narratives. So I hear both a 19th century newspaper prose and earlier folk tales in Felton's German translation. So texts also in translation, they find new echoes. Of course, literature as such is also full of layers of text. So in Paradise, we have the travelogues on the one hand, um, which turn into a coming of age story, I mean, mostly through the character of Yusuf, carried over, if you want, from the Quran and, and popular Islamic accounts, and also playing a lot with these references. And again, looking at my own kind of reading experience, I can't help but read Paradise also in relation to Thomas Mann's Joseph und seine Brüder, so Joseph and his brothers. Joseph Mann's intention was actually to write a transcultural myth of Joseph, so he drew on Persian, Egyptian, Babylonian, Jewish, and Muslim sources in his um, Californian exile or his Californian Egypt. And he sought actually for a very ancient language uh, for the myth. So Joseph is Greek and Egyptian at the same time, but there's also lots of irony. It's still also a novel. And there are find lots of parallel, parallels as, as well to paradise. Gunnar, of course, does exactly the opposite. So there the myth is put into a very concrete, brutal and historical landscape of the, of the late 19th century and probably denying the myth to remain one. So let me come back to the question of echoes of text. So what will the Swahili audience then hear in the Swahili translation of Paradise? So will the popular Utenziwa Yusuf Many manuscripts, <laughs> I mean, you have many manuscripts at the source, but there are also lots of recitations still sold on CDs and so on in East Africa. Will they hear the Quran in it? Um, will the novel also enter into dialogue with uh, Shafi Adam Shafi's Kathri Aminu Fuad, or probably the play by Farouk Topan, Mfal Mejuha? Are they the pharaohs as well? Or will it create also echoes with people's grandparents' narratives of slavery or great-grandparents actually, narratives of slavery, ivory and colonial brutality? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clarissa. This was again very insightful. You can see how the different angles of the work come together. Um, can we ask Wangui now, I think, as our next speaker? Yes, please. Thank you very much, um, Hamjambo. Ni mesema ni wasalimia kwa kiswahili kwa sababu ida ambaye tumejuana kwa mda mrefu hakujua ati mimi nilinazungumza kiswahili. Na tena ni nafurahi sana kwa sababu ida nasema hivi kwa heshima ida alikuwa mwanafunzi wangu. Nilipokuwa ninafundisha uh, tafsiri na nimeshanga sana hatukujua zote wawili hati hujui kwamba nazungumza kiswahili anyway i'm really honored to be here and i'd like to congratulate you in person uh, abdul razak congratulations we're very excited i wore my east african bangle today <laughs> to celebrate uh, the joy that we feel um, about the nobel prize uh, win uh, but also, we're very excited about this new book, Peponi, uh, Paradise, and I'm very excited that uh, it's been translated by Ida because of this concept of bringing um, uh, the literature back home. And I, I will not talk about the book because I'd like to do that on another occasion, especially when I've read in Kiswahili. It does translation against the original text. I think that is what I think would be most exciting for me to do. 
but I'd like just to share a few reflections um, about uh, just that I was thinking about in the context of the title of this conference, which is about the localization of what Im we imagine to be the networks of Kiswahili. And I, we all know this, but I'll just raise it theoretically. Uh, Abdul Razak and Ida uh, have been here in the UK. And of course, they are, they are from Zanzibar, which is very specific locus, but they have these true and many other hundreds of locuses, I'm sure that they belong to. So what does this do to meaning and expression? The text itself takes us back in time and we need to understand what is time. Like translation, it's as elastic. We're reading the book in the present, in the past, somehow placing ourselves in time as readers. So what does this mean? So I'm very curious to see uh, what has happened with time and also what is the author doing because he, of course the author did not witness the 19th century we can only read it and imagine it as it's been passed down or as we imagine it so there are so many layers of translation and the actual text itself which is playing with translation that I'm already dizzy just thinking about all these um, layers but some of the issues that have come up and I'll say them very uh, quickly I've been involved in uh, what we call the Indian Ocean uh, they call it the Mozambique Channel research which is uh, around that area of that water um, and it's based in Mayotte which is a little dot in the Indian Ocean which is a uh, for whatever reason, it's part of France. So again, <laughs> what do these, and this is in the present, not in the 19th century, it is a dom tom as we sit here. So it's point of reference is French and it's point of reference in its psyche is not the Middle East, like, you know, it's somewhere in, in Europe. So, and the research is based there. So all these waters that are mingling and flowing I would like um, that, I, I like that shimmering um, expression <laughs> that, that you could not translate uh, uh, and had to paraphrase. So I see this literary practice as that wonderful phrase that the author has used of the shimmering waters. Uh, so what does then, what do words then mean? And what do they mean to different people? Um, and, and, and who is the reader? and what do they bring to reading the text. But really what I had promised Ida to do, because I joined this panel very late, is to talk about the globalization of Kiswahili. As you all know, um, Kiswahili is now on the United Nations calendar. It's celebrated now globally. Clarissa, who was speaking to us, is based in Germany, Germany and yourself, and you own the Kiswahili in, in, in your own ways. And so Kiswahili is a global language, partly for good reasons, it has traveled on its own, but once it starts to be institutionalized in the United Nations, the African Union this year adopted Kiswahili as an official working language, then I will, I'm sure that meanings will start to harden and to be more fixed. And this is one of my concerns and the joy that literature and human engagement is way ahead of these fossilizations that are likely to happen in the language. Um, also, many African countries are adopting Kiswahili as a medium of instruction. And of course, as you can see from Harvard and others here, Kiswahili is being taught all over the world for a long time. But in the Cold War period, all the countries, China and Russia, the Soviet Union, as it was called, then had broadcasting, the BBC here broadcast Kiswahili to Africa. So the flows of these networks and their meanings is something that I think can be uh, unpacked uh, as we do this literary translation work. So I want to ask about the location. I'm quite uh, satisfied um, about this particular text and its outing, and also that it's been published in East Africa, but the chains may not always be that smooth, is what I have found, if, if I can say it that way. So um, I think I could, my, are my minutes over? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Raju. Very, very nice. Um, we're moving back to online, I think. 
Um, what we have from Tanzania, uh, Walter Boria. Um, Walter, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, yes, okay. I can. All right, yeah. Asante sana. Asante sana. Sasa sijui ni zikumisa kiswahili au kingereza au vyote kwa sababu baadhi ya mambo nata kusema ningependa wa asikie wengine wote ambao hawajui kiswahili na ingawa na shauku sana ya kuzungumza katika kiswahili. Lakini hebu tu, 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 tuanze tufanya kazi hiyo kama tutachanganya sikitu. First of all, I like to say that um, in all the work I've been doing in publishing, uh, translations have been part of my my, my, my interest in, in consciousness I've done. We've done quite a few actually. We've done Moliere, we've done Khalil Gibran, we've done Hemingway, we've done Mariamaba, we've done Antoine de saint Exupéry, we've done uh, Victor Hugo and, and so many other uh, single works. Um, uh, but, um, and, and we would like to do more. Of course, we've done now Pepone, which is, you know, the, the icing on the cake, so to speak, at the moment. And we're very, very proud to be doing this work. But, uh, and this is really what I wanted to say in respect of uh, translations as, um, as commodities also that have to be sold, to be produced and sold, okay? Because if the publishing, if, if there's no, uh, if the resources aren't there to publish, to translate, to publish and to distribute, obviously the work of translations and exchanges in cultural literature will be seriously limited. And this is where I, I, I have a particularly uh, uh, serious problem in Tanzania. Uh, the problem is that in our country, the language of instruction in primary schools in Swahili and in secondary schools and post-secondary, it's in English. Now, the, the, the argument that Mualim put forward when this policy was enunciated was that if English is taught very well in primary school, then it will be possible at secondary school to have to carry on instruction in English and everybody will be comfortable. And as he said also, this was because English was the Swahili of the, of the world. Some of us did challenge that position even as early as that, but never mind. That's what has come to rule. Um, now, the, the, the fact of the matter is that the teachers who go to teach in primary schools do not have any ability to teach in English, to teach English, because they themselves have not been taught well the language. And these are all, you know, X form four students, and they don't have even have to pass, have passed English at the examination. They just have had a certificate of uh, you know, all level and they go and teach. Now you can imagine the kind of English that is supposed to be taught and what would happen when then they come to secondary school and they have to switch from Swahili into English. It doesn't work. What is worse that that also goes on after secondary schools that uh, at that A level, those who cannot go to the universities or other, uh, other institutions, um, you know, are the ones who go to teach. And so so the, the, the net result is that uh, even at the university, and I, I know we have lots of debate about this, the command of English in our universities, particularly for literature and at the kind of level we are working, is really not that strong. And so uh, the result is that there is uh, a certain, how can I put it? Um, it's a big, it's a big block against creativity in, 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 in language, in, in literature. Now, um, the question is, only those students whose parents are rich and who went to private schools, good teachers and so on, are able to command English. And also that so happens that they're the ones who get pretty well good jobs when they finish the university. And these are the ones who would be uh, consuming literature. Now, the, the, the problem arises that they have been working in English. All intellectual work has been done in English. So if a book comes out like Paradise, for instance, and they will read it in English. Now, <laughs> there certainly won't be a very good reason for them to go and buy a second copy to read it in Swahili what they already read in English. 
So you can imagine then what happens that, uh, and it's no wonder that uh, uh, obviously something will give, something will suffer. And perhaps it explains why we are, uh, Swahili, I mean, Tanzania is not very productive in English writing and so on. Now, uh, what we, 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 we think is uh, something we have to do is obviously not to stop translations, but to continue to do more translations, but to have some way in which we make sure that those books and translations do reach the public and they can do so only for at least they are available in libraries. And the, the, one of the good models is the, is the Norwegian model where every good book that published every book actually a thousand copies or more are bought for distribution to the library now if you have at least a thousand or a thousand five hundred or two thousand copies already bought for, for for libraries it's possible to carry on the, the business of publishing because both the author the editors the translators and so on will have been enabled by the fact that so many copies have gone to the libraries, have been purchased, some money has been made by the whole production chain. Well, this is what I would like to say. Now, how do we do that? That's obviously, <laughs> we keep saying the government has to implicate itself very seriously in, in, into this, into, into, first of all, reviewing the, the, the policy, but also certainly purchasing books and expanding the libraries as much as possible and uh, also institutions like SOAS and other universities may be contributing into purchasing those copies that go to the library so that we can continue to develop this, this, this work of literature, translations, and so on. I think I have uh, two more minutes, but I'll give these to the, the next speaker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, and you will hear more from Walter later on in the program as well. Uh, with that, let's us thank us very much our panelists um, for, for the presentations, give, give lots of different perspectives on the work, and I think it put a wonderful context to the rest of the proceedings. Thank you. Sasaduna in the lea hapam bele na batuke yetu. Na tuna furai sana kunkaribisham kurugenzi wasoas, Professor Abno Habib. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased to welcome Professor Adam Habib, who is the director of SOAS. Adam joined us in January 2021, um, and there has been a lot of changes since he came. So if you've been to the Baraza before, if you look at the building, it's, it's really much more pretty and clean, and you know it looks more professional than it may be used in the last, last decades or so. Um, but there was also, there's also lots of content we've been discuss discussing. One, two elements maybe. One, one, which I think we all think is important, is to reconceptualize our relation with the Global South, to put on a, on a better footing, more equal footing, the way with the way academic relations are structured when engaging with the Global South. And there's been lots of talk about equitability and what that actually means and how we can do it. Um, and the other thing is, is linked to that is to understand the world's problems through the lens of the Global South. And I'm sure Adam will say a little bit more about that. Um, but it's something which I, I've taken away from, which I think is really important, which I think links very, very well to our, our discussions today. Translation helps us precisely to do that, to understand different perspectives, different cultures, and how things are seen from different perspectives. And, you know, language learning is, of course, important, but translation, as we just heard, is the other really key element in there. And, of course, the study of Africa is, is close to, to all our hearts, and particularly Adam's heart, who comes, of course, from the University of the Witzwatersrand um, before joining SOAS. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome Adam and um, give us a little introductory speech. Thank you. So colleagues, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Lutz. Uh, you know, I've been asked to, uh, to do a welcome to this conference. And uh, I think I should start by welcoming uh, Professor Abdel Razak Goda to SOAS. It's really a pleasure to have you here, uh, sir, you know, it's a wonderful achievement. And I know a number of my colleagues have said that they're really proud as East Africans, for somebody who's been born and lived in the continent for almost all of my life, uh, you have done us all proud. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I want to welcome everyone else. There are many scholars here from afar, near and afar. 
thank you for coming. And to, of course, my, my, my SOAS colleagues uh, who are here as well. It's really lovely having all of you. And of course, Ida, who's a real star of ours. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. You know, it's a real pleasure to do a, a welcome to Professor Gunnar. Um, you know, I don't mean to sound, to be corny about this, Professor Gunnar. <laughs> uh really it's 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 a particular pleasure not only because you write from the continent about the continent about humanity but uh it's also a particular pleasure to have you here because of this moment we in and i want to explain a little bit you see about 12 months ago we adopted a new strategic plan uh, many of you would know that SOAS was in serious trouble for a couple of years. Uh, and that new strategic plan says a lot of things. It says about how we're going to make some money, uh, how we're going to grow our student numbers, how we're going to break even, uh, how we're going to drive research intensity, a lot of which we've, we've done over the last uh, two years, how we're going to make the place look better. Uh, and you've seen some of this as we are. But at the heart of that plan, is what we call equitable partnerships. Now, you know, when I came to the UK, I was truly puzzled uh, because everybody spoke about equitable partnerships. Wherever I went, people spoke about equitable partnerships. But as a vice chancellor who worked on the continent and worked with probably the leading vice chancellors on the continent, I sat at the table with them. Nobody in the continent believed that they were equitable partnerships. We thought it was a quaint term coined by the British that they spoke about, but we didn't experience. And so when I came to SOAS and we started developing this new strategic agenda, and we put equitable partnerships at the heart of this agenda, I said to colleagues, let's really mean it. Not only the way we feel it, but the way people experience it in Africa and in Asia. That's what's the nature of, of what we wanted to do. Uh, and that's what we've spent quite a bit of time over the last couple of months, particularly. We're looking at a joint PhD with the University of Advertisement. We're speaking to Makarere. We're speaking to Ganda Legon. My colleagues are speaking and exploring partnerships with the University of Rwanda, Shivnada University in New Delhi. We are speaking to colleagues in Japan and in South Korea and in Thailand. There is a real desire to do a real equitable partnership that is about teaching, co-teaching and co-curriculation and co-research. It's about that. Now, I don't want to say to you it's easy because I can tell you it's incredibly difficult. Because the political economy of higher education in the UK is profoundly against equitable partnerships. The way the whole system works is we charge rich people from the South lots of money so we can cross subsidize middle class people from Britain. That's how the system works. And then we all do that. And we have a 400% markup. You know, it costs us a PhD. And so as we just did the calculations, about 400, 400 uh, 4,000 pounds. We charge people from Africa and Asia 20,000 pounds. I don't know a private sector you can get away with a 400% markup. We do it as a public institution and we do it in the name of social justice. It's a hell of a, hell of a uh, challenge. So, we need to address this in quite fundamental ways and we are working to it. And we'll see how well we succeed. You know, it's a grapple, it's an attempt. I said to my colleagues, it's a, instead of preaching about radicalism, do it, subvert it. Show you can create a new business model because that will have a fundamental shift. Now, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Not only because it's important morally, but we're doing this in a sense 
because it seems to me it is what humanity requires. I and my colleagues really believe humanity will not survive unless we reimagine our partnerships in an equitable direction. You might think that that's an overstatement. But let me explain to you that all of our challenges are transnational in character. Climate change, pandemics, uh, inequality, social and political polarization, all of it are transnational. And if you're going to have to fix these challenges, you need to bring global science and global technologies in conversation with knowledge systems in other parts of the world. If you want to understand this, why did it take us so long to resolve Ebola in West Africa in 2015? We knew what we had to do in clinical terms. In Ebola, you set, keep people away, give them vaccines. We knew all of that. We didn't succeed initially because we forgot a simple thing. West African societies are Islamic societies. In Islamic societies, the way the burial happens is by washing the party, body. It's called Ghusal. But when you wash the body, you allow the Ebola virus to jump from host to another host. You needed an intervention that wasn't the doctors because we knew what happened. To we needed a cultural and religious intervention. Now, if you had been in the middle of West Africa, if we had been engaging with its knowledge systems, we would have known that on day one. So what we need is local understanding. We need interdisciplinarity. Because if we don't do that, if we don't have our knowledge systems talking to each other, we can't create universal solutions to transnational challenges of our time. And so what has all of this got to do with Professor Bernard? You might ask. Well, really the reason I'm particularly excited. This, this is what Professor Gunnar has been doing for years. He's been doing it for decades. In many ways, his work, he understood in his, through his literature, through his novels, that you cannot build a universality, a common humanity, by thinking through the knowledge of a single knowledge system or from the perspectives of one part of humanity and not another. In many ways, he, he speaks to that in powerful ways. His work speaks to and prefigures our strategic agenda at SOAS that we're developing now. You know, think about it. After lives, I haven't read all uh, Professor Gunnar, but after lives. It's about colonialism, it's about war, and its effect on people, and how its impact on the evolution, on the simple aspects of humanity. The evolution of the emotions of love and anger and desire and disposition. And he speaks about that, and he speaks about peace. And how he speaks about how people can live in one place and dream about another. How he speaks about how you can speak in English and dream in Israeli. <laughs> That's the powerful thing. And the other thing I love about his the work, some of the work, is the nuance of it. Really nuanced. So, our politics today, particularly in the UK, but frankly, in my own country, South Africa, and in many parts of the world, the US, Europe, is defined in terms of good and evil. It's defined by white and black. What I love is how you evoke an understanding that there can be empathy in brutality, that there can be peace even in war. But despite these contradictions, there's no neutrality. The end, in the end, there's always a right path, even if it has to be grounded in the context of the historical moment and the place we're speaking about. So 
So, but so, uh, it's truly a pleasure to have you here at SOAS because you symbolize what we want to do. I thank you for honoring us with your presence. Friends, colleagues, Professor Goodman. Thank you, Adam. That, uh, that was wonderful. And I don't think I will interrupt much more. Abdul Razak, please join us in the front and um, honor us with a few words. I think this is a wonderful introduction. Um, Abdul Razak Gona has been a friend of SOAS for a very long time. Um, is an emeritus professor at the University of Kent, um, has been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature um, last year. Um, his outstanding books are Paradise, which we have the translation, of course, we are launching in a moment, Desertion by the Sea, you know, as Adam said, there is there is so much in your work which speaks to all of us. I think it's about it's about youth, it's about location, movement, place and displacement, about aspirations, of course, about language. There is so much language and translation, as we saw earlier, multi you know the the multilingual context of East Africa, which is in there. But I think I think the wider the wider themes you address in your work about what it means to be human, what it means to have to engage with culture, what culture means for yourself and how you're constrained in what you can do, but also have scope to de determine what you want to do. I think that that speaks to a very wide global audience. The, the final thing, the Nobel Prize, I think the, the, you know, the committee noted the uncompromising and, and honest approach to the effect of colonialism but also the, the, you know, the, the true engagement of culture and what culture means in that context. So it speaks to these two things um, in, you know, I think in a very warm and meaningful way. I'm very pleased to welcome you. Thank you very much, Abdul Razak. Um, um, address us with a few words. Thank you. Ah, Yama. Salam alaikum. Nekaribisho kweli. Uh, wale wenzangu waloka hapa leo tunazungumza mambo ya tafsiri na na taabu alizopata ida <laughs> na khalafu pia uh, uh, professor habib thank you very much and thank you all very much for being here i'm delighted to have been invited um, it's a bit a little bit overwhelming when you're sitting there and people are saying all these wonderful things about you um, especially when you don't get a chance to say anything back like no <laughs> it's not true it's not so but anyway it's lovely to see so much um well engagement at the very least but also uh, so much um i suppose appreciation i'm very grateful thank you very much so <clears throat> I was asked uh, when uh, Ila originally was talking about this, and I'm really, by the way, really, really delighted that it's worked out, because I know I know how this started for Ida as a as a she was an academic uh, exercise um, translating this novel, which she's been talking about, um, and then that it worked, uh, and then the way it worked is that. Um, when I went to Sharjah soon after the uh, award of the uh, prize by the Swedish Academy, I met Walter's son, Nkuki, there in Sharjah. And he became very enthusiastic about this possibility, found out that Ida had done the translation, and they both moved very, very fast. And I'm delighted that it's all happened, sort of like about a year or so, something like that. So I'm really pleased that it's worked out. Um, because of course it's been quite a while uh, since Paradise was published in English and it's good that it's there now. I was very, very interested to hear that opening discussion about the translation issues, <clears throat> because of course, as so many of those contributors there said, uh, translation is one of the, um, uh, one of the, I suppose, one of the things that concerned that interested me in, uh, in writing the novel. Not only is it write, written in English in the first place, of course, but also my uh, 
my own assumption was that many of these people, the traders in particular, because they were the focus as it were the other people I was traveling with to a certain extent, uh, that much of the time they wouldn't have understood the people they were dealing with. They would not have been able to speak to each other. And so how did they manage? How did, how did this business go on? How did these uh, different communities, not just the traders, but all the various contesting communities that we run into, uh, how did they manage with each other? Um, and so, so there has to be some translation, but this translation cannot be uh, as accurate as Ida's translation, for example. It's gonna be hit and miss, it's gonna be slapdash, it's gonna be, you know, traders talk. Uh, if if you, I come from, not only from Zanzibar, I come from Zanzibar, but I come from Alindi in Zanzibar, right there by Gatini, but now, it's, it's no longer the case now quite as much, but when I was uh, growing up, when I was uh, in, sort of in the 1950s and 60s, when the Muslim crowd still used to turn up every November, you'd hear different languages going on all the time. And you'd hear business going on all the time. These people were trading. And there is a trader patois as well, which doesn't have to be uh, complete for it to make sense. Uh, because in the end, it's that that makes sense. And somehow the other things happen. So I was very interested in that. But in particular, in the way that you um, and the colleague, I'm sorry, who's uh, from Bayreuth, um, the way you focused on particular texts. Um, and so I, I thought I would just add another little layer to that to see, because what I, what I read was actually the Lyndon Harris translation. So I thought this doesn't sound right uh, in English. This doesn't sound right. So I retranslated that into uh, a Swahili, which would be a spoken one, because indeed nobody refers to the text in the novel but they speak as if they know these stories already from another source, from as it were an oral source. So I retranslated so that it sounded like a spoken story rather than, which indeed it was in the first place, of course, it would have been an oral transmission in well, you know, that, that would have been collected. So that adds yet another, <laughs> another translation on translations and other translations. It doesn't really matter, the, the, the point, my point really was to focus as much on stories and the way stories circulate and how stories are indeed uh, a worldview. Uh, so those that are passed on do not have to be accurate. In fact, quite often they're not because as they get told, somebody adds an interesting little invention to, you know, uh, everybody was drunk, this kind of thing, you know, in the town, that kind of thing, just sort of make it more interesting in a way because I believe that is also how stories travel when they're transmitted in this way. They, they change and they change in a way that makes them more um, receivable. We know this, we can receive this story now because we recognize in it something about us too. It's not just about another time. Anyway, really, I just wanted to do a thank the people who've been uh, uh, talking and discussing. Thank you, sir. Uh, for those grand words of welcome. Um, and thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Indeed, Sasa, Sasa Tuna and Gia Peponi. I think we are now ready to, to launch the translation. Um, we have copies, I think. Um, I was supposed. To, I was told to have a bow, but I couldn't find one. <laughs> I tried in the morning, I totally couldn't find a bow, so it's gonna have to be a bowless book. <laughs> um, so I think. Can, can everybody see? Uh, Mr. Walter. Utasungumza sisi baada ya unana kuna mfuko wenu na mepuja na oku. <laughs> okay. 
So I, I got some books this time when I was in Tanzania uh -huh. and um, I had the book in my off the bag in my office. So I said, I don't have a bow, I'll have the bag. <laughs> and, <laughs> I think it's probably good enough. And um, so this is a design, <clears throat> it made me so happy. Um, it was designed by Mkuki, Mkuki Bgoya. So Walter Bgoya's son. And um, what I love about it is it's, it's the garden. It's uh, Nipeponi. Okay. Oh, that's all that's left. No, this is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay so we have some books. And um, so it will be in olive with the gold writing. Here we have the dark gold, but uh, we'll have the lighter gold after. But I guess it's Yusuf in the garden. And uh, he's there with the pomegranates and um, Maturle, the queen of the night, and Jasmine and all the all the flowers. So we thought this was really, and he's wearing his, his kofia, nakanzu. Um, and yeah, Tuesday, November 2021. So I was meant to give this to you. Um, so I'm not sure. <laughs> yes. And then you can, um, and then I, I don't know, I'm not sure how people launch books. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 I'm joking. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, with yeah. the two of you and the book, I think that would be good. And the bag. And the, and the bag. And, the bag. Exactly. and also, we should get Walter on screen as well. Ah, yeah. Ah, yes. And I think Walter was, was going to say something, actually. Yeah. Um, should. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is he muted? Yeah. 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 So maybe we can listen yeah. to. Yeah. 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 Like this, very good. Like this. Yes. And now this, I think it's now officially launched. Very good. Thank you. Now, I saw you say make it to see you. Tafadali. Tafadali, yes, please. Hi. Professor Gurna, Mandishu, Kitabu Ambacho Kinazinduliwa Leo, Paradise ambacho kimetafsiriwa na kuitwa Peponi na Dr. Ida Hijabayanis wapendwa marafiki wa fasihi ya Kiswahili na marafiki wa mkuki na nyota. A professor ni ni, ni, ni furaha iliyoje kwamba tunazindua tafsiri ya kitabu chako Peponi. Na ambacho kwanza kilikuwa ni kitabu chako cha kwanza we kuandika na nadhani kwa ki, na, sidhani na hakika kwa Kiswahili ndio cha kwanza vile vile kutafsiriwa katika Kiswahili. Hii ni jambo zuri. Kwa hiyo shukurani za kwanza na hongera za kwanza zinakuja kwako profesa. Kwa sababu bila ya kazi yako ya asili hiyo yani paradise tusikikuwa na tafsiri ya hicho kitabu. Kwa hiyo tunakupongeza sana sana tena na wacha niseme vile vile kwamba tunaipongeza na na bodi ya Nobel kwa kufahamu ubora wa kazi yako kwa upande wa fani na maudhui yake tunawapongeza wao nao sasa lakini leo nyota ya shughuli hii ni ida kwa sababu yeye ndio kafanya kazi ya kutafsiri kitabu na kakitafsiri vizuri sana. Kwa hiyo kilicho kwa kizuri katika Kiingereza, mimi nahisi kwamba kimekuwa kizuri zaidi katika Kiswahili. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Better in Swahili. <laughs> eh, kwa sababu chimbuko lake yes fulani ni ni ni, ni, ni wa Swahili. Na mambo ya ki, ya Kiswahili, mandhari ya Kiswahili. Na Nadhani kijambo zuri lilo bahati ni kwamba Ida na na mimi na na wote tulohusika bahati nzuri tunazungumza Kiingereza na tunazungumza Kiswahili kwa hiyo ilikuwa rahisi kila mara kushirikiana ku, 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 na ku, 
na kusaidiana katika kutazama jinsi changamoto tunavyoweza kuzimaliza na kuzi na kuzi eh, kuzikwepa sasa kwa hiyo natoa shukrani hizo na hongera sana ida na niseme tu kwa sababu ni binafsi huyu ni binti yangu ndio <laughs> <laughs> si mtoto wa ida na sasa watu wangu hao <laughs> kwa hiyo hii ni kaja nyumbani eh? na hiyo na leo labda tuiseme kwa sababu nayo ni sehemu vile vile ya ya utamaduni wetu kwamba mtoto wa ndugu yako wa rafiki yako ni mtoto wako hongera sana ida Alafu vile vile nataka ku, ku, kumshukuru uh, Stephanie Kitchen wa African Books Collective ambao ambaye pamoja na na mkuki wamekuwa kishirikiana kuhakikisha tuna nakala za kitabu hiki katika shughuli hii kwa sababu kulikuwa na wasiwasi pengine vitabu tulivyokuwa tumechapisha eh, visingewahi lakini tumepata bahati kwamba vimewahi na vile vile plan B yet nayo imeleta nakala kwa hiyo tukahakikisha kwamba vitabu vipo. Kwa hiyo namshukuru vile vile Stephanie na ABC ambao kwa vile vyote tumekuwa tunashirikiana nao miaka mingi. Halafu ni mshukuru Mkuki na Tapiwa na timu yetu vile vile ya, ya Mkuki na Nyota pale ambao kwa hakika wamejitahidi kwa sababu ni muda mfupi kiasi katika shughuli zetu za za uchapishaji kwamba muda mfupi tumeweza kufanya kazi na kuikamilisha na kwa kiwango ambacho nadhani kinaridhisha ni kizuri. Kwa hiyo kwa kumaliza tu ni kwamba sasa eh tusi tusi <laughs> tusizungumze tu na kupeana hongera. Tununue vitabu. Na hiyo aswa madaswa waswa yetu naweza kuishia katika kuongezana hapa lakini <laughs> kila mtu anangojea mwingine anunue alafu azime ah ah nunua chako bwana <laughs> au sio <laughs> kwa hiyo asanteni sana asanteni professor guna uh, na bado sijakutana na wewe bwana ni bahati mbaya sijakutana nawe lakini inshallah tutakapokuja mara ya mara ya nyingine huko Dar es Salaam na Zanzibar tutakuwa tuta, tuta, bahati kukutana na wewe na ku na kuzungumza mambo mengine na jinsi tunavyoweza kusonga mbele na kazi zetu hizi maana kama sasa ushakuwa ni balozi wetu uongo kweli <laughs> Ehe, kwa hiyo asante sana na hongereni sana sana asante asante um, just, I, I, you know it's, it's really interesting the convergence of mind our academic leader adam points out and then voltaire from the publishing world points out it's all nice to talk about these books but the point is to buy them so, <laughs> so there are some copies left i think they go for 12 is it eight oh oh <laughs> um, that, um, eight pounds they can do it 12 for today <laughs> so you know what we can if you want to pay 12 for every every 12 half a book we send to a library in zanzibar yes i mean i think that's a really good oh. idea actually yes good um they are they are available outside we have i think now a tea break isn't it yes yeah no i think we were going to quickly ask them oh. if they have any question or something because i think we we overran everything a little bit i mean yeah. we're back in time now if anybody has any comment or anything before we let you go for the tea break so i think there's some questions online and here um sijui kama utakubali baadaye kuposign na kupiga picha nini yes yes that's right ah well you know what they've got yes a special treat um but if if you think there's time for questions we can uh, yes there's question there um are there any questions from from the floor from the audience we can take maybe two or three questions together to the panelists to Ida to anyone who's been speaking yes please um African continent to the to the Atlantic, and uh, not really to the uh, to the Asian uh, African mm -hmm. line. Uh, I, I, that that's a really good question. We spent we spent many many hours and days and weeks at, at so as to discuss this. But the question is, what is the relation and you know similarities and differences like between the East African experience, the culture, the literature, and the West African experience? Linking also, of course, the East African like we have seen the East African experience with the Indian Ocean on the one hand, and the West African experience with the Atlantic Ocean on the other end. Um, that, you know, it's a very good question. I note that any other questions, and we can maybe group them together a little bit. 
Um, either if anybody, if you or anybody wants from the panel wants to chip uh, chip in on that question. There's something online. Wasn't there? There's online questions yeah. as well. Yes. But they're all asking to come for masters in translation. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are talking about it. And uh, <laughs> Sorry, I thought that was one question that I saw. Wait, there. as a creative writer, I, I, but it's too far from me. I can't read. Is there any? Is there any way? I think it's Dr. Radak. Is there any way writing about East Africa but living here? Do you, in your words, is there any way that you feel like you know it? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's a question about roots and how you see the roots in, the, in your writing, as I am. Mm -hmm. um. Is there more, more questions from the chat we should take? Yes, so we'll, we'll take this one. But then there's one. Um, so somebody wants to know where they can buy the books. Um, so they will be available on Amazon through a ABC, the Africa Book Collective. And they will be uh, eight pound or nine dollars. Mm. That's how much the pound has gone down. <laughs> uh, here's the question, actually. As a creative writer of Arabo Tanzanian ancestry, who's been living in the UK for a long time, have you ever had a sense of being nowhere everywhere? So you are nowhere everywhere. Mm, mm, yes. I can relate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe shall we take that for Abdul Raza? Can you? Um, it's all these literary, yes. literary uh, questions. Yes. Um, and actually, also, also, um, you are very welcome if you if you have thoughts on the East Africa West Africa link, that would be kind as well. I'm not nowhere, anywhere, or whatever. <laughs> I, I know exactly where I am. I also know exactly where I'm from. And these things are not as uh, divisive or destructive as you imagine. So I'm from Zanzibar and I live in the United Kingdom and worked here. Other people um, you know, have lived and worked elsewhere, but they're still all from Zanzibar. In the same way as, you know, you don't leave a place. The place is in your mind, in your imagination. Um, and uh, if you live somewhere else, you don't stop being whatever is going on in your head. So, so far as that's concerned, it's not a problem. Nor is it a problem to remember, because that's what writers do. They remember, they keep digging and digging and digging. When other people have stopped digging, they're still digging. And so what you know and what you have experienced and what you keep experiencing is what actually provides the energy and the impulse for, for the writing. And that, I'm afraid, doesn't stop. Sometimes you wish it would, but, but it doesn't. <laughs> the East Africa, West Africa question is really, it seems to me, um, impossible to answer. Partly because it's already, um, I think, um, using categories which are very imprecise, as I said. Uh, what does it mean to say East Africa? Indeed, West Africa. How can we, when we're starting with something already as imprecise, then say we're going to prepare one imprecision with another imprecision, what are we likely to come up with? Another imprecision. Yeah. So I think I'd rather not. <laughs> I think so. I, I, think, I think we had, to, we had a busy program, a busy morning. Um, it's time for tea break. We have 20 minutes still. Yes. And then we reconvene at uh, 10 to um, 10 to 12, I think, uh, for the next session. Is that yeah. right? Good. So we have 20 minutes tea break, which is outside in the foyer. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a great, great morning. Thanks for all participants. I hope um, everybody. Um, we will start with our next session. Um, I'll be handing over to, to Jay Rubin, who's the only presenter who's here in person. The other ones will come online. So, yeah, Jay, over to you. Sadi. Habari zenu jamani? Salama. Asante sana kwa kwa nafasi hii. Um thank you all for this uh for this opportunity which which really does feel like a like a very special uh literary and linguistic and, and intellectual opportunity. So uh in particular, I'd like to thank two people who I think will be coming in shortly. Uh and I'll just I'll I'll, th I'll thank them at the end. Um but I wanted to thank Ida for for really encouraging me to be here. Uh this is my paper on uh Abdurraza Gurna from the translator's perspective.
What does a sense of Swahiliness sound like in English? Siweza kusema kwa kifupi, but it's a matter that's been very much on my mind. For the past year and a half, I've been translating the novel Rosa Mystica by the late Euphrase Kazilahabi. Carrying Rosa's tale into another language is a foggy crossing with few navigational markers. Only a small number of contemporary Swahili novels have been translated into English. Last fall, as I was wading deeper into my project, I was also reading all the novels by Abdurrazak Gurna I could get my hands on in the post Nobel rush. I started off with Paradise and was delighted to find, woven into Gurna's prose, delectable nuggets of untranslated Swahili. Mungwana, Unyapara, Kipusa. In Gravel Heart, I began to notice how Swahili plays a role in plot development. Take the superbly named Mr. Mgeni, a man from Malindi who runs a London boarding house for transplanted African students. Upon their meeting, Mr. Mgeni confides to the narrator, Salim, that he suspects he is Mswahili Wanzangu, fellow Swahili person. But neither character explains what the word Mgeni suggests. Translated as guest, it feels warm and avuncular and foreshadows the surrogate family figure that Mr. Mgeni becomes. Translated as stranger, it signals alienation. I wasn't sure whether Mr. Mgeni was Gurna's way of indicating that Salim would become more settled in his adopted England or just the opposite. But I appreciated the Zawadi, the gift for that small portion of Gurna's audience who, like Salim and Mr. Mgeni, speak Swahili. In the last gift, I found the use of Swahili even more central to plot. The story snaps into rich but painstaking action after a character named Abbas suffers a stroke. As he returns to cognition, then language, he utters a word that signals to his wife, Mariam, that he is on the verge of sharing aspects of his past he has long kept hidden. The word becomes a waypost on Abbas's road to recovery, despite the fact that no one in Abbas's family knows what it means. Later in the novel, Abbas's son Jamal discovers through research what the Swahili speaker has known all along. Mfenesini means place of the jackfruit tree. I'd like to think that the phonetic pleasure, the breeze that can be felt beneath the tree's branches, is available to anyone who encounters the word Mfenesini. But Mfenesini is also a real place in Zanzibar. Did Garner think of Mfenesini in concrete terms, or did he ponder the word etymologically? Did he ever drift between the two, pausing at hybrid forms? Jackfruitville? Fenesi Town? In my bilingual reader's mind, Mr. Mgeni and Mfenesini formed a nexus, and I began to ask myself if Garner was both performing and obscuring a kind of translation. I couldn't shake the notion that he was translating ideas that existed for him in non-lingual Swahili spaces into a lingual English. I imagine him drawing linguistic water from a Swahili well, even if it was a private, silent one. If Gurna is doing a kind of translation, potential parallels exist between how his novels are crafted and how to approach literary translation. Might Gurna be the quintessential example of how to convey a sense of Swahiliness in English? The more I read, the more I became attached to the possibility that this was the case. When Gurna uses Swahili words in his novels, they conduct themselves visually just like their Anglophone neighbors. He almost never italicizes Swahili and never uses glossaries or footnotes. Usually, he gives contextual clues as to a word's meaning, as in this sentence from Paradise. His right shoulder had not healed properly, despite having been <coughs> set by a famous Mganga. Sometimes the same word appears across different novels, as in this sentence from Gurna's most recent offering, Afterlives. After the third miscarriage in three years, she was persuaded by neighbors to consult an herbalist, an mganga. Does an herbalist reset a shoulder? No, but an mganga does. By employing the same word in different situations, Gurna draws out the word's meaning, which is one that doesn't correspond to English in a one-to-one -one way. Instead of defining Swahili words, Gurna often performs a kind of slant translation, a blurring or smudging of associations that reveals additional meanings. When a menacing older character says Kijana Mzuri to the protagonist Yusuf in Paradise, it's followed by beautiful boy. A more exact translation of Kijana is young person. The word is non-gendered and elastic, encompassing both adolescents and youthful adults. In transforming Kijana to boy, Gurna achieves a pleasing alliteration and also emphasizes the age difference between Yusuf and his overseer. Beautiful boy suggests danger and taboo in a way beautiful young person doesn't. Gurna's first novel, Memory of Departure, makes clear that this interplay between languages has been with him since the beginning of his literary project. The first literal departure of protagonist Hassan takes the form of a train ride to Nairobi. His travel mate with whom he shares a sleeping compartment is a confident young man named Moses Mwinyi. At first, Hassan is too anxious to speak in anything other than head nods or single word answers. But Moses Mwinyi, Moses Mwinyi eventually charms him into conversation. What are you called, man? He asked finally, gently. 
The phrasing of the question is a curious translation of what Moses Mwini likely would have said in Swahili, Wanaituanani. A morpheme for morpheme translation of that adjusted for English syntax would be, who are you called? By blending who are you called with what's your name, Gurna arrives at Moses' question. The near familiarity and at the same time newness of what are you called, man, creates a linguistic space in which English language sensibilities and Swahili language sensibilities start to blend. Tellingly, the carving out of such a territory doesn't come at an arbitrary moment. The curious phrasing feels tied to Hassan's reluctance to speak, that moment of awkwardness before he and Moses Mwini break through to greater warmth. Memory of departure also contains memorable culinary moments that are imbued with Swahiliness. When Hassan inquires about some unappealing meat that he's brought home, his mother responds proverbially, if you buy cheap meat, you can always smell the saving that you've made. When Hassan thinks back to a school trip to a seaside town in Zanzibar, he recalls 10 delicious days of half-cooked fish and soggy pancakes. In my American mind, pancakes suggest fluffy flapjacks topped with sweet maple syrup. By opting for pancakes over chapati, Gurna gives the reader an opportunity, an opportunity to expand their own associations. Across his novels, Gurna combines colloquial English, literary English, and Swahili-fied English, resulting in a reading experience whose complexity is masked only because it's so pleasurable. Is this not precisely what a translator from Swahili into English would aspire to be doing? As an emerging translator, it seemed to me an exciting prospect to have as my guiding light an author whose books charted a clear course. But what about that other side, that more political side of Gurna? Was there not something deeply suspicious, something paranoid about my theory that Gurna was performing a kind of hidden translation from his real language? Had I ever stopped to consider Conrad's use of English? Had I ever stopped to wonder whether Conrad was actually secretly translating from Polish? Hapana. If I was going to be at all honest, I had to admit an unconscious bias on my part. Granted, my own Ubaguzi wasn't the most overt kind. It was that more hidden but no less harmful variety that Gerda's characters encounter again and again when he finally gets them to Europe. My theory was either in need of abandonment or radical revision. Tired of speculating over whether it could be salvaged, I turned to where I should have looked in the beginning, Gurna himself. In a 2004 essay in Wasafiri called Writing in Place, Gurna discusses the youthful compositions he undertook as an adolescent in Zanzibar. His early writings were, in his own words, playful and serious tasks. He points out that the contemporary Swahili writing he was aware of at the time was all intended for popular consumption. Those authors of newspaper poems and stories written for radio didn't lack talent, but they had day jobs in a newly independent nation that demanded much of its citizens. He takes pains to not create any perception that Swahili is literarily impoverished. But for all his carefulness never to diminish Swahili, Gurna is characteristically coy about the language of his earliest efforts. One has to look elsewhere and cobble together various accounts. On an episode of the London Review Bookshop podcast, Gurna reveals that, as a student in Zanzibar, he wrote in both Swahili and English. It was in the English class that I would find this pleasure of writing, he notes, which is peculiar because he also notes that back then, I didn't speak English, really. But as early as age eight or nine, he attests, when somebody asked me to write in English, I could. In the Wasafiri essay, when Gurna says that he first began writing around age 21, he's talking about writing because he felt compelled to. Given how explicit he is about the connection between reading and writing, it's safe to assume he means writing in English. In England, he relates, English gradually started to feel to him like a spacious and roomy house accommodating writing and knowledge with heedless hospitality. If English was an airy house with Swahili, like many of the dwelling spaces Garnet depicts in his novels, a cramped quarters with stagnant air, dim lights, and mold blooms climbing the walls, what he has to say on the LRB podcast suggests not. Asked at what point reading and stories became significant in his life, he mentions Alpha Leila Ulela, which would have been translated into Swahili, right away. He clarifies that the Arabian Nights stories were not only read in his youth. Versions of them, along with other stories, were transmitted orally, often by people who weren't literate. In interview after interview, Gurna opts for a firm but neutral explanation for why he doesn't write in Swahili. Asked by a BBC correspondent if authors are tempted to write in English in order to gain wider recognition, Gurna demurs. Relationships to languages are not something one decides and declares. Announcing, I'm going to be a sprinter, does not enable one to run. Gurna uses a variation of the track and field metaphor, metaphor on the LRB podcast. You can't ask a sprinter, have you ever thought of doing high jump? You can, rather, but people usually don't. Gurna's strongly implied suggestion is that it's no different with literary languages. The people who write in Swahili are the people who have that particular talent in that language, he explains in the BBC interview. Those that write in English presumably have that talent there, too. He goes on, ever polite, but as if he's been here before. There's nothing troublesome, it seems to me, to have people making these kinds of decisions. The languages are available to them. Why not? 
my experience, he elaborates, is I didn't start writing in Kiswahili and I didn't even think about what language I was writing. In other words, he was never comparing English and Swahili. Asked directly about his experience of growing up with multiple languages, he answers without hesitation. I didn't have a consciousness of choice. All this deeply considered even-handedness suggests Garna never felt any glee or liberation about leaving Swahili behind. In fact, he never did leave Swahili behind. It's the language of his relationships with family and friends in Tanzania. Until last year, he served on the board of the Mabati Cornell, now Safal Cornell, prize for new manuscripts written in Swahili. Half a century after he arrived in England, he still reads for pleasure in Swahili and admires the people who can do it. Might he regret that he's not one of those people? That's how it happened, Garna submits, with some resignation detectable in his voice, but with no hint of majuto. Besides, it's not as if Garna can't write at all in Swahili. He writes utilitarian things, but his Swahili, in his own words, doesn't produce poetry. Ask him if he's ever been tempted to write Swahili literature, and he's liable to start speaking of shot putters and steeplechasers. It's not surprising that Garna keeps an analogy handy to respond to these interrogations, especially when all that's needed to understand his deep engagement with and unshakable commitment to Swahili is a glimpse at his novels. I was ready to retire my theory when, in a moment of serendipitous timing, my thesis advisor at Queens College, Anne-Marie Drury, sent me a link to another interview. This one was with the German broadcasting net network Deutsche Welle, and it was conducted in Swahili. Pressed about his relationship to Swahili in Swahili, Gerner responds with surprising answers. Translated, one key question corresponds to, why do you address your recurring subjects in English and not in Swahili? The follow-up is less a question than a comment. Because so many of your books discuss the loneliness and isolation of leaving Zanzibar and arriving somewhere foreign, perhaps you would use the Swahili language as part of your culture. The push in Poland Swahili inspire in Gurna different reactions and similar questions posed in English. He doesn't become angry or appear uncomfortable. If anything, he comes off as more charming and more humorous because he's more animated. But ironically for a language in which speakers are more likely to invoke the whimsies of God over human decisions, Gurna's answers in Swahili emphasize individual will. About why his books are in English, he says, it's what I chose. English is a language I know and a language I read in. Also, I can choose which language I write in. I chose to write in English. If another person wants to write in Swahili, fine. You want to write in German, write in German. Really? He chose? What about Gerner's other explanations? The people who write in a particular language are the people who have a particular talent in that language. Does one choose talent? Ask the sprinter or the high jumper, and I think they'll tell you otherwise. Why does Garna sound so different here than he does in the patient English language interviews? How has choice moved to the center of the story? It may be the case that Garna feels he's being hectored. Add to that the slightly more pugilistic conversational style of Swahili and the barely submerged suggestion of missed opportunities, and Garna is suddenly declaring total agency. To the rhetorical question about if he could have written about East Africa in the language of East Africa, Garna responds, perhaps, but I didn't do that. As for writing about colonialism, immigration, and displacement, he notes that these subjects aren't exclusive to Tanzanian stories. Many people the world over migrate and encounter misery, he says. The person I'm writing for is any person who is able to read my books, whether they come from Tanzania or Argentina. The translator's task, or perhaps just a literary one, is to consider the ground from which seeming contradictions spring. I wonder if what translator and theorist Matthew Reynolds has termed present I wonder if what translator and theorist Matthew Reynolds has termed prismatic translation and has described as a release of multiple signifying possibilities might provide a glimpse between the lines of Gurna's various accounts. Not to put words in the mouth of a recent Nobel laureate, but to use his statements as raw materials for constructing a vessel capable of carrying a diverse array of sentiments. I'd like to close by sharing a paragraph that I came up with using some of Abdul Razak's words as a point of departure for my own. I chose it. Okay, I didn't simply choose it. Writing in English came out of what I was reading at the time and what I had an initial talent for. Did I choose English over Swahili? Not any more than a person chooses to prefer the taste of fish over the taste of mutton. Mimi na penda ki Swahili, si jaacha kuktumia kwenye maisha yangu. So don't suggest I'm somehow writing in English at the expense of another literary career that was never meant to be. If you do, I'm going to push back. What I'm really saying, if you must know, is that a person has the right to choose. A person can write in whatever languages are available to them. English is where I arrived at, and a person is at liberty to arrive where they arrive, whether it's via a path of wandering or via a set of lamentable historical circumstances. A person has the right to make a home in another country, especially out of a language that is not even new to them. That's how it happened. Asenteni sana. Um, thank you all for this opportunity.
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jay. So the format of this, we'll have all of our talks first, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. So if you have a question already for Jay, knot it down, put it on a piece of paper, don't forget it. We'll have time for discussion afterwards. So our next presenter is online. So we have Clarissa Virka from Bayreuth. Yes, just a second. I think I have to share my screen as well. Can you give me the permission to share? Yes, we'll just <laughs> try and do that. Do you want to try now? Does it work? Let me see. Mm. Um, let me see. I'll, yeah, I think it seems to be working. Looks good. Okay, can you see what I see? <laughs> can you see my screen? Yes, I think we can say we can see you soon. So yeah, we'll hand over to you, uh, Clarissa. Right. Um, 15 minutes, please. Um, yes. And yes. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much. And thanks again for having me. And Ida and Angelica, thank you for organizing such a wonderful Baraza again. Um, I must start with an apology. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about Mahmoud Mao and I'm not going to, talk, to take you to Kenya. So probably next time, inshallah. But now I'm going to stay on Zanzibar with you simply because these are some very fresh, um, probably immature, uh, premature at least comments on some kind of um, yeah, poetic experiences, let's say, that I had in just in September, so very, very recent. Um, but but let me give you a bit of the background to that. So together with my, my colleagues, um, Ute Fendler, Remi Chokote, and Duncan Tarrant, we, we've been running a project on literary entanglements in the Indian Ocean. And my colleagues, they bring in their competences in Francophone and, and Lusophone Africa, and Duncan Tarrant and me, we've been working on, on Swahili poetry, also with um, some kind of links to Oman. And we wonder, so do all these literatures have some common imaginaries of the Indian Ocean, which imaginaries travel and, and which also do not travel? And so far, there has been very little research on the interrelationship between English, French or Portuguese literature and the Indian Ocean, <clears throat> and let alone then, of course, then the non-European languages. So um, there have been recently quite some critical comments on that both by, by historians who say that um, there is an overdominance of European language archives. I mean, like Niall Green was actually arguing for a reconfiguration of Indian Ocean studies around its own sources and languages. And then in literary studies, Evans Mwangi and Tina Steiner also were talking about a super canon of Indian Ocean literature that exists, and that's mostly the novel um, in English. So we've, we, are, we are trying to, <laughs> to kind of work across uh, languages and also bringing in other languages from the Indian Ocean in this, in this project. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we should give up the novel, I'm just saying we should, we should broaden um, the spectrum and we should also not give up the English novel, of course. So, but back to Zanzibar. So, so Duncan and me, we've been working very much on contemporary popular poetry on Zanzibar. You see some snapshots here. And for many people, this is very much an everyday practice. They do not, e do not even keep track of what they are writing. It's very much written by the common man and, and by the common woman as you want. And as the right kind of small little photo shows you, it's also very much recorded and played actually on the radio and discussed a lot on the radio. And it's very much about everyday events. So um, we've been talking to, to lots, of, lots of different people, um, asking them, um, interviewing them about their poetry. First of all, not even asking them about the Indian Ocean, but simply, why do you compose? What do you compose? Why is poetry so important to you? And um, as it turned out for many of them, this is something we did in 2019 already, um, the Indian Ocean didn't really matter much. So I asked Farouk Topan, should we probably thinking, should we probably think about forgetting the Indian Ocean? And uh, we had a very lively conversation about that, but that's more, <laughs> that's more a joke to it. People, however, they take actually enormous pleasure, as you might all know, in actually all kind of hard hitting verbal duels carried out um, on the radio or on the newspaper, lots of mafumbo. For instance, um, the guy on the upper right hand, si hand side wearing the kofiam zedere. So he. 
this parasite, the bad bug or the mosquito, and then people were discussing if this is a political reference or it actually refers to, to a love relationship. And I think um, Natalie Arnold Koenigs framed this beautifully by actually saying how there, there is a constant interrelationship between the private and the public um, in, in this kind of poetry. But what did, did this kind of finding, first of all, do to us that there is no ocean, no Indian Ocean in that poetry? I think, first of all, it made me very skeptical about Indian Ocean. Kind of our emphasis on transnational relations and cosmopolitanism probably also very much born out of our self-referential. There is an absence of the Indian Ocean we noticed earlier on in lots of poetry. And then what we did this year is actually organizing a, a poetry workshop together with the state Zanzibar, I mean, the, the State University of Zanzibar, actually inviting people um, to compose on the Indian Ocean and seeing um, what comes out of that, actually with the idea of publishing a book. <clears throat> a lot of the poetry, and I'm just going to give you a kind of, also with an idea, probably we get some other categories of looking at the Indian Ocean from there. Um, there is a lot of Indian Ocean poetry that we found where the Indian Ocean turns actually into the Ujumiwa blue, um, which I found quite curious. We didn't have that in 2019, but now, so to say, it seems to be, um, it seems to be all over. Here, this is a poem by Raya Mohammed Said. She is a secondary um, school student actually from Pemba. <clears throat> and um, it's a quite typical kind of, kind of poem, um, this kind of Faidaya kind of style of poetry in praise of mostly progress, which one can also could tie into a Nyerere idea of writing poetry thinking about the progress um, of the nation. Um, so on the one hand, one can also see, so to say, some continuities of how to write poetry. So uh, at the same time, there was lots of poetry, Faida as a sensor about people, um, um, or, or Faida Ya Chanjo about, so to say, the benefits of, of the vaccination. Here it's about um, Uchumiwa Blue, which is a kind of a policy which was very much um, promoted by Zanzibar's president, Hussein Mwini, in 2020 already. And in 2022, there has been, I mean, so far they have spent 70 million US dollars on actually developing the archipelago's blue economy, the Ujumiwa blue, mostly actually investing into industrial fishing. And that also feeds back into the school curriculum because we found many actually schools um, actually talking about the blue economy now, and we, which we find here reflected in, in the poetry. So um, here, so to say, looking at, at, at her poetry in particular, Soraya Mohammed Said, I, we, I, I'm kind of wondering, so how do we also include critically these notions of the Indian Ocean as a blue, in, blue economy into our discussions of literature, which are terribly romanticist often, as it seems to me. So how do we bring in what the Kenyan author Yvonne Athiambo Awar called the cacophonies of the Indian Ocean present? How do we bring in, in a sense, the, the capitalist view on, on the Indian Ocean? And do we also not contribute with our kind of romanticist views um, in, a, in a way sugarcoating also these um, other aspects of the Indian Ocean as a geopolitical space, as a very economically debated kind of space? I was this time in September, I went to a Tarab concert at the Emerson Spice Hotel, a very expensive hotel. And I really saw also how the tourism industry um, explores the Indian Ocean as a kind of Orientalist trope, which made me also very much reflect on. And this, of course, also then feeds back into local discourses. I could show you many, much more poetry on tourism. How do we take these loops also critically into account with, which, with the whole cultural industry in there? Going to show you a bit of a different poetry. That's Hadi Makame Hadi. He used to be a school teacher um, on Pemba. And here we find the, the, the kind of the lyrical ID observer standing on the beach, seeing container ships um, passing by. And um, actually, there is not much of an idea of that, that you could see in the other stanzas of a rupture compared to the past. So previously there were Daos, now there are container ships. And the, the Bahari Murua brings them all. So it's an elegant ocean, probably also a good ocean. There is an aspect of morality um, in there as well. What I find very striking about this poetry as well as in others, it's, it's the ocean which brings all of this and the observer is quite, I mean, writes from an inert kind of position. So it's, it's kind of being acted upon rather than acting in this context. 
Similarly, this plays out in a poem by Ali Mwanim Ali. He used to be a university um, lecturer, also teaching about poetry, who talks about the winds and the winds we've, we, I mean, which brought the Arabs and the Omanis and the Surinamese people coming from the east and it's like the human being um, just being a relative category actually in these forces which are much more which are very physical forces as well um, that are the historical agents in the indian ocean um, not the human beings they are just being brought by the winds the force of the sea and i think that comes out also in 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 some poetry which i really liked a lot by abdallah ali abdallah he is um, a student he's just taking a ba in education but he has also worked a lot on daos he wrote a poem um shambali so palisi which you can also see each stanza that's an acrostic so the stanza starts um, start with the letters and the letters together form the word bahari so we could see some palimpsest here, which would, could, could explore further. Um, but what I find um, really interesting here is um, there is the idea that you really can't domesticate the ocean. It's not a field um, which needs weeding. It remains largely, as you see in this stance, or an enigma or a riddle. It's deep, and um, traveling on it is, is kind of a very lonely trip. It can also come with lots of calamities. In the next stanza, it says, so there is brightness and color in it, um, but it also wounds us terribly and wears off our skin. Um, so, and, and another, in another poem he wrote, Hamkani, which probably one could translate as fear or anxiety or probably even terror, and it's, it's, it's a huge fear. There is this invincible kind of ocean, the brutal force of the ocean, which comes in even, even more profoundly. At the beginning, we hear actually the captain shouting, um, get control of the sail if you want. And then the crew is, um, there's a huge chaos bre breaking on, breaking out on the dowel as, as the sea actually heaps up. And, um, and, this, at, at, and at the end of the poem, actually, I um, have to preempt that already, the, the ship is going to sink. So it, it's a very, so to say, dramatic um, kind of poem. There is no beauty, there is just the brutal force um, of the ocean in here. In one of the late of the last stanzas, you have then the reference actually to um, to Judgment Day and the, the ocean. The ocean is, is boiling, which reminded me in many ways also of um, there is a, there, there are many stanzas um, in earlier poetry, which I've worked on much more than actually the popular contemporary one, where, for instance, in the Inkishaf, you have a line, Ulimwengo Bahari Tessi. So the world is a, temp is a tempestuous sea, the wild sea, which then here becomes also a metaphor of, of the deplorable nature of, of human life. And one could wonder, so to say, if Ali Abdallah Ali also plays with this kind of trope, which I've called elsewhere a kind of a cultural figuration. So it's an imagery that has become part of a, of a Swahili archive which of course interacts then with people's um, experiences. I could give you another um, um, example. I just want to say beautiful example, but in fact, it's a, it's a terrible example of, which is of a poem which is called Jinamizi by Buanam Shiko, who actually in his poem reflects upon the terrible ship sinking, which happened roughly 10 years ago of the MS Spice, a ship which sank between um, Pemba and, and Unguja, where 3,000 people died in, in, in one night, um, where in a sense, the, the, the sinking of the ship um, is again, so to say, being kind of, um, kind of re-explored here. Um, so what I'm, what I'm basically, in a sense, um, trying to say, which is, this is now has been a very rough ride <laughs> through this poetry, um, there, there's, there's a lot more to say about that. Um, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is, um, I, in the sense that we, I'm looking at this poetry on the one hand with the idea of, of editing and of course also providing better translations, but also which kind of notions of the Indian Ocean do we get out of here. What I find very striking is, as I said, this concrete physical reality um, of the ocean. One could even say it's a kind of questioning the Anthropocene, the, the centrality of the human being. And the human being has been so prominent in Indian Ocean research, thinking about how we focus, how we've been focusing on trade relations, how the ocean is often also in lots of literature even absent. Yeah, it's, it's really about the cosmopolitan links of, of people. So um, Kupan in a, in a recent article actually argued for the concrete material aspect of Indian Ocean objects. Um, because she says there are these sensuous materialities which cannot be paraphrased and and I think one also needs needs to think more about the ocean. This has been done already, but I think there is, there is more work to do. 
about the ocean which precedes us as human beings, as the poem wonderfully says in, in some parts, um, but it, which is on the one hand then also really a very physical experience for many and a constant experience, but then of course it also becomes formulated in relation to um, a long existing cultural archive, like for instance, the Inkishafi, but also then recently coined tropes. So this is not an, uh, the cultural archive is dynamic. So the Uchumiwa blue is in a sense, the new trope or some new kind of narrative devices here, which come in. So I'm very much interested in, in the, the lived realities of people in relation to the ways um, the Indian Ocean has been talked about and is being talked about either in poetry or also in these political tropes. And I think I'll, I'll stop here. Sorry for the disruption. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much, Clarissa, and thanks for rejoining us. Those extensive applause in the room as well. So hopefully you can hear that. Um, so again, if you have questions, make a note of them. If you're online, you can perhaps even put the question in the chat, but we'll take questions together um, after our final speaker. So I think next we have um, Francisca Faye from Mainz. Yes. Hi. Great. Thank you. Um, Yes, kamoni cheche nami na naomba ni nianze na shukran kidogo kwa kwa kuwa na nafasi ya kuwepo leo na hata nikipata nafasi ya kurudi soas kidigitali mimi na furai sana hivyo shukrani kwa ida na Angelica kwa kwa event he ni ni um ya furaha kubwa pia ku kuwa na wote leo um. During the years I lived in London, while I was writing my PhD in anthropology at SOAS, I kept a crumpled printout of one of Zanzibar-born artist Lubaina Hamid's paintings on the walls of my London homes. I do not remember how I came to own it. Five, a painting of two black women in debate and negotiation at a table had kept me on my academic toes. It became a reminder of positionality representation and diversity in apparent union while I was researching and writing about children's lives and their experiences of protection and violence in Zanzibar. Now almost um, exactly a year ago at her largest solo exhibition to date at the Tate Modern in London, which ended at the beginning of this month, I had not seen Professor Hamid's works in real life. Walking through her show then, again, an internal dialogue was set in motion over matters I've more recently been thinking about, including varying ideas of the Indian Ocean or the Afrabian, the Swahili or otherwise sea, how we as academics with the words of Yvonne Adhyambo Owa story the ocean, how we are giving voice to these seas, of the networks and the practices, the diasporas and languages that constitute those realms, and the role that women play amid this imaginary. So over the next um, 12 minutes or so, I want to take as point of departure some of Hamid's paintings that stayed with me in thinking about these themes. I would like to propose that this can help to sketch out a range of questions that may be worthwhile, if not necessary, in contemporary reflections on the networks that span the Indian Ocean in anthropology and across the disciplines in which we theorize the subjects of Swahili studies. My presentation is an attempt at a very condensed summary of a paper that Clarissa knows about, which is a work in progress and in which I argue that by thinking about the ocean with counter archives of contemporary feminist engagement with the sea, like he meets, one of the people who, as Julia Werner puts it nicely, carry the ocean with them, we may become able to better understand the sea intersectionally. I'll be most grateful for your feedback and suggestions in taking this argument further. The theoretical context that frames my ideas are growing expressions for the need to think about the Indian Ocean through a decolonial, multivocal, effective and intersectional lens, as expressed, for example, recently by Smiti Srinivas, Bitinan Gweno and Nilima J. Chandran in Reimagining Indian Ocean Worlds, or elsewhere by Marcos and Julia Werner, for example, who argue for thinking about the Indian Ocean worlds as a space, as they write, characterized by and constituted through translocal aesthetic practices, and by taking into account the aesthetic experiences of those we try to understand. Back to the book, in it, Srinivas Ngueno and Jay Chandran set out to look for new units of analysis or keywords to shed light on this dynamic oceanic space and to push for an epistemic shift 
in thinking and writing about Indian Ocean worlds. The authors attempt this by emphasizing the importance of analyzing lives beyond the historical, that is with a specific focus on the contemporary and the contemporaneous. More specifically, they articulate the need to counter, uh, to center conceptual and theoretical relationality over area-based geographical approaches, privileging placemaking and quotidian practices over mobilities, to think with new networks of memory and maps alongside older histories of connections, and to rely more on ethnographic and humanistic methodologies that examine memorialization in contemporary contexts over historical archives and textual sources. Now, this call for reorientation in the study of what we commonly refer to as the Indian Ocean can also be understood and here as formulated by the feminist futures in the Indian Ocean cluster at UC Santa Cruz as a reaction to the lack of explicitly feminist scholarship in Indian Ocean studies that moves beyond prioritizing the male gaze in the study of the sea. Now, by taking this push for an epistemic shift in thinking and writing about Indian Ocean world seriously, I propose as one way of thinking through this lack of female or relational, uh, relationally gendered framings of the ocean that we turn more frequently to contemporary art, here, Lebena Hamid's paintings of women and water. Her and other artistic practice may contribute to the search for new units of analysis or keywords in writing oceanic worlds as they speak to us as aesthetic and political productions in their own rights, as a neglected body of knowledge at, uh, that scholarly discourses of the Indian Ocean should include, and ultimately as an alternative navigation chart for a potential reconfiguration of Indian Ocean studies or Swahili studies of the sea. In Hamid's works, oceans and water are everywhere, but not in the way historical narratives have often viewed the sea scenarios through the lens of the masculine and by neglecting what Nidhi Mahajan in her article Seasons of Sail calls the women who stay or who do not move with seafaring men. Instead of sailors gliding dows or scenes of arrival and departure in oceanic trading ports, Hamid offers us large scale paintings that depict women characters in situations with the sea. In act one, no maps from 1992, we find ourselves in a theater box alongside two black female protagonists who gaze over what appears to be an empty stage past a red curtain that half covers a turquoise in black, a uh, blue background. Looking again, we may also see these two women aboard and at the front of a vessel with a red sail, observing, despite in different directions, the waves of a stormy sea. The multiple ways of seeing what Hamid presents us with are a strategy she operates with through her art that leave the audience guessing, unsettled in regard to what it is we are looking at. Act one, as possible beginning, or a turning point, a reconsideration of what it may mean to think with no maps that fall as ripped up paper from the two women's hands. This presentation of two active and reconfiguring subjects that refuse the maps of their worlds and the knowledge of their histories they have been presented with may be, as Bernier has put it, ideally placed to generate alternative memoirs and a new narrative of black diasporic lives. In Between the Two, My Heart is Balanced, from a year earlier, from 1991, a painting from the same series titled Revenge, several aspects encountered in Act One, No Maps Echo. In Hamid's own words, this painting was an attempt to show, as she states, that we all have subtly different strategies from each other. We appear to be doing the same thing, but are not. The, women, uh, the woman on the left in the painting is taking navigation charts from a pile that separates them. The two women then rip these up, discarding the fragments. The other woman is ripping up maps and engaging with the rower of the boat, the audience." End quote. He meets very individualized subjects, or what she herself calls the device of placing two Black women in a painting together, is devoted to, as she emphasizes, counteract this assumption that there was only one story and that the black woman never spoke. Then there is the Zanzibar series of nine double paintings from the late 1990s of which, for example, in Women's Tears Fill the Ocean from 1999, the visible women protagonists of her work shift shape and appear through the effective aspects ascribed to them as their tears here. Referencing her father's sudden passing when she was a baby, which prompted her relocation to the UK, Hamid explains that 
The thinly applied paint, sometimes green, sometimes pink or gray, drips, splashes, and falls endlessly in monochrome tears in painting after painting, and helped her to, as she states, understand the, con the consistent themes of melancholy, fear of flight, and unresolved unbelonging present in most of her works. He meets concern with the sea, she explains further, stems from many things, among them her personal history, as well as, as she states, the reading of narratives about and by people taken forcibly from West Coast Africa to be later used as slaves, end quote. Not resting her gaze on the elsewhere though, however, she qualifies this interest referring to her own Comorian grandmother's history of, um, of being taken to Zanzibar, having been bought from her parents by a Portuguese woman, and wonders that she must have traveled in a Dao in around 1900 from one of the Comorian islands to Zanzibar. With the notions of fear and unbelonging central here, that's, no, sorry. The, um, the Zanzibar series that reflects Hamid's fear of and obsession with the sea shines a light on that part of female ocean journeys both personal and political, voluntary and not so, that form a critical current to understandings of the sea beyond male memories of trade and torment and extending to places away from the more thoroughly documented invisible. Women histories being central here. It allows us to shift to effective dimensions embodied through, caused by and related to the Indian Ocean to what the sea does to people physically and psychologically or to what it comes to stand for. And finally, there's Hamid's more recent body of works from 2019 that includes three architects and the operating table. And after centering women and the audience at sea and the sea as embodied by women through the 1990s, in these works now, we re-encounter both themes in yet another translation. The sea now has become less central. It is either lurking in, sometimes haunting the protagonists, at the center of the paintings are now the actions and operations performed by the subject at stake. What he meets women do against the backdrop of the sea or despite of it is now emphasized. As the three architects are working on their own visions while sharing a space, reinvokes the theme of multivocality, while one ocean stretches across their view of the horizon and the floor appears as a changing shore, and as Amrita Dalu puts it, the protagonists are radiating the confidence and purpose to build a new world together, this world potentially belonging to the one we associate with the Indian Ocean. The operating table um, offers yet another angle to these themes, the audience now taking a seat at the table with again a constellation of different women who, unlike the three architects, interact more obviously yet hesitantly with, other, um, with each other, certainly echoing five deep in discussion and potential disagreement over a map that includes a body of water developing what Dalu has aptly termed an embodied governance of land and possibly, as I would like to add, also of the sea. Such an embodied governance of spaces, land and sea, ocean and shore that involves uh, that evolves from women in collaboration and conversation makes it possible to think with but farther than acts of refusal, such as the tearing apart of maps and toward generative practice and constructive change that is already taking place. Now, recalling Srinivas uh, et al's call to think afresh with the Indian Ocean, and if, as Hamid states, painting is indeed about filling in the gaps in something, cont her contemporary practice may well fill or guide this call to thinking the ocean otherwise. Extending Indian Ocean knowledge production to include diasporic or post-diasporic artistic negotiations of the sea and grounding it in the present contemporary moment and its associated practices such as Hamid's political painting may move the field into the present moment and out of older archives. The conceptual and theoretical relationality of Hamid's practice that foregrounds themes entangled in aesthetics and affect, such as women and water, pleasure and discomfort, dialogue and collaboration, disagreement and refusal, multiplicity, reconfiguration, loss in memory, trauma and the body, move the imaginary of the oceanic out of the realm of external or area-based descriptions and toward emic perspectives of what the worlds can be. The focus on women's everyday practices in the places they are in lets us think with the Indian Ocean as thoroughly rooted also in the present moment and not only in longed for futures or places that could be achieved by way of mobility. 
Hamid's protagonist's refusal to operate with external colonial navigation charts and maps, their ripping apart and getting rid of points to the generative potential inherent in refusing certain frames of thought that pertain also to our disciplines. A call for thinking with new networks of memory and maps against the backdrop of older histories and connections resonating or was reflecting on Swahili navigational poetry that you correlate your places using the memory of maps that are instilled in you is housed in Hamid's works. Finally, if oceans challenge and change feminist research, the sites and forms of knowledge production, and not to mention the ground beneath your feet, as Gina Heathcote, Irene Gadalov, and Joanna Hoare argue in the introduction to their recent special issue of the Feminist Review on Oceans, then the gendered aesthetic embodied and effective relations at the heart of Hamid's practice that delineate what the authors call the forgotten, erased, and inaudible voices that otherwise fall out of the visible spaces of the vast, volatile histories of seafaring journeys may also change the knowledge produced on the Indian Ocean. Centering such alternate effective histories or what Mina Alexander has aptly called nervous knowledge may help orient Indian Ocean knowledge production to move towards thinking with that which is, as Alexander also puts it, not static in the way that an old fashioned map is, something that has to be rekindled time and again. So with her art that is quote, about encouraging agency through our ability to inhabit paintings, to engage with them, not as voyeurs, but participants. And as the political strategist who uses a visual language to encourage conversation, argument and change that he himself self describes as her contemporary practice is a promising guide towards a genuinely endless ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. So our next presenter yeah. uh, is here in person. Okay, great, fantastic. Um, so welcome, um, Zanda Ramadani Gilza. Sure, thank you. How about you, Zaino? So thank you so much for this opportunity. So my presentation is on Swahili feminist publishing networks, investigating E&D vision publishing, editorial and marketing strategies for the Uwa Amor Zahar. So this um, is uh, the, uh, the it's, it, it, it's investigating the editorial and marketing strategies through which there is some based feminist publisher, E&D publishing has produced the biography of the Uwa Amor Zahar which was the only woman who was at the front line during the Zanzibar revolution in 1964. And so it accounts for her life uh, and it's written by Zohra Yunus, a former BBC journalist. And uh, this uh, publication is not only written by a woman, uh, about a woman, but also is published by a woman and co-edited by a woman. And coming up with this uh, research is a, a product of my going, ongoing PhD project. And it involves um, some interviews with some of the people who are involved in this publication, including Zuhra Yunus, who was the author, and then Eli Shilema, the publisher. The American Tunga is also part of the publishing team. And then Saida Yahya Othman, who was the co-editor. And close reading of the text itself, the Uba Amo Zahar and analysis of the uh, social media content. So, um, yeah, so that's the uh, front cover of the, of the book. And so, um, so it's uh, uh, getting back to the research, uh, it involves uh, research has been done uh, on the development of print culture and publishing in Eastern Africa. And it has highlighted the, uh, the shifting role of women in the industry and the relation to the wider economic dynamics. There are a lot of researchers that have been done on that. And then one of the important scholar work that I'm involved with is uh, Women Writing Eastern Africa, which was written by Amandina Lihamba and others. And then this uh, documents the role of women writers in building feminist consciousness through written text. However, um, little attention has been paid on uh, the role of women in the Tanzanian publishing industry through knowledge uh, which is being produced. And thus this paper investigates the role of women in the Tanzanian publishing industry through the work of E&D uh, 
uh, in enabling this literal production and the circulation of feminist voices and histories in Tanzania, a, a publishing space which um, is said to be uh, dominated by men. So it's first of all important to account for E&D and uh, it's important to know that the, uh, the company was registered in uh, 1989 uh, as a publishing consulting firm and it is owned by Elia Shlema and Demary Kitunga. And this uh, publishing house uh, currently E&D uh, is working, its uh, aim is to, to be operating from a feminist perspective with the aim of bringing more gender balanced view of the social development into literature and publishing. It publishes various uh, fiction and nonfiction books and so, uh, on social, political and economic areas, as well as textbooks and children's books in different levels. It should be noted that uh, women have been involved in the writing uh, even before independence. Uh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, they have been involved uh, even before independence, but um, however, uh, it's after independence that we are seeing feminist, uh, sorry, uh, publishing houses that are owned or co-owned by women starting to emerge. And it's uh, particularly important to note that E&D so far is their first feminist owned publishing company and which is uh, operating owned uh, by women, that is Elie Shilema and Demare Kitunga and has survived for a long time. So that is very important to first of all, account for the histories of these two women and how they get involved with the company. So these are Elie Shilema and Demare Kitunga. And it's important to note that while Elie, she started her publishing career at TPH and then as her own worked with uh, Kode as a director for uh, East Africa, and then let's her own join the Merikitunga to establish E&D. The Merikitunga's publishing journey started when she joined DUP as an editor, and then let's, let's her own, she moved to work with Tanzania Bureau of Standards as a librarian for two years, and then let's her own, she worked with other women to form Tanzanian Gender Networking Program, TGNP, where she worked there as a chairperson for some time before uh, establishing the END company together with Elieshi Lemmer. So the, this article is informed by the theoretical framework uh, on African feminism. Uh, I'm looking at works by Susan Arndt, Shima Mandangozi Adichie, Obioma, Nemeka, as well as uh, uh, Busia. And so, we, these women are interested on what they think of feminist publishing, mostly as work that aimed at liberating women uh, from the patriarchal structures and bringing a more uh, inclusive society where women's voices are valued. So building on this, I just explore e and uh, publishing and their role in producing feminist knowledge, aiming at liberating women from all forms of uh, uh, opera, uh, oppression and uh, so, so the work that I'm working on is Biwa Amor Zahar. So, accounting for this book, uh, it's uh, this is about a feminine a phenomenon woman at, of Arabian origin who was born in Zanzibar, and uh, Biwa, that's, her name is Biwa Amor Zahar, and. Uh, not only talks about her life before independence, it also accounts for her life after independence and in the new Zanzibar. So the book aims to narrate the contribution of women in the creation of Zanzibar history during the independence struggle and the contribution that has not previously been documented as it's said in the foreword by Mariam Hamdani. And Although it's a historical account for you was life, the book also illustrates the lives of other important leaders in Zanzibar uh, and uh, as well as the revolution fighters. It's written in a narrative form uh, using standard uh, Swahili, which is uh, very rich in vocabularies and sayings. And it makes it easy for somebody to, fall, to follow and read it and very interesting to read. So for example, when I, interviewed Lemma and she was uh, commenting about uh, 
uh, the main character of uh, the main focus of the book that is Biwa, uh, and how this uh, book was really interesting for her. She said that she think uh, thinks of Biwa as a very free soul, free spirit, who chose uh, what she wanted her life to be, and that uh, also very patriot and committed to her country. Uh, in line with that. Uh, Zuhura Yunus uh, narrates that Biwa uh, in the book, uh, I, I want to read this quotation, which I think is very important. Biwa, bintu wa kizanzibari, kavuka bahari, milima na mabonde, mpaka nchijirani ya Kenya. Biwa likuwa nani hasa? Na kwa nini apewe kazi nzitu za serikali? Alikuwa kiingia ikulu kama anavyotaka, anaweka historia miongoni mwa wanawake walio shirikiana kwa karibu sana na viongozi maarufu na mihimili katika historia ya Zanzibar akiwemo Abdul Razak Babu Kasim Hanga familia ya Karume na wengine wengi wakiwemo wa Tanzania bara pia So this is very important because uh, Zuhra is actually making an uh, making an imperative point here highlighting on how Biubwa a woman from the coast was able to carry out uh, these duties fearlessly and then this means uh, that she was considered as someone who was different from other women of her uh, generation. She's even when in, in this book uh, talking about her own experience and how other women were viewing her. So Biuba serves as an inspiration to the young generation on patriotism and for the readers of the biography of her status and her contribution to her own nation. So during my interview with Zuhra, she informed me that, um, yeah, that's the publication process now. So during my interview with Zuhra, she informed me that the writing of the biography was a result of an on ongoing discussion that she had with her friends through WhatsApp and they were complaining why uh, African history was not written by Africans themselves. And then she was like, she decided to be different and take an initiative to write because she felt that if the history of Africans is not Afri written by Africans, then the Zanzibar is even worse. And then when thinking of women who are always voiceless, it could have been really interesting to write about them. So she said that uh, she didn't know actually a feminist publishing house that was owned by women. And the recommendation to work with END was a result of her discussion with her friend, Dr. Champi Chachage, who is a historian working in the US. So when commenting about the editorial process, Zuhra pointed out about the role of her publisher, END, uh, through Elie Shilema, that it was really amazing working with her. And then she talked about her copy editor, Saida Yahya Othman, who was somebody who was very good, thorough, and tough. And then she said that although she was a copy editor, she also commented a lot on the content as well. And then she said she also not only worked with women, but she also gave her publication to two reviewers who are men, Ahmi Rajab, who was an experienced editor and a former BBC journalist and a columnist for Ayamwema, who was originally from Zanzibar and who kept checking on facts but also giving it a different perspective that is a male perspective, thinking of it from a different angle. But again, gave it to Ch Chambi Chechage, who was a second reviewer working in the US, who pointed out on historical aspect and what historians will be interested to, to learn and what is really important to the nation's history. So according to Yunus, while women had their own opinion, what they thought it is important, male reviewers provided a different view to the work and that it was really important considering how controversial the subject was. So during the interview with Lemar, she said that the book was so much focusing on Zanzibar and so working with Professor Saida Yahya, who was a scholar from Zanzibar, but had a global perspective was very important because for example, she questioned, if you had an editor from the mainland, how would you do it? Saida does not only know Biwa, but she knows Babu and the history. She was part of the history. Choosing Saida was strategic and it was not automatic. So it was a good experience working with her. So this is very important thinking of how this network of friendship and network of professionalism and how different people from different backgrounds were working together to make sure this publication was successful. 
Another important uh, aspect of this book was how women to women relationship was important to its publication. So Lemma maintains that uh, when uh, she was working with Yunus, she said that uh, Zuhra is somebody who is inside her work. And I allowed her because it was important. If I blocked her way, it could have done a lot of disservice. So I let her move. She's someone who would give her, uh, she's someone who needs to be given the courage not to worry, just do it. Because some of the things she was writing were critical and controversial. So this is important thinking about how it was important for Zuhra to work with another woman supporting what she was writing about because some of the things that needed this kind of relationship, which was very important to uncover. And then in one of the uh, part where Elia, she was still commenting on how the book came out, came out she was saying that um, women's uh, 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 history about women is always covered. And so if one is going to write and she's going to publish, then they have to work together to uncover what is hidden because women do things courageously and they're suppressed. So Yunus's book discusses a number of critical issues, including Zanzibar revolution, uh, death of the first president of Zanzibar, and then the death of Bill was further. All these things are very critical and they raised a lot of uh, debates, not only on uh, uh, digital space, but also on the physical space, on the role of Bill when what she did, and even the Zanzibar history, and it was really to it brought a lot of memories about this publication. I thus argue on the importance of this supportive structure, which was built between these women as vital for the publication. So, when took, one other Im important aspect that I, dis I want to discuss is on the question of language. Bugoya asserts that the use of um, Yeah, so Bugar said that uh, the use of the foreign languages hinders the development of indigenous publishing because there is less development in the creation of a literary reading public, which might result from wider publishing in Kiswahili. This affirms a positive reception of Biuba's book because the readers can, could easily read and understand the text. Thus, accessibility is a clearly uh, something prioritized in Zuhra's work. For example, the book makes use of simple constructions, uh, pictorial language, and then people could really associate themselves with what is written. So the use of Kiswahili has been one of the reason for uh, the uh, book's immediate success because there's a wider reading public for books in Kiswahili compared to English, as it has been said by other scholars who have been doing works in publishing and writing in East Africa. And so, you can see that although the Swahili that is used here somehow resembles Zanzibar Swahili, but the book has been read not only by people from Zanzibar, but a lot, a lot of people also from the mainland. And that is really important thinking of the relationship between people in the mainland and those of Zanzibar. So this signifies a revolution in readership, feminism, studies, and Swahili literature in Tanzania, arguing for the role of African writers in knowledge circulation, through which uh, the use of common language plays a major role. So the development of technology, which paved the way to the uh, development of digital publishing was another important factor for the success of this book and making it uh, easy for marketing of the material. So when we talk about digital publishing and we see some of the work scholars who have talked about it, including Jay and Bugoya, who talked of the uh, quick access of the material provided uh, through the forum given by the uh, to the readers. Hans Zell also assessed that the internet is a huge and a rich source of uh, book professions, which serves as a powerful marketing medium, which uh, uh, with relatively medium cost and wider uh, reach promote publication to uh, targeted groups. So this is very important because even when I, I interviewed Demare, she said that uh, internet and the digital publishing has made it easy for people to access their works throughout uh, the world uh, in different, using different platforms and using different ways. And so it was important that this work was successful through, through the use of social media. So now getting back to this uh, publication, uh, while the uh, publishing 
idea came out of the WhatsApp group. It's marketing all through digital platforms such as Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, and Clubhouse. So thinking of success of the book, Yunus explains that the subject matter of the book, Zanzibar Revolution, the use of Kiswahili, and strategic marketing through social media platforms really contributed to his success. And the, the book was really well uh, marketed, Two weeks before its launch was already in social media. And a lot of people who commented on that, including uh, Zito Kabwe, and, uh, uh, who is a, an, uh, a famous pol opposition politician in Tanzania, and uh, Taji Liundi, who is a journalist in Tanzania. And they all talked about how the book was important. And another thing which was really important about how the book was uh, marketed and was the book launch. Uh, so the, the launch, which um, included high profile people from the government, and it was held in, on one of the expensive hotels in Dar es Salaam and Zanzibar. As you can see, the launch in Zanzibar was at Golden Tulip on the 6th of November. Uh, and Sada Mkuya, who is the, was the Minister of State in the first president's uh, office, was a guest of honor. You can see the picture on top. Uh, sorry, the picture down there, it was, it was during that launch. And even the brother of the former president of Zanzibar and the, of course, the son of the first president of Zanzibar, Ali Karume, was part of the book launch. In Dar es Salaam, it was uh, launched at uh, Juris Nyerere International Convention Center on the 15th of November with uh, Hon Para Magamba Kabudi, who was the Minister of Con uh, Constitution and Legal Affairs, was a guest of honor, and that was really interesting because you can see both the places were launched and the high-profile people who are part of it. But again, it was really interesting to note that not only women and high-profile women like uh, uh, Hon Balozi, Monaidi, Getruda, and others were part of it, but again, even other men and uh, ordinary people were invited, and it was uh, it, so that forum and how people were engaged with this book was really interesting. So therefore, uh, the editorial and marketing strategies that was used to publish this book was really important for the success of this publication. And so in this paper, I've highlighted how it was important to have this kind of network of people working from the mainland and from the uh, from Zanzibar bringing up this material, which involved not uh, include the history of not only Zanzibar, but also the mainland and how uh, we think, I, I think of this work not only as a work that documents or talks about the history of Zanzibar, but also important way of thinking about uh, the engagement of women in history of uh, uh, building of, up of Tanzanian uh, history. And so, yeah, thank you so much. So our final um, speaker in this session is another online presentation. Yes, fantastic. Yes, we see your screen. So um, 15 minutes, please. So Ahmed Kabacha. Okay, thank you very much. Niwaunge mkono wezangu wote walio toa shukurani kwa wandazi wa kongamano hili pia kutoa shukurani na pongezi nyingi kwa mwandishi Abdurazak Guna, mwalimu wetu, profesa wetu, kwa kututoa kimaso maso. Kwa makala yangu itazungumzia kidogo eh, kazi yake ki, kiasi na nimevutwa mno miongoni mwa watu ambao eh, tumevutwa baada ya kusikia eh, na kumfahamu. Nimekaa London muda mrefu lakini nilikuwa simjui Abdulazak Guna lakini baada ya ushindi nimeanza kumfahamu na sasa napata hamasa na wenzangu wengi nchini hapa Tanzania kumsoma na kujua kazi zake. E, makala yangu, uh, I'll be speaking in both languages, uh, sometimes Swahili, sometimes English. I call it sometimes intermarried, the agony of miscegenation in three Zanzibar novels. If you take this uh, phrase, sometimes intermarried, out of context and compare that with that picture, it will tell you something else. It will tell you something else, which also fits uh, the that uh, the two uh, the two uh, man, uh, man and woman there, as you see, are strolling it uh, Kiwengwa, and uh, it's the most recent picture, and it says a lot about my 
my, my topic. But my topic is about this issue here. Um, I have translated a literary uh, mixed race his book, Zanzibar is a country for Africans. Machotara Hizbu Zanzibar ni nchi ya wa Africa. Well, um, I will be talking a lot about this Machotara. And I tried to find out what is Hizbu. And uh, I came to realize that it has also been used by uh, politicians uh, and to mean the party, which was there before Uhuru or after Uhuru. And uh, it says a lot about what is happening. But my interest is actually Machotara. Okay, can you hear me? Hello? Um, my interest is the, is the um, is from uh, Abdul Razak Guna, and in this book, uh, page 66 up to page 67, there is this uh, saying, uh, we like to think of ourselves as a moderate and mild people, Arab, African, Indian, Comorian. We live alongside each other, quarreled and sometimes intermarried, civilized that what we were. And he also continued, in reality, we were nowhere near we, but in our separate lives, locked in our historical ghettos, self-forgiving and seething with intolerance, with racism and with resentment. And the politics brought all that into open. This is a summary of everything that I can say is about Guna's work. I argue here that if taking seriously uh, this uh, phrase, I mean this uh, this uh, phrase, especially um, the phrase that says sometimes intermarried, has a lot to be needs to be paraphrased. So instead of paraphrasing using Guna's work, um, I decided to choose two more works from Zanzibar. And the work um, that I'm going to choose is from Shafi Adam and Zainab uh, Baharun. And if you can, you'll see later on why I have chosen them. But from that particular passage, hmm. which actually um, uh, Guna has presented through a protagonist, uh, and named the protagonist. He, Samuel Meg Samuelson is a critic, a, a renowned critic, a literary critic, who says this passage actually epitomizes uh, that Zanzibar is a fragmented society. So in my own view, I see that Guna sees a rift on the basis of as them cleavage, but also hints about intermarriage or rather miscegenation. And according to Esther Pujoro, very recently, she, she defined miscegenation as the intimacy forged in mixed race relationship. But more important, miscegenation is a very complex issue because it lies at the intersection between private sphere, made selection, conjugal relations and family transmission. The word conjugal mixedness entails also equality and takes marital norms, inequality between partner and social disapproval into account. So it's not a, a, a simple miscegenation. Uh, it's a very complex issue that is involved in miscegenation. According to uh, uh, work by Esther Pujoro Nogua very recently, she has done something on miscegenation in Guna's decision, decision 2005. She simply said Guna has laid bare some theoretical, uh, has laid bare uh, uh, the act of miscegenation as a product of intimacy in the private sphere, which threatens to contaminate 
the presumed whiteness in post-colonial Zanzibar. As you can see in his book, Desertion by, by Guna, there is an Englishman, Martin Peace, and Chotara, and, uh, and Chotara of Asian African descent, Rihanna, who are shown to be in miscegenation courtship, but of course they end up in separation. I don't want to go further into using uh, Guna this session, uh, but I will be taking you to the following books. Um, Vutan Kuvute of 1999 and Mungwa Peshwi 2017. If you see, if you look, if you examine from 1996 to 2017, there's almost two decades uh, that have passed. And the two, 1996 and 1989, Shafi and, and, uh, and, uh, and Guna were born before, um, before 1964. Uh, revolution, but Al Al Zainab Alwi Baharun, she was born after 1964. So it is very, very interesting. But I need to paraphrase this uh, Mungu Hakopeshi by exploring more evidence from Baharun and Shafi. I will use AG for Abdul Razak Guna, SA for Shafi Adam, and ZB for Zainab Baharun. And of course, Vutan Kuvute. Uh, is a novel, but as well as a movie that has just won several film awards, best feature film in Zanzibar uh, this year. And Zainab Baharun also is a winner of Mabati uh, Literature, Kiswali Literature Award of 2018. Interesting, both three novelists, if you read their work, they try to blur the line between fiction and, uh, and history. Interestingly, all befit the category of post-colonial writers based on anhedonized categorization. Anhedonized categorize the post-colonial writer as those who actually often return to their own sites of trauma, which usually have to do with period of colonization, decolonization, and all post-independence. She further said, a personal writer feel the necessity of rewriting the past because the dominant version of history have left blanks, gaps, and misrepresentation. Miscegenation, miscegenation and trauma of being discriminated as unbelonging, alien in Guinea, or rather paper season, a late motive that characterize these three texts. And I propose that. Guna Shaf and Baharun can also be uh, looked within the lens of nativism and fragmentation. Nativism in the sense that, uh, according to John Hisham, uh, is an intense opposition to an internal minority on the ground of its foreign connection. But also nativism is about who belong to the political community, who has a right to rule, who has legitimacy to determine public discourse and who has a right to constitute, to constitute the African public sphere. So these two theories, or um, the theory of nativism within the post-colonialism, I think befit the, the discussion over that we are talking uh, about uh, the, the uh, to a certain Guna's remarks in, in his work. I divided the remarks of Guna into two major issues. Nowhere near we, and sometimes intermarried. In nowhere near we, I'm looking at Zanzibar as a contact zone, and also examining the issue of nativism and fragmentation in post-revolution Zanzibar. But in sometimes intermarried, I look at the issue of miscegenation and the fate of Katara in Zanzibar. Um, for a case of Zanzibar as a contact zone, if you examine uh, Shafi, you read in page 71, Nikatea Silia Nguja na nje ushihiri wa jemi ngazija. Hii naonyesha jinsi Nguja ilivo mkorogo wa mataifa. And also that is something about it. Kila inchi ina mchanga nyiko wa makabila tofauti. Wenye asili ya mataifa mengine. Na ufika kuchanga nyana odamu na kuwa kizazi pia. 
So here it shows dance by hybridities. Itself is the, uh, through the image of variety of breads and their origin. Of course, they are member of issues which actually show that Zanzibar, is, to, to borrow a barber word, is a hybrid, hybrid nation, hybridized nation. Zanzibar fits also the so called contact zone, uh, the concept coined by Mary Louise, that it's a space in which people, geographically and historically separated, come into contact with each other and establish ongoing relation. But nowhere near we, we look at the seclusion system as made visible by Shafi through market scenario. Alan Ricard also opined on East African urban setting of Uhindini, Uzunguni, and Uswahilini. Here, the neighborhoods are the picture of a divided world, but where consensus here, the fact of living together without necessarily liking one another has been part of the landscape for a long time. There are issue of purebred Arabs, Indians, Africans' bloodline in the work of uh, the, uh, Shaping and the bathroom. Said in the Muyake Halali, how to chafuli wana keep wala mtu. We are talking of the issue of contamination here, blood contamination. Bilulu Hana Damu Yaki Arabu, Hata Kidogo, Nimu Africa Hadisi. Bi Mwanawe to Manamke of his Anzibari, Mrefu Mwembamba, Mwenyerangi, and Magia Kuli. And also we see uh, as them leverage. Uh, Rotary in the two words of uh, Shafi and Baharun. Tokia Mapinduzi, to make what makes them of what it's a chuki, Siku Sote Sisi, Siwema, wow. And Sale and Hafiz in the wake of Baharun, where we marabu, mimim Swahili. But also Africans are lamenting that Siku Sote Sisi ni watumwa when you pay one machoyao, na wao ndio watawala. And in, Sa and in Shafi, we also see Nyumba ya Mathneshiri, Ukapeleke Posa ya Golo. So here we see a, he has them leverage clearly depicted in these two words. It also continues when Yewe was Swahili, when Twitter Sisi, Warabu ni Wageni, na wanataka Turudi Kwetu. Hapa tunapopaita Nyumbani, Hawa Tutaki, Tunambiwa Turudi Kwetu. So these issues can be pegged on homelessness and dislocation issues, which have been uh, uh, discussed in much, much, much in post-colonial work. But tunabahazi ya viongozi kwa midomo yao mipana, wana kukataa kabisa na kutaka turudi kwetu. Guna has just said something, and the politics brought all that into the open. This is what Guna has said in that phrase. And here we see uh, Baharun uh, showing us kuna baadhi ya viongozi kwa midomo yao mipana wana kukataa kabisa na kutaka turudi kwetu. So contesting Zanzibariness, we see the issue of a crisis of who is a Zanzibarian. Mwana wetu walikuwa ni mwana mtu wa kizanzibari, mrefu mwembamba, mwenye maji ya kule. Zamani ni liyamini kuwa mimi ni mwana nchi halali wa nchi hii, Mimi ni mtanzania, tena mzanzibari. Baki mpaka sasa wapemba, wameambi warudi kwao, sasa maana ya mzanzibari, sijui nini. At the same time, we see Yasmin, wewe wetu, she's a welcomed and also being accepted as a Zanzibarian. So to look Zanzibarian is to look Africa. According to Karim Hitler, he described the issues of Zanzibar. And she say, he says that, after 1964 revolution, the post-revolution government of SP has turned the colonial era racial equation upside down. Now, the darker your skin, the more authentic a Zanzibar you are, those with a lighter skin tone are treated with suspicion. So here we feel, I feel that nativism is still, this is still the theory that can help us to understand these issues. Now, if I'm gaining mana in our passport, na siwa kuzaliwa lakini kuna watu hapa tokea wazazi wao wamezaliwa hapa lakini bado wanaitwa wageni 
Sasa raia wa kweli ni nani na ana sifa gani? Wageni but also natives are saying wageni wanamiliki vitu chungu tele ambapo wananchi wenyewe hatuna. The issue of who is native in Zanzibar is very controversial. And we look at the in sometime intermarriage the issue of miscegenation. And I examine this in within the COVID and COVID miscegenation and the issue of Chokara as a byproduct of miscegenation. Overt miscegenation is sown in Gulam and Amemua Mkio Kiswahili, Amezanae Watoto, Amemua Kwasiri. Yasmin Nae Anataka Kwa Kiswahili, Overtly. Uh, Saidi and Arab Amemua Shombe, Mwarabu wa Kisomalia, Kwasiri. Wana Ahmed na Arab, and Arab haku tegemea kama angeliza na Mwafrika. And we look at the work of a social anthropologist, Mesaki and Bapamia, in, in 2015, and when they say that some Indians have concubines, though when they take them for wives, marriage is kept secret and children born of this union are excluded from inheritance. So here, we also look at community easily adapted to interracial contact between Indian man and African, but not vice versa. Women consider as purity, because this is one you read a number of works on uh, purity, the issue of purity in as far as miscegenation is concerned. But the condition of Totara, Chombe, or racial hybrid, Rehana remembers his child being called Totara, which means bastard. They call this from uh, Buna. But Rehana is a hybrid of Indian father and African mother. So Kutua, in, in also in, uh, in Shafi, is a Totara wa Mswahili na Mshihiri. Shihabi alikuwa Totara wa Mwarabu na Mwafrika. Mimi Ahmed bin Said in Kamuzeshi Mtotoangu Shonde. So these are issues of disparity between the, the races. Saidi Kalagayuwa na Manamke Chotara waki Africa. So public sees Ahmed, the son of, uh, of, of, of Arab, African Arab, as Kijana waki Arabu, lakini anonekana michanganya dam. So the society of Zanzibar is seeing itself within these lenses of, of who is uh, the, fe uh, the facial, and also the, 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 the contamination of class and racial barrier. VP Niyote kuchanganya damu na kuhu kubwa kama hii. So these actually uh, is a issues that is happening of self-identity of the Chotara themselves, but also how the others view them. And the racial category is also is uh, shown by phenotype markers. And this is, uh, they look at non-purebred and purebred. And um, for non purebred, we, we, we read it as uh, at a shafi, but Bahir and Asian African hybrid, Surayaki and Mshabana Babayaki, but Pua, Macho, Mdomo, Denge, Denge, Mtupu. Nyele tu, hapo wa mekwenda windini, singa nyororo. Then Pua again is coming out. Farhat, a Somali Arab hybrid, and Usom Viringo, Macho Makubwa, Pua Nyembamba Fupi, na Midomo Minene. And Bwana Ahmed, he is a purebred, and a poor nephew, Mwenya Silia Kiarabu. Bi Khadija, wife of Ahmed, was a purebred Arab. Pua yake lismama kama upanga. So African race markers such as full lips, broad noses, and kink braided hair can be used to discriminate Totara. Sorry, uh, Prof Kipacha, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can I ask yes. you to wrap up? Um, we're sort of running a bit over time. I don't know if okay, thank you. you can move towards the conclusions. Yes, quite swiftly. yes, the conclusions. This My is the conclusion last slide. is, yes. Uh, Recap is the Indian Arab Chotara African intimacy hardly dominate the theme of Zanzibar Swahili literature, but the matter appears only in passing, drawing few critics and writers. However, as I said, some Zanzibari novelists at homeland and in diaspora, men of mixed breed or Chotara themselves dare to transverse this intricate subject of racial intimacy during anti-colonial struggle and post revolution era in their writing. But it is also by allowing interracial intimacy of friendship is to accept sharing of space and resources. Therefore, I said, Unguja Njema Atakai Aje, all is well in Zanzibar. Anyone is welcome. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, and
Uh, yes, so just so we don't lose out on the chance for um, discussion on these fantastic talks, maybe I can ask the two speakers who are in the room, so Jay and Zamda, to come back down to the panel at the front and we'll get our online panellists um, back. So a reminder, we've covered topics from poetry, novels, translation, the ocean, economy, um, feminism, publishing, um, and obviously our most recent talk here as well. So do we have questions in the room? We'll take a few in the interest of time. So yeah, just while Zamda's joining us as well. Could we ask Armit to stop sharing? Um, and uh, yeah, Prof Kipacha, can you stop sharing your screen, please? I think you can okay. actually take it over. Okay, so fantastic. So I saw uh, one hand there. Let me start there and over there. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the question of you, uh, Jay. You made a uh, passing reference to a Swahili having, I think, a pugilistic conversational style. I'd just like to hear you expand on that and perhaps some of the challenges that might present to that language. We'll just, just take a few questions in the interest of time before you respond to that one, okay. and then maybe some of them relate. So there was a hand over here, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, in uh, East African uh, East African literature, there's mention of, somebody's always mentioned the aspect of scene, and also the last uh, speaker talked about the, the complex interracial relationship between different groups mm, in East Africa. Does this show that the trend that there is a sort of a struggle between the postmodern and modern aspects in it? Fantastic. And there was a hand at the back as well. Just yes, we'll take another one. Uh, I would like, this is uh, for Zamba. I would like just to expand a little on the context of publishing, the environment of publishing within within Zanzibar, within which a feminist position or a feminist um, initiative is being or has been forged or is attempting to be forged. Fantastic. So maybe we can take those questions. I think they're particularly aimed at our panelists who are here in the room. And do remember we've got our panelists online as well if people have other questions. So yeah, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I'll just return to that uh, the phrasing. I said it. It may be the case Garnet Fields is being hectored after that slightly more pugilistic conversational style of Swahili. Um, and I suppose another way that I might uh, translate that idea would, would, would say like would be to say the slightly more animated style. Um, you know, pugilism, as I understand it, comes from boxing, and I don't mean anything uh, aggressive or violent. I mean expressive, animated. Even if um, if one is to watch the the video of that interview that's conducted with Swahili, um, compare it to other interviews that, that Garnett has given since since his uh, Nobel Prize. I mean, it, it is more animated. There's more hand gestures. There's more facial expressions. Um, and I'm also I'm not using that term in a um, I guess in an anthropological way, it's so much it's based on my own experience of being in uh, Swahili speaking spaces and how people interact um, in a way that feels more animated and, and warmer to me. So it's actually, I could say it's the, just as I said, pugilistic, I could say it's, you know, the opposite in some senses of the word, um, but the thing connecting them would be the animation. Uh, but yeah, I didn't mean to suggest any sort of uh, violence in conversational style. Fantastic. Um do either of you have a response to the second question? I want to comment on that because the other, the third one was specifically aimed at Zamda, so maybe you want to comment on the, the, the publishing question? Should I? Mind? Yes, yes. And either, yes. Hello, yeah. So, um, responding to uh, the question, of course, to the second question a little bit, uh, Zuhra is also talking about uh, interracial relationship when talking about uh, Bill Boys and her personal life. She was married to different people. She's a, she was an Arabian woman, but never married to an Arabian person. Of, of course, she was born in Zanzibar, but her parents were Arabian. And she, of course, because she married an African man, she was chased away from her home and then later, she uh her, she she wanted to marry uh a british man and the parents could accept that and she, uh the man ended up uh, uh killing himself and then later on uh she married another uh man 
who was a thing when she came to to the UK. And so you can see that uh, though she was Zanzibarian, she decided to really act different when it comes uh, to that. And that really caused her a lot of problems because people are like, she's really doing it differently. Yeah, they would accept that, they would expect that she was an Arabian woman. And so she would be married to someone of her own origin and not like what she did. But of course that is really, uh, uh, a question about yeah we talk about uh interracial relationship and that was really strongly addressed in this book as well yeah so now to the to the question about the context of publishing feminist publishing in tanzania i think that's uh somehow linking to what um uh, the bugoya was saying today earlier yeah so when we talk about uh publishing uh feminist publishing is still developing and uh uh, because publishing in itself is still developing in Tanzania, especially after 2014, when the government took over the role of publishing textbook, which was uh, really uh, the sustainable way of them making profit and being able to produce other books. So when we talk about feminist publishing, we don't have uh, companies that would say they're purely feminist publishers, but I'm talking about women who are involved in publishing and uh, having the feminist outlook on what they published, making sure that the gender aspect is being addressed as well, talking or raising uh, females' voices, something that has really been uh, left uh, uh, in most cases, uh, something that um, has not been really uh, been taken into account. Because when we talk about uh, producing general books, talking about these kind of books like biography of Biu was... Uh, um, or Zahor is something that we don't do a lot of time because of course we are talking about publishing in general books with a limited market. So END is a publishing house that has survived for a long time and that position it as a, 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 a very uh, committed uh, women's owned publishing with a aim of supporting uh, women's voices is really interesting, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. We have one more question. I don't want to start. I can smell the food. So I don't understand between people and lunch. It's tantalizing. But we've had fantastic presentations here. So we want to make sure. Remember, we also have um, Ahmed, Francisca and Clarissa online if anyone has a question. So one question there. Do we have one other hand? Very quick question. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. So my question is in, in, in response to something Francisca said. So the you, you cited um, the sort of reimagining the Indian Ocean book, Francesca, and I I, I wasn't sure whether it was cited with approval, but there was one comment or one quotation you had saying that we need to um, uh, we need to privilege uh, ethnographic or modern day uh, sources over historical ones or archival ones. And I, I mean, I can see the argument for you know extending our sources when we're studying the Indian Ocean. I can see the argument for extending sources beyond historical ones or archival ones. But I wonder why we should privilege ethnographic sources over historical ones. Uh, would you like me to repeat that question for those online? So I think in summary, there was a reference to the Indian Ocean work and the idea of privileging present day ethnographic work over historical sources. So the question is, do you need to privilege present day modern work or perhaps take both and all together and, and aim specifically at Francisca? Well, it, it was aimed at a quote. It was aimed, at a quote. That, aimed at a quote in your presentation. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm not aware of um, the quote saying privileging, I will have to go back and have a look again. But I think the argument that um, Srinivas and her colleagues are making, because this is the, the theoretical argument I'm drawing on, it's not my idea, it's just me bringing that in com into conversation with Hamid's paintings, is really grounded in what they say is a necessity to think with exactly, Hannah, as you were saying, with historical sources and with other archives, but also to arrive more in the present moment and that being done, for example, most um, effectively in the way that Clarissa showed us by working ethnographically, working on the ground with people um, outside of, yeah, of archives only, but of course, together with them and against the backdrop of that. Wonderful, thank you very much. So I think we will stop there. Can we thank all of our presenters uh, again? Hello. Hello. I hope you can all hear me. Karibuni tena. Nazani me shiba na chakula. 
lakini hamjashiba au hamjatosheka na mawai the mazuri so i'm the chair of this session i'm martin you'll see me again later um and i'd like to without further ado i'll just welcome our presenters we've got four talks as you can see in the program we're moving now into mambialuga uh, some culture as well we've got something about myth um some talks which um you know look really appetizing so please welcome uh, Anna and, and colleagues asante so i think our presentation will have to pass the difficult test of engaging you enough so you don't fall into post food coma so <laughs> Hopefully we can do that because it's interesting. So my name is Teresa Poeta and together with my colleague, Dr. Julie Stagi, we are presenting on behalf of a larger group, as you can see from all these names. Uh, and actually uh, everybody's here, although Frida is joining us online, but Hannah Gibson, Luz Martin, Tom Jelke are here in the audience. Mm -hmm. And um, we are part of a, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> we are part of a larger group um, working on a project on Swahili dialects and variation. And if, is this moving? Then can I, just so I can move the slides? Sure. Can maybe can yeah, okay. Um, and if you attended the Barraza last year online, then you heard us uh, presenting the project and we basically want to uh, pick up where we left off last year and tell you what, what has happened since and what we have found out. Uh, so as we explained, maybe some of you were not there last year, um, we are sort of looking at present-day morphotactic variation in Swahili. We are focusing on how it links with multilingualism and language contact, uh, as well as how it links with a sort of uh, how speakers navigate um, sort of constructing their identities and what the language variation means to that. So this is all happening sort of uh, often um, the work that has already been done, uh, because we know that there's variation in Swahili, but uh, sort of mostly phonology and morphology have been explored a bit more, although this is now changing, uh, also thanks to other people in the room. Um, so today we will say a little bit about um, what, what is known about colloquial and mainland Swahili, uh, tell you a little bit about languages of Iringa, because we are really bringing to you data, some like preliminary initial data that we've collected in Iringa. And uh, we'll hopefully excite you with some morphosyntactic variation <laughs> that we found in Iringa, uh, specifically suffix aga, evaluative morphology, and suffix echo and co. Don't worry if you don't know what these things are, we'll talk you through this. And also some initial notes on uh, things to do with how speakers perceive this variation and sort of their attitude to their language use, and then conclude. Um, so, we are already sort of um, aware of, as I said, of some variation in Swahili, um, but because it mostly focuses on coastal varieties, and when we speak about Swahili dialects, that's what often people think of, um, we really wanted to expand that beyond this and look also at other areas, other places, uh, and especially multilingual contexts where Swahili is spoken. So this is sometimes discussed at colloquial Swahili or mainland Swahili in other work. Uh, but the attention sort of that has been given to this hasn't been sort of extensive so far, especially in morphosyntax, and this is what we want to look at today. Um, so what we have done is sort of, we will come back to some examples that we showed last year of variation that we already know is there, and then see how that played out in Iringa and see that there is sort of even more to it than we thought. Um, so maybe I'll... Julius, do you want to say something about languages? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, here you can see uh, some data on the languages that are being spoken in Iringa. That is our focus area today. And as you can see, we have Swahili, which is a dominant language actually in Tanzania and the national language. And we are trying also to compare it with some number of speakers. I mean, in Iringa Mjini, uh, that is a uh, Iringa town against uh, Iringa as the region. And this data was is based on the uh, language atlas of Tanzania that was uh, published in 2009. 
so the, it may raise some questions as regarded to what, how how is how this this number was arrived at. It was based on the question about uh, the first language of the speakers. So the speakers were asked about what is the first language that you speak or the, the, the language that you acquired first. So Swahili has that number, uh, 53,000, and then uh, in Iringa Mjini, but Iringa as a region, uh, the, the number is 55. It's followed by Hehe and Bena and Kinga, as well as Chaga. The Chaga are all over the uh, all over the country, so people will be shocked that the Iringa is typically a Hehe community, but we also have the Chaga. There are a significant number of the Chagas and the other uh, uh, languages. Asante. So now to some of the examples of variation. Um, so we started off with this, what you see on the slide, and this is what we um, presented also last year, that we know there's the suffix ag or aga uh, has been talked about already a little bit. People are quite aware of it because it's very widely used and is mostly connected to habitual meaning. So um, maybe the comparison with sort of the coastal way of expressing uh, habitual uh, meaning, which is with the hu, hula, uh, you can have something like una kulaga wapi. So we knew this, that this is sort of happening. It's also um, linked to the fact that in Proto-Bantu, the suffix uh, existed and that also other Bantu languages have it and it mm. plays different roles in different languages. Um, so we wanted to sort of dig a bit deeper and see how this aga play, plays out. And now we want to share with you what we find in Iringa. So the habitual meaning that we were aware of, we did indeed find it. Um, so these are two examples. Um, sort of the first one, very clear, sort of someone is harvesting and someone else is commenting. Normally you do this uh, much earlier. No, sorry, in the evening, today are, you are doing it much earlier. So the habitual una chumaga, and here is our aga. Um, and the second one, this was a conversation about uh, the production of uh, alcohol in Itamba, in Iringa. Uh, and here the speaker is sort of commenting on uh, um, some people sort of not dealing with alcohol. We weren't sure whether it's about consuming or selling, but that's up to interpretation. So you see in Hamshugulikagi, uh, that's our aga suffix there. So also they sort of don't normally usually uh, deal with mm -hmm. alcohol. And this also, I guess it's um, good to point out that the negative form is actually really, really common. We found a lot of examples of aga with a negative form and sort of we want to explore the fact that with the prefix hu, the coastal hula, usually eat, doesn't really have a corresponding mm -hmm. negative form strictly for the habitual, while the aga does. So mm -hmm. we want to explore where there's something in there that that's why it's used maybe. So just to point out the negative there. But apart from the habitual meaning, we actually found much more and much wider use of aga. And one that kept coming up again and again was the use of aga with the subjunctive. So you see the first example, to endage, to endage, bajaji drivers sort of trying to get more passengers onto the bajaji before they leave, let's go, let's go. And you see the aga there. So this is really doesn't quite struck as habitual meaning. And this was very common. So you have other two examples. Should I start speaking? Let me go to mine, all with aga. And I just kept hearing it all around. So really quite common. And this is where we start sort of going into the neighboring languages, other languages that we find in the area. So here we have uh, an uh, example of what aga does both in Kihehe and in Bena. And especially maybe to sort of save a bit of time, I'll point you to the Bena example straight away. This let's start to sleep to Gonage. So you can see the Aga there. And what Morrison says is that when Aga is added, uh, the effect is this inceptive, let's, let's start. So the examples that we have seen, I've really sort of seen that the huge similarity. So we can already start thinking about the Bena effect on, on uh, Swahili. So this is really nice and we'll continue investigating this. Um, but it wasn't sort of as simple, even not that that's simple, but as simple as that because Aga just kept coming up also in other examples uh, where it didn't seem not the subjunctive and the habitual, I, I glossed, we glossed as habitual just because that's what we know of it now, but it doesn't quite seem to be that meaning. Mm. Um, so especially the first one, Nita Kulipaga, 
uh, I will pay you uh, when asked speaker said that this implies some sort of I, I will pay you eventually I'm not sure when but I will eventually pay you uh, so that's quite interesting but then sort of the second example very in contrast to this uh, someone saying you haven't paid him yet and replies nilim <clears throat> paga I certainly did pay him. So that's quite the opposite, but still we have our aga there. So some sort of like imperfect thing maybe going on at the beginning or could even be linked to the inceptive or sort of like, I'll start paying you. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is sort of the exciting things that we want to really explore more because they don't, they go a bit beyond what we thought we would find. Um, so I'll move to the next example. So you can have a variety of things mm -hmm. and we can come back to this in questions if needed. Another area that we talked about last year that we were gonna explore was what we call evaluative morphology. So mostly um, this, we mean diminutive and augmentative. So how do you express that something is small or something is big? We started off with this um, prefixes ka, um, ka and tu, which are um, a way to express diminutive where in Proto-Bantu are present in other Bantu languages. And in Swahili, we would maybe typically think of using class seven and eight as a diminutive, so like kimti um, uh, for a small tree. Um, but this sort of comes up again. It was quite interesting in some of the talks that we have given, people were surprised we even think of this as variation just because it's so widely used that sort of like, where is the variation there? <laughs> but um, uh, but class 12 and 13 is maybe not traditionally thought to be there in Swahili. So that's interesting. So now let's see what we found in um, Iringa. So I'm not going to talk extensively about sort of the morphological patterns here, but we did find both mm -hmm. class 7, 8 and both class 12, 13, uh, quite a lot, uh, widespread in singular and plural with, um, yeah, with different nouns. And I would maybe only highlight this example sort of here in the middle, Nimetingua uh, Tingua Navikazi Viangu, because this is something that I overheard and I asked about, I really liked it. I have never heard that expression. It became a favorite sentence of mine. So sort of to be very, very busy. And um, while sort of discussing this, we realized that maybe in terms of the prefix use, um, it's not unexpected. That is the class eight that we would expect, so little jobs. But the fact that it's used so widely, the diminutive, turned out to be quite, or perceived as being quite specific to Iringa. So that using that expression, when I then used it sort of jokingly, people laughed and sort of were like, oh, you're sort of, you know, some local expressions now. And I was wondering what about it made it sound sort of local. And then discussing with colleagues, it, it turns out that using the Vikazi was thought to be sort of uh, quite Iringa specific. So we want to look a little bit more into that. Um, and then some differences in the semantics um, I haven't talked much about it um, uh, before, but we know that it can have some sort of negative connotation sometimes. Also, some speakers had a different perception of using ka meant something is smaller than if you use ki. So kimuiba, like a little thorn, ki was used when it was like negative because it hurt the speaker. But if they wanted to say that there were small thorns on a plant, they would use ka muiba. So some interesting differences. Um, and I'm going to uh, get into augmentatives now because that was quite exciting looking at that. Um, so traditionally, maybe in Swahili, we think of saying that something is big by using class five and six. So li and ma or ji and ma. So that indeed came up, although also two different suffixes were both used. Um, the first example comes from discussing how to cook chapati on a big sort of uh, that plate. Um, we also have this mention of class four. So a driver talking about being used to driving big cars rather than small cars. Um, so we don't have much to say about that, just that we want to look more into that, what is happening there. But then quite, well, we thought it was exciting. Uh, people kept uh, really, really often when asked, how would you say something is big in Ringa using gu. So a big house, gu nyumba gu kubwa. And this with many different nouns. Um, so we thought that was very exciting because uh, as a student of sort of standard Swahili at university, I'd never come across that. Um, and here again, we can show you a little bit about the connection to surrounding languages. 
So in Bena, in fact, the GU prefix is class 20 and is specifically there for augmentatives. So there are no noun classes that uh, belong there, but it's used for augmentation. So uh, that's quite, quite a nice link. Okay, maybe Julius, you wanna say, I think we have to wrap up, but we'll uh, very yeah, brief. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one also, we, we saw it, um, the echo and the co, which in many other languages in the country would be used to indicate some locative uh, sense uh, or locative reading. Um, but here we could tell precisely that they indicate locative. They they may they seem to mean something else. So like hua na hua na leko or sileko to mean I usually eat or I don't eat. And in a pikeko, or I usually cook uh, food. So sometimes they uh, seem like uh, indicating habitual or something else, but we still uh, we are still looking uh, into it to see whether we will arrive at a precise conclusion. So we'll leave you with the last example of variation that came up and that links quite nicely to some of the other talks coming up. And this is some young university students giving me examples of something that they perceived as being a way that young people in Ringa spoke. And that's using the plural when they mean the singular. So instead of saying, my phone is out of, if it's not charged, our phones are not charged. But really what they meant is my phone is not charged. So we definitely want to look more into that. That was very intriguing. Um, and to sort of finish off, just because we also, part of our research is looking at how this, this is perceived by speakers and uh, what they think about the variation language use. So just this sense that the speaker's first language was what mostly influenced variation. This is what we got in conversations a lot. And even though nobody would really say this is Iringa Swahili, things like Tuendage or that uh, Vikazi Vyangu, when I did then ask about those, and they said, oh yeah, yeah, this is very from here, from Iringa. So not tied to speakers of a language, but to the place so that was quite interesting. Um, and these are just a couple of quotes about um, sort of people's perception on how the language use is changing. Um, so this is sort of older generation talking about in town, people switching to Swahili and people sort of a perception of a big difference between urban and more rural places and how this changing over generation. So we also want to uh, sort of continue investigating this. Um, yeah, so hopefully we can, we have excited you with this and you're not falling asleep uh, after the biryani, but sort of, uh, we just wanted to share that if what came up from Iringa is that there's definitely scope to research this much more, that there's more to the variation even than we thought, and that the highlighting sort of the link to multilingualism, language contact, and also the social linguistic part is important to give us a fuller picture of this. Uh, asante misana. <laughs> Maybe I'll let you do it so I don't mess it up, but this can now be closed. Yeah, next to Meshimiwa Ben. <laughs> now, when Zach. Ah, uh, yeah, another one. Um, uh, let's see, where is it? Habari um, Amchana. My name is Ben. Um, I've just finished my um, MA in African Studies here at SOAS, and I'm joined by Dr. Nico here um, from Mainz. And online, we're joined by Wilfred. Wilfred, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Great. Hear you, we can't see you yet. So maybe because Wilfried will start actually. Hi, everyone. And Garibuni <laughs> Tena. Um, so if we can maybe see him in the video, that would be perfect because he will start with the first part of the presentation. Um, we'll try to be brief. And um, it's a perfect uh, overlap or connection to the previous talk, actually. So thanks a lot. It's as if we had all sat down and prepared the, the slides and talks together for this panel, but um, maybe it's just a coincidence. Oh yeah, perfect. Wilfried is there. All right. Wilfred Caribou. 
Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Wilfred Zekebwang, expert translator and interpreter. So we're another high court in the DRC, uh, where I work as a linguist in um, several international projects. And I'm honored to be part of this conference, highlighting Swahili <laughs> in different areas, along with my colleagues. Uh, to be brief, I will start and say that Lubumbashi, known as Elizabeth, is the third largest city of the DRC after Kinshasa, the capital, and Kisangani. The dialect Kiswahili is one of the national languages spoken hard on the east side of the DRC and Lubumbashi in the southeast. The city has an heritage Kiswahili uh, in its unique form. As we all know, Kiswahili comes from Swahili, which means the coast, and uh, Kiswahili means the language of the coast. So there is a large difference between Kiswahili of Lubumbashi and the East Coast Swahili. As an expert translator, I can notice the difference in the pronunciation, sentences, culture, and behavior while working in this language. Um, while translating some NGOs document related to Kiswahili because it's the most document come from NGOs, um, it, I tend to interact with people and you will always learn a lot and discover new words while writing Kiswahili of the Bumbashi doesn't bring a big difference to the East Coast Swahili. Speaking can be confusing because the city has developed its own Swahili expressions, which are linked to a mixture of whole colonial French, English, and Arabic words. Uh, a study of Kiswahili and Lebombashi will demand a lot of resources that will allow you to reach deep on people's mind and understand their perspective of life while discovering the reasons of creating their own Kiswahili words and developing slangs uh, in rural areas, which makes the beauty of the language and its uniqueness uh, in Lebombashi. I will give a few examples to be quick. Um, uh, if you like those example will highlight the East Coast Swahili and the difference to the Swahili Swahili of the Bombashi. Uh, I will start with just the example in East Coast Swahili, we say Leo Miniliamka Vizuri. In the Bombashi, we will say Leo Minalamuka Bien. So there is those difference, and you will see those old colonial words like the bien is the French word that comes to the Swahili. And it's it's like a mixture we use here. And I will go to the second example. Unaka wapi, we say in the East Coast Swahili. In the Bombashi, we will say unaikala wapi. So there is always this different expressions um, that comes along um, to the difference. And then according to the old colonial French and English speaking words working around here and practicing the language to the mixture of the Swahili. This, there is also the third example, uh, which means to simple, if ukifike nyumba unite, this is very, very small words that we use in the Bumbashi. So those are the few examples and a brief summary that I can give you from the Bumbashi so you have an idea on what to expect on my area. Thank you, Asante. I will give the, my power to the, my colleagues. Thank you so much, Wilfried, especially for this perspective as a, as a translator based in Lubumbashi, working on the different Swahilis and on uh, ECS or coastal Swahili and also the Swahili from Lubumbashi. And the, the problems we come across when we work um, on these varieties, especially in the on the Western periphery, so in the Congo, so from the Ituri forest in the north to uh, the Katanga of Omakatanga province in the south are not all, always work related as for Wilfried, for example, to choose from different Swahilis and also to be confronted with different perceptions and attitudes towards Swahili, but also, for example, when you work on the grammar, which at first uh, seems to be something that is uh, beyond specific judgments and maybe based on morphosyntactic rules and forms and regulations and so on. Um, but uh, we have been working on different Congo Swahili varieties um, over practically the past 10 years. Um, and we came across uh, several of these problems, especially, especially of folk linguistic judgments around Swahili, for example, as a colonial language, first of the so-called Arab Zanzibaris, as they were called in the lit literature very often, who came to the Congo from the 1850s onwards, for example. 
for uh, slaves, for ivory, and so on. Then later as the language, also as a colonial language of the so-called explorers from Europe, for example, who brought Swahili along, who spoke Swahili very often, and also recruited the same Zanzibaris to get back into the hinterland and the interior of the continent. And then uh, um, uh, in, in more recent years in the Congo, the overthrow of um, uh, um, dictator Mobutu through Kabila, for example, which was also a Swahili-speaking regime for more than 19 years practically. So perceptions around Swahili are very much uh, um, embedded in specific uh, historical facts and sp historical mm -hmm. developments, but also in uh, the grammars and resources that are available very often. And when um, you look at and when we have studied the, the, the grammatical means and, and functions of uh, the different Swahili varieties, it becomes evident and obvious that specific lexical but also morphosyntactic differences are quite striking. If you look, for example, as the most, at the most recent description by Aurelia Ferrari and two colleagues from Lubumbashi, the noun class prefixes, for example, Muntu Bantu, instead Mutu Batu further north in the Congo, Muchi Michi, the tree, the trees, um, uh, or Muti Miti further north. Uh, versus Lichu as the I. So you see the different non-class prefixes. Um, also different systems of agreement, for example, animacy based in Lubumbashi. So also animals would fall into an insects and so on would fall into class one and two very often. And the, 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 the altogether package of these things have often triggered linguists to call the Swahili from Lubumbashi uh, Creole language, as Walter Shishu has sometimes called it in his works, or for example, a contact language or a pidgin or something worse. And very often we come across these labels as potopot Swahili, for example, in the old colonial literature, so they're, they're somehow muddy Swahili or something, or uh, also the uh, for the Swahili further north in the, spoken in Ituri, the Mipanajua Swahili or the Mipanapana Swahili or something like that. The, the, me not Swahili or I don't know Swahili or something based on the structure. So hmm. specific colonial historical facts were projected onto uh, language structure very often. A language structure was explained and also lexical, the lexicon through specific, often very folk linguistic judgments and perceptions and ideologies and often also linguist, linguists ideologies. So um, these, uh, um, so we ask ourselves, what do we miss out on when we study Swahili from Lubumbashi grammatically in this context of existing studies already, looking, for example, at the morphology and syntax of the language and practically uh, um, uh, reproducing some of the perceptions that we may not know sometimes as linguists, but are very evident. And as speakers like, for example, Wilfried working on this variety uh, 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 is something that he or others face very often. Next. So, and in many ways, we know that these debates of pigeonization, creolizations in the study uh, of Bantu languages, or to call them pigeons and creoles, is highly problematic. So, uh, um, for tendencies in the study of Lumbashi Polome, as an influential Swahili scholar, has started in the late 60s and has somehow also well, started to, to lay a ground for these descriptions as and, and designations as a pidgin or creole in the Congos for different varieties. The contact processes are more complex, though. So if you look at, for example, the negation, in it's one example that we can give you here, negation in the Swahili from Lubumbashi, uh, you can have something like uh, um, Mishiyua or Mishi, Mishiyue. Uh, for I don't know. So the secondary negation, she, uh, comes after the, the, the subject prefix, me, which is not less complex than uh, a prefixed, uh, a, a negative prefix as uh, sijui, for example. In some ways, it's even more complex, maybe, because very often this verb can be followed by something like apana or ata. So if you say something like uh, mishiyua apana, to put emphasis on it, very often linguists have then said, well, the apana, uh, which is invariable, not changed, this is something very pidgin-like. This is something where negation is not very complex. Altogether, this is a structure, for example, that uh, can be seen as a replication from Luba, from Kiluba or Chiluba, where uh, uh, not a double negation, but a negation that consists out of two elements is, for example, very frequent, and so on. So we could go on. So. Um, the, the, these processes to, to, to uh, and also from a linguistic view to reproduce a perception and also judgment of those as pigeon creoles is highly problematic. And we ask ourselves here, and then I hand over to Ben, uh, who has worked on attitudes, what is the Kiswahili, Kiamudubumbashi, or the Shaba Swahili, Katanga Swahili, the Potopot Swahili, a language of very many names based on the perceptions and ideologies of the person working on them? And why is it important also to change both to a more fine-grained focus on contact processes, 
beyond this simplification argument, and Mufuen and others have worked on that and also deconstructed somehow this idea, but also the change uh, with a focus on our own perspectives when we work in Lubumbashi, as the two of us have done this summer, just with a few days of, of, of difference actually mm -hmm. there, uh, a few days apart, and more ethnographic data when us as linguists work on these varieties is important, and self-reflexivity in the field or in the so-called field as well, in our own language ideologies, and I hand over to Ben. Thanks. Um, so my sort of contribution to our uh, tripartite uh, presentation, I guess, is the study that I did in Lumbashi this past summer in July, um, which focused on language attitudes. So sort of giving life to um, the story that people create about language um, and how they use it kind of every day. Um, and I wanted to do this because I was learning that language attitudes in sub-Saharan Africa, especially in the DRC, um, have been very neglected as a sort of um, academic subject. Um, and I found this neat quote um, when, I was, when I was researching from the late Dr. William Samarin. He says, languages do not acquire social meaning and therefore do not have attitudes linked with them until as far as we know, they began to be written down. Um, and the Kiswahili that's in Lubumbashi has been an extremely fluid language that is changing um, every generation, essentially. Um, and this is what people were telling me when I spoke to them in Lubumbashi. Um, so when I was there, I did a 16 sort of semi-structured interviews um, with predominant, predominantly young people about um, their language attitudes and their use. Um, and so the sort of, because it was a, a, an exploratory study, um, the, the findings are, you know, sort of preliminary. Um, but as Nico was saying, one of the, the common um, labels that people call Swahili and Lubabashi is Swahili facil, or simple, simplified Swahili. Um, mm. And so using the... Um, the framework of acrolectic and basilectic languages, um, Kiswahili and Lubabashi would be considered the basilectic language um, to its parents of East Coast Swahili, um, but then also to French. And French became also a dominant um, part of the conversations that I was having. Um, and similar to other African colonial lingua francas like Portuguese and English, um, French continues to reign as the language to achieve higher education and then respectively paid employment, of course, too. Um, and then through the framework of um, prestige in languages, um, we can see that French, um, and as the second last point there is, is English becoming desirable language, French and English um, have this overt prestige in um, the ability to create social mobility for people. Um, and then, of course, the, the key Swahili that's found um, has a bit of a, a covert prestige in that no one could contest that they use it every day. And it's very important for um, everyday tasks of, you know, going to the market and you know, speaking with your friends or your family. <clears throat> um, but people tended to rate French as sort of a more um, prestigious and important language. And then there's a little bit about English and um, about half the people I spoke to um, expressed a, a large interest in learning um, English, but there are some financial barriers and just infrastructure barriers uh, to mm -hmm. doing that. Um, so I approached it with just interviews and as a sort of an exploratory study, um, I think it would be really important to have sort of um, a hardline survey to sort of accompany that um, that approach for a future study in the area. So um, to conclude, from Wilfred's perspective as um, an expert interpreter and translator, um, Kiswahili and Lubabashi can give us insights into the different ways of expression in the city. Um, from Nico's point of view of um, grammar mapping, you see fine-grained insights into structural properties of the language. 
Um, and then from language attitudes, we can get this sort of starting line um, idea as um, Kiswahili in the Mubashi being basilectic, French is acrolectic, and then um, there'd be an interest in learning what people think about English as well. Um, so the aim of this was to kind of bring together different perspectives of how to approach studying a language and then also being um, reflexive as the researcher and, you know, being aware of your biases and the way that you're approaching the study of a language. Mm -hmm. Aksante sana. Well, uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to thank the organization of this beautiful event with so many special guests and scholars. Um, it's a great honor to represent my university, Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul from Brazil. We do not actually have many scholars in the field of Swahili studies in Brazil. Uh, so it's, it's very meaningful to have my work accepted here. And I have titled my presentation, Pan and Desange, an assessment of the Hamitic myth in 19th century East African Chronicles. Well, uh, I, I delve in my research with uh, two chronicles produced within the scope of 19th, late 19th century and actually er, early 19th century uh, in the Swahili coast. Uh, which are uh, very interesting works, cr historical chronicles, which contain at, at their beginnings, evidently, the narrative of the Hamitic myth, the, 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 narr the narrative of Ham and his son Canaan, which has been cursed by Noah and the Old Testament narratives, which call upon my attention. Uh, and therefore, I, I delve into the possibilities of what could be the, the reasoning behind the, the, the presence of such narratives. So therefore, I have organized my uh, presentation for uh, basic topics, which I will, I will try to do a little briefly. I, I actually got a little carried away in the making of this presentation, so <laughs> I'll cut it short. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I will look at what is the Hamidic narratives. Uh, is it widely known? It's a, it's almost a cliche in the field of uh, biblical studies, so to speak, and it's influenced in the, the other non-Christian religions, of course, uh, mainly Islam, which is my my focus here. And secondly, I'll deal with the ter one term that is central to my analysis, which is the term Zanj, very widely known, which gives the origin to Zanzibar, for example. Uh, but it, it is very crucial in the, uh, in the adherence of the narrative of the Hamidic myth in 19th century Islam in East Africa, uh, according to uh, my research. Uh, thirdly, I'll, I'll delve a little bit into the, the Swahili Ham, what this specific etiology uh, version of the myth, which, is, uh, which appears, which is featured in these chronicles. And finally, I'll, I'm going to make a, a, a relation between Ham de Zange, uh, as they are very approached, and slavery in 19th century, which is crucial to all this scenario. And I'll be dealing with two, but basically the two documents I'll be analyzing in my research, in my master degree research. I'm a master's candidate. I'm writing currently my dissertation in this field. It is the Kitab al Zanush produced in the, 19, in the 1890s, approximately. I mean, there are two versions, and the, and the Kalkab al Zuria al Asbari Frikiye from 1913. This is very, a very dated document. But first of all, as a recap of this myth, I would like to delve into what is it and what are the versions of this myth, because we are dealing specifically with an Islamic uh, etiology of the Hamitic narrative. Well, the Hamitic narrative is a narrative present most widely known in the book of Genesis, Genesis 9, verses 18 to 27, uh, which deal with the so-called curse uh, uh, declared upon uh, Ham and his son, 
Canaan, and they are interchangeable at, at times, but in the Bible it is upon Canaan, uh, which Noah, uh, due to the crime perpetrated by, by Ham, which, which is he saw uh, Noah naked in his tent, and he laughed at him. He made fun at him while his brothers helped, actually helped Noah and their father uh, with his nakedness after he was supposedly drunk in this version, in the Christian and Old Testament version, which well, the story actually, the historiography recognizes it as a political myth regarding the enmity between the Israelites and the Canaanites in the ancient world, in the ancient Levant. So, but that, that is the original formulation of the myth, the oldest, one of the oldest and original ones, but we are interested actually in the development of, the, of such myths across time as an intertext between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So therefore, as an intertext, we understand it not as a, uh, a fulfilled or a, a, a given text, but as, a, as something, as a story, as a narrative that is constantly changing across time and space between these three uh, scopes, these three ontological perceptions of the world of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam across the first millennium of the Christian era, mainly into all across to the Middle Ages. Uh, and we are aiding this process by the, the concept of Benjamin Broad of the sacred textual spaces, which uh, deals with the intertextuality between the, these three monotheistic religions. Uh, and they work uh, most famously. Why am, why am I delving into the curse of Ham? Because it, it works as a framework for prejudice and for the construction of negative alterity in relation to the other. So it is a device uh, across this intertext of the construction of the other, uh, which in the most famous, most famously with the Christianity and also Islam, uh, resulted in an etiology of the curse of Ham as a curse of slavery, which it, it originally can be interpreted as a curse of slavery. Ham was condemned due to his sin to be, and his progeny to be slaves of the sons of Japhet and of uh, Sam. Sam, which in the, in, in the Islamic etiology would give origin to the Arabs, for example. And, Japheth to the Europeans in, the, in some etiologies, justifying this, the slavery of the enslavement of blacks uh, in the modernity, in the modern age, and also in the Middle Ages. So it is developed as a dual curse of blackness and slavery. David Goldenberg is a historian which uh, develops it in, this, in such terms. And it results in an amalgamation of different etiologies association Hans punishment servility to his brothers, the servility to the Arabs, for example, with blackness. In Islam, in the Islamic scholarly traditions of the Middle Ages, uh, this, the ulama, the, the scholars are actually divided from this matter. Some accept such narratives, uh, der der which derivate from the Old Testament, mm. uh, some are actually refuted because they are Israeli, they are narratives from uh, the Ahl al Kitab, the people of the book, which of, of course they, they have uh, some intrinsic value, but they are disputed. They are questionable, they are tahdi. Uh, so there are, it's all dependent upon the, the chain of transmission. It is not Wahab and Munabi, which is one of the, uh, trans, which one, one of the traditions quoted in, by many historians of the medieval period, is, is taken upon as a, a weak. That, for example, and there are others, other narratives from, from the hadith which are more, which are stronger actually in this, in the, in this, in this matter. So there, it is very disputed, it is not taken at face value. Not, it, so some, some authors, some medieval Muslim authors actually accept the, the narrative and reproduce it with some, uh, in some ways, and some, others such as Ibn al Jawzi, Ibn Haldun refuse it. They prefer other explanations for blackness, for example. Not that, not that they are, uh, not that they see uh, black society, especially African society, in a good 
manner. Actually, they prefer other explanations for their inferiority. We can we can still speak. But what does all have does all that have to do with East Africa? Well, uh, East Africa, since all, all across the the second millennium of the current era, uh, has, it's mainly the coast uh, has a strong connection to Islam and to its colored tradition by extension. So it reproduces in the in the text in the Islamic sphere a lot of these narratives, including an incorporation of the Hamitic myth mainly in the 19th century in the form of chronicles. So uh, the chronicles in the, in, the, in the late 19th century, we have the context of slavery, we have context of an upper class, uh, which has an, a strong feeling of Arabness that wishes to distinguish from the hinterland. And they uh, see in the, in the, the course of time a, a, a viable explanation for the differences and a genealogical explanation for the different origins of East African societies, which obviously elevates the uh, Arabs of the, the coast, or, so, or self-proclaimed in some cases Arabs of the coast, as uh, superior and which relegates the hinterland people to enslavable uh, barbarians. And so to speak, we can, we can translate terms such as Zanj, which is employed in the, which is also borrowed from the context, from the medieval Muslim context and reappropriated and also utilized in this distinction. So Zanj, uh, very quickly speaking, is a, actually an, an Arabic Persian term of disputed origin, but which always refer in you know, one way or another as a derogatory manner to societies of East Africa and utilized in the in the Arabic Persian tradition of, of geography, of historical writings, in reference in a very generic way to societies of East Africa, mainly in, in, at one point to societies of the Horn of Africa, but uh, gradually, gradually associated uh, in, the, in the later centuries with uh, East Africa and Swahili, in the Swahili zone. Uh, I, I, I like a lot to use the, the conceptualization by Professor Paulo Fernandes de Moraes Farias, who is a, one of the greatest Brazilian historians we have uh, from, uh, he made his career in Birmingham and he speaks of uh, mobile classificatory labels. So he sees the term Zange uh, in, in, close, in, in close proximity to terms such as Habash, which means Abyssinians, which is the origin of the term Abyssinians, Barbara Birbira, which is incorporation of Greek uh, tradition into the Islamic uh, sphere, uh, and other derogatory, all derogatory and generic uh, appropriations of, of, of the description of East African or African in general uh, societies. Because the term Zanch doesn't actually have, or the mobile classificatory labels don't have actually. Uh, uh, basis, a basis, a solid basis on the empirical world of Zanj in the, in the medieval tradition, as in this map produced by Professor Farias in one of his articles, uh, derives its, its power from the imaginative geography of Muslim authors. One which, for example, sees the Nile as a as threefold Nile, which goes from Senegambia to all the way to East Africa, and the Zanj permeates all this uh, all the zones, for example. Uh, and we are going to see that, of course, in the sources which we selected for our research, mainly the Kitab of Zunuj, which well, I'll focus on the term Zanj or Zunuj and the plural because it, it brings this chronicle brings in the title, in its own title. So it's, it's, it's a foremost question of importance. Uh, the Kitab of Zunuj is composed mainly of two known anonymous manuscripts which were collected in the early 20th century by an Italian scholar. And they, they contain historical narratives that make up for an Arab history of the Swahili, Swahili coast, mainly an Arab history of Swahili, the Swahili coast, which attests for uh, Arab founders of the cities, uh, but also uh, amalgamates uh, oral narratives in circulation at the coast with uh, narratives from the written or the Islamic tradition or widely speaking. 
and it also introduces uh, this language, which of which it speaks in an authority manner, uh, referring to uh, various societies of the hinterland, such as Mexicana uh, societies and others, uh, introducing them, of course, as descendants of Ham, within a specific etiology of the myth, which is reproduced right at the beginning, this, which is very noteworthy. Here's some information concerning uh, the, how it, this manuscript were obtained in a colonial situation, of course. So we, we have all these Italian, German, British uh, scholars uh, trying to apprehend the, the African continent and appropriate of, of the knowledge uh, via informants in the East Africa. And we have Enrico Cerulli, who, uh, who happened to be a, a fascist also, a very unfortunate. But he obtained in the 1920s the two copies of the Kitab al Zanush, but he would publish the translation, the first translation into a Western language, into Italian only in the 1950s. So, uh, and also the second, uh, our second source is the Kalka Buduria al Akhbari Fikir, or, or the Shining Star Concerning Information About Africa, which is a much more polished work. I, I hope I don't, I'm not uh, breaking through my, my time. I'll, I'll just John, finish. Uh, Samahani Gabriel, um, we've just got a small amount of time left. Can you um, wind up now, please, Santi? Sure, sure, of course. Of course. And I write at the end, actually. Well, the, the second chronicle is very similar, follows the Kitab as and both present a very similar narrative, although the second one is much, a much more a uh, prolific work in literary terms, of course. And we have one named author, Fadl bin Omar al bauri which happened to be a sheikh, a, a mudir in the British colonial administration uh, in Malindi and other uh, cities of the East African coast. So by knowing the, the author, um, who possibly was also the author of Kitab al we happen to know a little more about who was producing such Chronicles and their obvious interests in. Uh, I, I'm going to skip the, the reading, it, it would be very extensive. But who was producing such chronicles and who was attributing such narratives to determinate folk? Uh, who, who happened to uh, be, who happened to be labeled by the coastal Swahili uh, Arab uh, scholars as barbarians, as Zanj as Shenzi, which I happen to know is, is not a very positive word in Swahili. Uh, well, uh, my conclusion, just, just to wrap it up uh, finally, uh, is that the adherence of the Hamitic myth in the Swahili context is in direct relation to the semantic nature of the term Zanj, because Zanj is a term that connotes uh, both slavery and blackness as is in the its original uh, medieval Muslim uh, version. Also is the Hamidic myth, which amalgamates the, the blackness, alleged blackness in, in a construction uh, in the, its intertext with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and the curse of slavery. So being those, being both closely related, they had this adherence very, uh, strongly uh, ver verified in these chronicles. Well, uh, I'm sorry for my English and for uh, the, the violating the limit of time, but that is thank you for the attention. Okay, so we're back to uh, Morpho Syntax for our last session before the, the break, um, and we're going to be talking about some selected features um, from two areas of Swahili speaking world. Yes, okay, fantastic. Um, so there are some interesting things here. We want to talk about uh, young people, young people's speech. So there's um, variation across East Africa. Given the focus today, we'll be talking about Swahili. Um, and we want to draw some insights from youth language practices from Dar es Salaam and then uh, Lubumbashi. Um, we're going to be focusing on micro variation or morphosyntactic uh, micro variation. So small grain, fine grain differences between 
closely related languages, or in this case, you know, one language or a sort of continuum, um, and thinking about structural properties. Um, and this uh, talk is part of a larger research project looking at microvariation and youth language practices. So this sort of strand of work on youth language practices um, that's been happening for yeah, several uh, decades now, and then a kind of parallel strand of work on morphosyntactic uh, microvariation. Um, and we're bringing this together, um, focusing on Eastern, Central and Southern Africa. Um, so I'm just doing a very short introduction and then I'll hand over um, to Andrea, who's our colleague who's um, online joining us from Germany um, before we pass back um, to Nico. So Andrea, over to you. And thank you very much, Hannah. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Habari zenu. I want to give you a few insights from my research in Tanzania about Lurayam Tani, which is um, a language practice of young speakers of Kiswahili in Tanzania, especially in urban areas such as Dar es Salaam and Darusha, among others. Um, Roystayan and Kiesling state that Lurayam Tani is a cover term for a spectrum of informal urban speaking practices based on Swahili and um, that it has no discrete boundaries, but must be seen as being on a continuum between style and social act. Lurayam Tani exhibits different uh, linguistic manifestations, especially in terms of lexical innovations through semantic manipulations. Morphological and morphosyntactic um, practices have not been studied much, and Roystayan and Kiesling claim that processes such as morphological hybridization are largely absent from Lurayam Tani. But um, we have uh, so far in our project found a few um, morphological devices that are being employed by young speakers. And one feature that is very common in Lurayam Ta'ani is um, a suffix that we have heard um, before in the same panel earlier by um, Julius and um, Teresa, who have talked about the aga suffix. And we find that one very commonly in Lurayam Ta'ani. So semantically, um, as um, they have also explained earlier, this may add a habitual meaning to the verb. Although um, yeah, in Lurayam Tani, we can see that sometimes the form is also used without expressing, uh, expressing additional semantic nuances. But here we do have the habitual meaning in the um, first two examples, um, like in Ananimalizaga, or the other one, it, it's the same verb that, um, Teresa and Julius talked about Nindagasana tu lakini ushubwada anapoibuka mchizi wako. Then um, there is another feature of youth language practices that we found in um, different variations of Kiswahili, and that is the um, use of noun classes. Here, yeah, speakers may um, use different noun classes and agreements, either for stylistic reasons or to add semantic nuances. For example, a stylistic practice in Lurayam Ta'ani is um, the use of noun class prefixes for class one and two with nouns that um, yeah, are found in this class, but that usually do not take a prefix. This includes, for example, um, kinship terms. So uh, like in example two uh, with the word mdada sister, makeda ni mdada mkubwa, akiwepo anaweza kuangalia wadogo zake kama kukiwa na uangalizi wa mtumzima. And then we have uh, another example where we have a term that is not a kinship term, but another noun um, that is usually in class one and two, but um, is normally um, used without a prefix. And um, now I hand over to Nico to present uh, data from Lumumbashi. Thanks so much, Andrea, and um, thanks everyone here. Uh, we know already, we have learned uh, not long ago um, <laughs> that uh, Luambashi is the capital of the old Katanga province, uh, formerly also of the yeah, Katanga province, uh, formerly Shaba and so on, and uh, lies in the Copper Belt. Um, in the southeast of the DR Congo, um, the population is around 2 million people approximately. And of course, uh, there are diverse cultural linguistic influences in the city and its surroundings. Um, Lubumbashi is a, um, an, an economic hub, which is connected very much with the capital Kinshasa uh, already for uh, several decades, um, which also, of course, uh, explains the influence of Lingala, since um, 
I could say 50, 60 years ago. And um, uh, there are many local languages that have also left traces or their impact in the local Swahili spoken. So for example, Kiluba, Kiluba Kat, this is the one that we mentioned already close related to Chiluba, but also other languages and also to some extent um, Bemba from across the border um, in Zambia and so on. Um, and the youth language practice that is spoken in um, Lubumbashi was described by uh, Georges Moulumbois in 2009 as part of his dissertation uh, at the ULB in Brussels, and he called it uh, or labeled it Kindubile. And this is a problem, this is not Georges Moulumbois' problem, but this is a general problem when we speak about youth languages and youth language practices on the African continent, and these, that these names, that these language practices are given are not... Um, accepted or used by speakers themselves or by all speakers themselves. So nowadays when um, we we are researching um, this youth language practice based on the Lubumbashi Swahili in the streets of Lubumbashi, very few or almost now no speakers will relate to it or describe it as Kindubile. Um, Wilfried Sakabwang, who you have met also shortly before as a speaker is currently conducting research in Lubumbashi on um, this youth language practice and will uh, come with the data and analyze the data in minds uh, next month for a couple of weeks. So uh, this youth language from Lubumbashi, whatever the name may be, or whatever we can call it here, just call it the youth language from Lubumbashi, is characterized by the creative use of phonological manipulations, turning syllables around, for example, um, which is very common for African youth languages and lexical material from Ningala, a lot of it. Um, a bit in analogy with the uh, young people's Swahili as used in Goma and Bukavu, further north in the Kivus. Um, that I and several others have worked on. So the users of these of this language are usually street children, uh, street vendors, taxi drivers, some extent also police, uh, to some extent also soldiers and university students. So um, what we see is um, noun classes, as Andrea has pointed out for Dar Salam, um, what George calls class secondaire, l'augmentatif, uh, diminutif, l'appréciatif, dépréciatif, l'abstractif. So we have uh, very, uh, as also our, our colleagues in the first talk in this panel have shown a very creative and productive use of these uh, evaluative classes. And now in class seven and eight in this youth language practice use as an augmentative. So if you have kimwana, bibamwana, you can see the, the double plural here, the prefix stacking of class eight plus the ba uh, of class two would be obese child, obese children, big child, big children, somehow that's what, what people would say. Um, and um, But if you use mutoto, batoto, which would be the Lubumbashi Swahili equivalent, you can't say um, ki mutoto or something. You would say uh, ki toto. So this is the replacive strategy that was pointed out earlier on. Uh, be total. So the youth language here makes uh, a use of a different kind of maybe clitization more than prefixation or something. Um, Kamwana, Tubamwana would be small child, small children, according to uh, Georges Moulumba's data. So this is class 12 and 13, which has been lost in most coastal varieties and is uh, was reintroduced quite early um, after Swahili was introduced and implemented in Lubumbashi. Um, and then we have an example here, Kale Kademu. Uh, Keiko to Angaria, that girl, or also maybe cute girl, small girl, beautiful girl, is uh, is looking at us, um, and we see that agreement patterns are mostly uh, maintained and kept. Um, and the question is, of course, does this work with all Lingala and French lexemes? It works, for example, with Muloji, uh, Kaloji. Muloji is the sorcerer, but also used for a person, a young person in the streets who does not cooperate and so on, who does things that are not really well. Um, well considered. Kaloji works, but um, what about Ndule? Music, for example, a loanword from Lingala. Uh, is there Kandule? Is there Kadule? That's something that we will still investigate how this works, for example. Um, and then we have an increased use of the noun class two makaba in these prefix stacking processes. So in analogy to babor, bor is the thing, can also be the male sex. Uh, babor, the things, uh, speakers can also say babintu. So class two and class eight. Uh, and here it's not only the double prefix that marks something, but there's also a specific expressive stance that's expressed through the class two, which is also practically taken as, as a whole from Lingala, which means those worthless things, those dubious things, these things that I don't know about very much and so on. Um, and then uh, 
The Josh has also another example, Bankaka Bamoja specific thieves. So agreement patterns are maintained. Usually this animacy based agreement, there's nothing that we could detect so far in this example that you see there, Uyujo, Nimoloji, Arigonga, Ilela, Yenye, Ilikua, Movil. That guy is a sorcerer, he stole their money that was in town. And then the prefinal ak, the suffix. One example is petit ana arivaka kule. Does the girl or girlfriend usually arrive at that place that we see its habitual use, which is also the same in the uh, uh, Swahili from Lubumbashi. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is in all these Congo Swahili varieties, and also in these youth language practices, it fulfills two functions. It's not an emphatic one, as we saw earlier on, for example. Uh, it's habitual or sometimes iterative. And it's the remote past, something that was long ago, for example. So if you say something like Petit Ari Arivaka Kule, uh, the girl arrived there a long time ago. So it's somehow a functional split that the Li has become the recent past and Li Ak has become the remote past. But that's something that not only you, young people say, that everyone says that. But there is an interesting thing that when we have verbs from, um, from French, Kuboloné, from Boulot, the work, Kuboche, um, to also to work, kudaye from English to die, um, and kubaye from, Eng from French to yawn for to drink, so the same kind of movement. Mm -hmm. When we have these ones with an, an ending on e and not on a, on a, very often speakers would, according to the few examples we collected so far, drop the ak because it may be ambiguous. It may not be very clear what kind of verb it is. That's our preliminary explanation, maybe. So, ulejo aridaye. Did that guy, that guy pass away a long time ago? Instead of maybe Ulejo Arida Dayaka, Abulone, does he usually work? Or instead of maybe Abulonaka and so on. And then there's an in interesting thing that um, what we could not detect in the youth language so far, we are looking more into that, that uh, Kapanga, for example, said that in Lubumbashi, sometimes the habitual Aka, to distinguish it from the remote, remote past, um, Aka, uh, text on tone, for example. Um, this is not um, the case in Lubumbashi Swahili for all speakers, for some among the youth, we couldn't detect it. I hand over to mm -hmm. Anna. Yeah, so we just have some brief um, conclusions. So the, we've just presented a sort of snapshot essentially of some features in both, in both settings. Um, so uh, there are features that seem to be shared um, across uh, youth language practices in Swahili speaking areas. Uh, previous talk as well, so we saw the diminutives um, again um, from Tanzania to DRC in this case. Um, the, the youth register, and this is an ongoing conversation we've had um, from Lubumbashi, seems to be perhaps not very different from Swahili spoken in the city. So that's an interesting question, like to what extent is this different? Do speakers perceive it as different? Or are the differences that are more subtle that we've not quite got to the bottom of? Um, and then this also goes back to the idea of like the name and, and, and perceptions, which we've seen um, in the previous talk as well. Um, and then in the um, Lugiam Tan example that Andrea shared, um, we have this sort of, again, similar question in that, to what extent does Lugiam Tani differ from a Dar es Salaam Swahili or urban centre Swahili? Like, is this a distinct thing? Is it a distinct patterns of use? Or are we seeing, again, you know, diminutives, tense aspect marking, the same kind of thing? So, like, is this, <laughs> is this a thing? Um, so we want to know more about urban centres. We want to know more about youth language practices more broadly, different age groups. Also, the difference between rural and urban areas. So people tend to associate youth language practices with urban centres, but, of course, there are youth um, in lots of different places. Um, and so with our work, wanting to extend that to... But lots of work on Kenya as well, obviously, but different areas within these within these countries. Um, yeah, a lot of work from Nico on, on the Kivu provinces. Um, so that helps us better understand the variation that we see in Swahili, but also youth language practices um, more broadly. And I think that's that's us. So I'd like to say thank you very much, Asantinisana, to our. Um, speakers. We're running out of time. We're still about sort of uh, half an hour late since uh, lunch. Um, so I'm not going to give an opportunity for many questions. Some of the speakers are already in the room, so you can grab them at coffee or afterwards, hopefully, or write to them at, at their addresses. Um, I just wondered if, uh, if, if uh, is it Gabriel is still online in, in Brazil? Because he's so far away, I wondered if anybody had any questions for him. Um, I thought that would be a fair way to sort of squash the time. Um, so does anybody have any questions about Zenj, Zanj and Ham? 
not the ham you eat, but the, the hermetic ham. Oh, yes, yes. Maybe you want to come down here and then he can hear it. Is he still online? Yeah, he's still there. Yeah. If you come down, then he can hear the question himself. Thank you. And thank you for bearing, bearing with us. It's um, inevitably these things get a bit sort of weird. So yeah, if you just speak to, to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what's his name again? What's the guy? Gabriel. <laughs> All right. So, uh, well, I thank everyone for being here. I was invited. But this notion of uh, somebody having some three children or whatever it is, ham versus whatever, I've never get it. That as a black person, right? Dark skinned person to be discriminated because somebody look at somebody's nakedness, it doesn't make sense to me. It really doesn't. I wish somebody can explain why slavery years ago and up to date, dark skinned people are being discriminated. So whoever invented this notion, I think, I don't want to use the word, but I don't agree with it. So that's my yeah. Thank you. Do we have a, a, another comment or question? And does Gabriel want to um, comment on that? Yeah, of course, it's, it's actually very, studying this matter is always very, all the time it comes to slavery and racial prejudice, even when it predates notions of race, pre-modern notions of race, it's very, uh, it's very hard, you know, and it's hard to understand, even to understand the intricacies of it. But uh, sometimes it comes down to the reduction of the human being to a chattel, yeah, and the the profit, the unfortunate profitability, which some very uh, sketchy human beings end up uh, seeing in it and profiting of it, and they have to justify it, you know, one way or another. Uh, slavery ended up being, being in the modern era one of the most unfortunately profitable uh, businesses, and both in the Christianity world as well as in the Islamic world. And uh, this, this myth, this particular myth ended up being due to this religious nature, due to its original uh, genealogical nature and genealogy, genealogy in these societies was very valuable uh, resource of power. It ended up being a very, very powerful tool for the justification of such uh, atrocities. So it's it's very hard, but it's we have to unfortunately we have to study it and, and comprehend it. Thank you very much. It's a it's a fascinating question, and um, it also relates back to some of the things we were he hearing this morning. I also want to thank you for um, presenting from uh, Brazil because I, I think that's a that's a first for us, and and um, you're very welcome. I hope, I hope we 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 see you in future meetings as well. I'm going to wind it up there because I say we the the, the other teams um, we can we can speak to them at coffee, and uh, because we are running late, I'd encourage you to. If you need a coffee or need a bathroom break, just to sort of go and do it quickly. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, grab your drink, have a quick sip, and then join us for um, the final session of today. And hopefully, we'll we'll make up a, a bit of time. Thank you very much. Aki fish. So that's the subject of my talk. And let me say before beginning that the slides, um, as usual, I post my presentation with the speaking text online. So uh, don't worry about trying to capture all of the detail that you can see. If, if anybody um, wants to follow up, then it will appear on uh, academia.edu at some point. This, this continues work I started during lockdown on the vocabulary of nautical technology, a couple of papers uh, so far, both of them which need correcting, by the way. But And then I extended it to um, marine fauna, including fish. And today I'm just going to focus on fish. Um, 
why lockdown? Because it's one subject that I could study at home because I actually had a lot of the lexical resources with me. And also uh, I had uh, I had my um, I've got my own Zanzibari consultant at home consultant in inverted commas who sometimes agrees to answer questions. Um, <clears throat> so that's what this is. So <clears throat> Swahili and Comorian have hundreds, um, and I do mean hundreds of of uh, names for fish and other marine creatures. Um, and where did all these names come from? Uh, the Northeast coastal Bantu ancestors of the Swahili were originally only familiar with inland waters and fisheries um, as they sort of swept up historically in that uh, direction. Um, <clears throat> So how did they acquire the knowledge they needed to exploit the marine resources that they encountered on the coast? So we're going way back in time, um, uh, 1,500, uh, 2,000 years ago. Um, <clears throat> so where did they get that knowledge? And what do their names for marine species tell us about that process of adaptation? So a group of mixed farmers arrive on the coast. This is obviously a simplification, but arrive on the coast They've not encountered marine species, and now we find that there are hundreds of names for them. Where, where, did, where did they all come from? Um, and the following is just a preliminary sketch, and I won't really go into Comorian in this talk because it, it introduces a whole set of complications, some of them that I've not worked out for myself yet. The classificatory position of Swahili um, and approximate dates are shown on the slide on the right there. And note the distance between Swahili and Comorian. Comorian is not a Swahili dialect. It's actually, it's actually quite separate. And a lot of its fish names are quite different. There's some overlap because some of them um, um, can be traced back to proto sabaki um, Others have been borrowed backwards and forwards between the, the two languages, but there are also some that have, have evolved um, quite separately. And this slide is just a reminder. It shows you the primary dialects of Swahili and their classification. So primary being those original coastal uh, uh, dialects. And to reconstruct fish names to proto or early Sabaki, um, they have to be found at least as cognates in both northern and southern branches of Swahili of the of Swahili dialects, as well as in Comorian, it's not perfect, but there are no other languages in that group that have that, that sort of uh, uh, um, you know have an extensive fishing vocabulary. Maybe maybe some of the Midjikenda, but I, I don't think it's particularly separate from from uh, Swahili. And <clears throat> and here are some examples of general fishing vocabulary, sort of generic terms, with the old Bantu roots, um, including the generic terms for, for fish, that's that dialect Sui, um, or the Arabic derived Samaki, um, and eels, Mkunga, um, plural Mikunga in, in, in standard Swahili. Those are very old terms, and obviously because you get, uh, you know, fish are fish, and that's the same in freshwater marine, and also eels, you find them in both environments. And the only fish names that were carried over from freshwater to marine species were those for groups of fish that are recognizably the same across both environments, such as eels and another group, catfish. You find cat, in fact, some species of catfish are found both in, in, in freshwater estuarine environments as well as um, in the sea. And these include eel, the so called eel catfish. And the, just to give an example, the Mvita dialect names for eel catfish um, are both inherited Bantu terms. So Tandi and Ngogo, they have a longer history. Um, <clears throat> that said, uh, so I get my pages right. That said, while Swahili has, has actually few inherited fish names, um, relatively few, there aren't many more than that. There might be a few more that I've not picked up yet, but a larger number have been taken from other languages. And it's possible that some of the names that can't now be explained 
um, were borrowed from the languages of earlier coastal fisher folk. So whoever it was who preceded the incoming Swahili and Comorians on the coast, we don't actually know much about who, who, who they were um, or what languages they spoke. And, it, and it, so it's difficult to prove in the absence of co comparative vocabularies. Um, it's no good looking at the vocabulary of Sandawe or Hadza, for example, in the interior of Tanzania, because they don't have vocabularies for, for marine species. They're just, you know, and they're too far away. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so, so it, it, it's difficult to know what might have come from a non-Bantu African language in this region, except perhaps Somali. The, there is a set of Somali fish names. So the possibilities of comparison with Somali. And there are one or two examples that I've come across so far of, of fish names that might uh, be related to the Cushitic names used in Somali. Um, <clears throat> and there seems to be little evidence of old loan words from Persian or Arabic. For those who know this linguistic history, there's this old layer um, of Persian and Arabic. It's not always clear, clear which is which or, or, or to know the difference. Um, but there's very few of those loan words from Persian, Arabic, or even South Asian languages. I haven't hardly been able to find any. Um, Chaffee, um, a fish some of us would know, it's a rabbit fish. Tassi to others, Chaffee, Tassi in the north, is one candidate. Um, so if you look at the Arabic, um, I'm not sure I know how to pronounce this, but Safi and the Persian, um, also Somali, Possibly, there looks as though there's some relationship there. I can't prove it, but it's possible that that's an inherited, an old inherited term. Old because it has the it has the the bit the Bantu prefix, the nine ten class prefix. The reconstructed form is in chaff. And there are also relatively few names for which an Austronesian and specifically Malagasy source can be proposed. Very few. I've, 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 you know, I've looked, but I, I can only find uh, a, a small number, um, such as those at the top. And, and some of those are, are only possibles. And here's one of them, um, a local name for the Emperor Red Snapper. So in the sort of Mrima dialect area, um, Tanga and thereabouts, this word Dumbwara, sometimes it's also been recorded as Dimbwara. You can make a case for it being um, descended, if you like, from this old Malagasy term, uh, also in, in, in Old Javanese, originally Old Javanese, uh, Lembwara or, or, or um, Lambwara. And as it's coming to the Swahili, the initial, the la bit at the beginning or the la, la bit in that has been reinterpreted as though it were a, an old Swahili prefix, either Lu, 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 Lumbwara or uh, Li, five, the, the class five prefix is Limbwara. And that's how you would generate Dumbwara and Dimbwara. That's a proposal. It's not proven, but it, it looks quite strong. And in the, in the process, the, the name of this, the meaning of this word has changed as it's, as it's moved into Malagasy right now refers to dugongs, to those marine mammals. But in, in the Swahili dialect, it still refers to this big fish, the emperor red snapper, which can be quite big in size. Um, <clears throat> and the largest and most easily recognizable set of loan words is from Arabic. Um, and these are all relatively recent borrowings, including fish that were imported in dried form or originally imported rather than fished. And they're also predominantly the names of large oceanic species, um, reflecting the expertise of the Arabic speaking crews from whom Swahili learned much of their knowledge of deep sea sailing and fishing. And that's where you get all this later vocabulary for different types of boats that obviously come from the Gulf and thereabouts. But what about, what about all the rest of Swahili names for fish? And it seems that many and perhaps most of them were lexical and semantic innovations. Um, names that Swahili speakers and their immediate ancestors coined themselves. Um, using their own lexical resources to describe their fish they caught, and in most cases, ate. The original meaning of many names has been forgotten. Um, in some cases, it can only be guessed at. Um, 
while other names are evidently more recent innovations. So it's a process that you find happening up until recent times, but also with a lot of these old names, older names that you can reconstruct to a, you know, the pre-Swahili stage of linguistic development. Um, you can see some of them, because some of them are shared with Comorian as well. Um, and there's, there's some examples in that table. I won't, I won't go through them. But these are all names which you can, you can hypothesize that they're derived from the language itself or whatever that language was, protest, Sabaki, Swahili, uh, protest, Swahili, and so on. And one category, um, yeah, one category of these innovative names is especially interesting. Um, names like Pungu on the last slide, and Pungu for remember an eagle, it's also an eagle ray, um, which have been taken from other animals. There's a whole class of these, these, these words that have been adapted or, or just taken straight from the names of other animals. And here's a, a, you know, some obvious ones, Nungu, Pansi, Sangi, Tembo in some Swahili, Kipepeo. And as the second column here shows the, the English names, um, this suggests it's also been a productive process in English. A lot of our, you know, we, we, we call the fish lizard fishes that um, also some Swahili call garamwe, which is a, um, a, a, a local name for, um, um, particularly on the Kenya coast, for uh, lizard fishes. And it's derived from a name for a particular kind of lizard. And the most, to me, the most remarkable example of this that I've come across so far is the adoption of the names of male and female bush book, shown at the top, um, for snappers, um, according to their colour and resemblance to one or the other sex. So male bush book are darker in colour than female bush book. The names for them, um, <clears throat> which you can trace back to, to proto sabaki in fact, go much earlier, they're all Bantu names, those, but the, basically the names for the male, male, the name that's used for a male bush book has become in many Swahili dialects, the name for the darker colored snappers. Whereas the lighter colored snappers um, are called by the name that was applied to the females. So that kind of gender description of bush book has kind of come down in Swahili in a different form as a, as a term for different color variants. Um, which I found fascinating. I mean, the standard forms of these names are Kungu and then Boa and Boala. Um, again, as I say, they're, they're all Bantu, uh, Eastern Bantu names. And this happens, these names have been carried, I think, as loanwords onto islands. Well, I guess it includes Zanzibar as well, but onto islands, um, the Comoros, uh, Madagascar, where there are no bush books. There's no bush book. Nobody would know that connection anymore. These are words that originated on the mainland. There are no bush books uh, present on the islands off the East African coast. Now, in the time remaining, uh, I can only show a small sample of the names I've been looking at. Um, here's Chewa. Um, for Kenyans, that, the, you'll know that as the Tewa of Shibola Tewa famous location, um, location of a prison as well, um, lightly named, and it's lightly named, I think the name for their habit of staying put, literally floating, um, ra rather than swimming away when discovered. This is one reason why they're actually quite easy to spear. They're really big fish. These are the rock cod, the groupers, but they tend not to swim away like other fish. They sort of just lurk in their, in their holes. Um, and they are actually quite easy uh, for, for, for modern fishes as well to, to kill when they come across them. Mm. Here's Changu, a name which many of you will be familiar with. Um, probably derived from a verb describing its social or swimming behavior. Um, down there, it's the uh, <coughs> descendants of this inheritance of the verb kuchanga, uh, what was originally uh, kuchanga, to collect or wander around in another set of meanings. And here's chazo, um, the sucker fish that was once kept in order to catch turtles. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this this um, this history of using fish to kind of capture turtles, but um, 
there's some really nice descriptions of uh, of the um, the remoras being kept in cages by fishermen and then used because they attach themselves to other fish. They do the same to whales and porpoises and all sorts as well. But they 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 can they can be trained. Uh, uh, you know, trained is, is a loose um, use of the word, but they can be used to haul in, attach themselves to turtles, and then you you haul them in. Um, <clears throat> And that's 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 possibly an early loan word. I'm not sure, but the, 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 there's there's some similarity um, with that um, Arabic word, um, which ultimately derives from the verb meaning to attach. I'm not sure, but I, I don't otherwise know where that name comes from. And Bunju, one of my favourite names, Bunju, puffer fishes, and they're named, I think, for their poison. Um, and those of you who've uh, worked in Zanzibar or know Zanzibar will, will know this word punju. It's the most notorious uh, poison of the witches, a punju. It's a, it, it's a typical sort of witch's brew of lizards and amphibians. It's, 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 it's been much feared and really nasty. Also appears in the name of the Zanzibar red colobus, which is known as uh, Kima punju, um, because um, other animals, dogs and so on, uh, um, don't like its flesh, so it's said. And to give an example of a marine animal that is not a fish, and I could do many more of these, in, including um, shellfish, um, it's not a fish, zoologically speaking, um, Pueza, named after the time and place they're usually speared by these days women, perhaps always women, but um, you know, derived from this verb, coupoi, um, about, about the ebbing, we're describing the ebbing of the tide. And this is, a, you know, classically when you encounter uh, oct octopuses. And let me close by reiterating that there are history, that there are histories of adaptation and innovation in these names that can be matched with evidence from other sources. And I don't have time, I haven't had time to, to sort of start um, looking at that in detail, but this is, is what I'm working on now. And in particular, zooarchaeological findings, findings of archaeologists about the changing prevalence of different marine vertebrates in fish middens. So archaeologists, the, I mean, the classic site of Shanga in the north, in the Lamu archipelago, um, there's a very nice sequence and description of which types of fish over the centuries were, were the most popular or, or, or the ones that you could find most. And you can match this kind of linguistic data to see, you know, how far back can a name be reconstructed? Does that match um, the archaeological evidence? We need more archaeological evidence, but it's a, a possibility that you can do that kind of matching. And last but not least, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much. Now we welcome our second speaker of the, this uh, final afternoon panel. Um, Marian Deham, welcome uh, from the British Library. She's the new uh, curator of the APCA collection mm -hmm. at the British Library. Uh, therefore, if anybody needs any advice about the British Library, now we know where to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we welcome um, this presentation. Yeah, this one right here. One. Yeah. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. Habari Zagioni, Salam Aleikum, and whatever other greetings you would like to use. <laughs> um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the how the knowledge creation and transfer of fishermen networks shapes the Swahili language, culture, and community in the Mafia archipelago. Um, and however, before I start answering this question, if it was not working for me. Ah, okay. Uh, one thing that I've come to realize is a lot of people don't know where Mafia actually is. So uh, Mafia is in the south of Tanzania. It is south of the Zanzibari archipelago. And the mouth of the Rufiji River actually flows straight into uh, Mafia. Mafia is made up of eight islands. And Mafia Island is the main island of the archipelago. Um, it also hosts the largest marine park in the West Indian Ocean, uh, measuring at 882 kilometers squared. 
And actually, this red line that you find in this map is actually the Marine Park, the Mafia Island Marine Park boundary. Um, it is also the oldest uh, marine park in Tanzania, having been established in 1995. What this means is that whenever marine conservation is being discussed in Tanzania and East Africa, a lot of the times ma the Mafia Archipelago is being referred to and used within scholarly debates and also within political discussions. And this inadvertently means that uh, what you find is that international governments, the Tanzanian government, uh, the World Wildlife Fund and Mafia Island Marine Park all have their own ideas of what the marine ecosystem and marine environment should look like and what marine conservation looks like. And they feed these ideas to Mafia's fishers and Mafia's people uh, through regulation and through projects. But at the same time, Mafia's fishers and Mafia's people have their own ideas of marine conservation. Um, and uh, what you then see is that because they have their own ideas of what the marine environment looks like, they find new ways to use Swahili and their community and their culture to actually uh, to shape the Swahili language in order to actually describe this marine environment. I'm going to be focusing predominantly on uh, Mafia's fishermen. And when we're looking at shaping the Swahili language and culture and community in Mafia, this occurs in four main ways. So essentially, that's measuring the moon, measuring the wind, perceptions of marine animals, and perceptions of the marine environment. So when we're looking at the fishing industry in Mafia, it's important to note that most of the boats actually use sails instead of engines. And because you're using sails, uh, on boats like Mashua, which you'll find in that top picture over there, and this bottom picture here, um, and also Ngalawas, which is this little boat here. Um, and they also use Vitumbwi, which is a dugout canoe boat. So predominantly the boats that are used within uh, Mafia's fishing industry are plank boats and they use sails. What this means is that you need to be able to measure the natural elements like the wind and like the moon. Mafia has two monsoon seasons, like most of uh, the Swahili coast, and this is Kaskazi, the northeast monsoon season, and Pusi, the southeast monsoon season. At the same time, when we're discussing uh, the moon and measuring the moon, we need to bear in mind that not only does the moon affect the tidal variations of low and high tide, but also you have spring and neap tide. So this is actually a picture that I took uh, while in Mafia, and it shows the different variations how, or how far the tide can go out when uh, it's actually Kaskazi and when it's neap tide. So usually when it's low tide in Mafia and this beach, you would actually find the waves right here where those green structures are. But because it's Kaskazi, um, you find that the waves are, or the ocean is much further out than it usually is. Um, and this is one way that uh, affects fishermen because you need to be able to measure the moon in order to ensure the optimum time to actually go out and fish. Um, and another way that the moon influences fishermen is in the form of night fishing. Now in uh, Mafia, you find uh, fishermen who fish at night for Daga. Um, and Daga is a name for a group of fish, essentially. Um, and they're small, like anchovies or smaller. And uh, night fishermen use light to actually attract Daga to their boats in order to catch them. Now, you can imagine that because they're using light in the full moon, this is impossible because there's too much light in the ocean. So again, they need to use uh, some sort of measurement in order to measure this uh, the moon in order to determine the right time to go fishing. And the measuring of the moon actually occurs uh, through the use of the lunar calendar in Mafia. It also occurs in Zanzibar, but I'm talking about Mafia today. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> because there is the use of the lunar calendar and because fishermen are such a prominent and large group in the Mafia archipelago, what you find is actually that the rest of Mafia's community actually uses a mixture of both the lunar and the Gregorian calendar in order to communicate with fishermen. Um, and that's one way that uh, the Swahili community of Mafia is being influenced towards uh, the ocean. When we're looking at um, 
measuring the wind, we see how uh, the Swahili language is being uh, influenced within mafia, because here we find there's a creation and adaptation of the Swahili language. So uh, one such term is wanafunzi. Wanafunzi usually means students. Mm -hmm. However, in uh, mafia, the fishermen use the term wanafunzi to actually refer to a specific kind of uh, wave, which has blue at the bottom and it has a, a white crest or a white foam. So kind of like in that little clip art image. Um, and the reason why they do this is it's a visual cue for them to determine the intensity of the wind at a specific time and from a distance. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they use the term wanafunzi is because uh, the primary school uniform for public schools in Tanzania is a blue uh, trouser or a blue skirt with a white shirt. And so it's a not only a visual cue, but also a reminder of this kind of uh, uh, this kind of um, it's a sort of mnemonic device in a sense, or a, a way to remember it. Um, another uh, term that fishermen have actually created is kucharaza, and kucharaza refers to the cha cha sound you get when a wave hits the reef. So um, depending on how well, first of all, this is an audio cue in order to actually measure where there is a reef and um, where there is a reef while you're on the uh, on the ocean. And depending on how intense it is, you can also determine how um, how 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 the wind intensity. Sorry, is everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yeah. So kucharaza is a term that has been created then to actually refer uh, as a as a audio cue to uh, within the to measure the the wind. Um, when we're looking at perceptions of marine animals, the first animal that we find is fish. Um, and sadly, I'm not talking it about any specific fish, just fish in general. Um, now, the fishermen of uh, mafia perceive fish as highly intelligent and highly adaptable animals. And it's really interesting. They've actually created this new term called mavuvi, and I've only ever found it in, in mafia. Um, and when we're mavuvi, um, it's a very interesting term because it takes the root of vuvi, which is fishing, because when we refer to fishing in Swahili, you use the term uvuvi. When you refer to one fisher, you use mvuvi. When you refer to multiple fishers, you use wavuvi. And when you're talking about fish, you would use the term samaki. But uh, what the fishermen of mafia have done is actually use the term, uh, the root of the term uh, for fishing, vuvi, and then uh, added this prefix of ma in order to actually refer to fish. And in a way, it ties their fishing activities and their fishermen knowledge to uh, fish. The second animal that holds a lot of uh, perceptions is whale sharks. Um, and whale sharks present frustration because uh, they get stuck in the fishermen's nets. So they will actually swim into the nets. And it's, it's really annoying for fishermen because they have to stitch up these large gashes. Um, and at the same time, one thing that I noticed is that Every single fisherman that I talked to told me that they would never hurt the whale sharks because they believe that they share a symbiotic kind of relationship. So what this means is that the fishermen believe that whale sharks will follow their boats in order to determine where they can find algae. And this algae, uh, well, well, the fishermen f uh, know where this algae is because this algae is also eaten by the fish which fishermen catch. And at the same time, fishermen will follow whale sharks in order to determine where they can get fish. Um, and it's quite interesting because uh, the fishermen, uh, well, whale sharks can only be found at Kilindoni, which is uh, the largest town uh, of, of mafia. Uh, so they can only be found at that ocean. They can't actually be found within the marine park boundaries. And when I asked uh, a fisherman about this, uh, he told me that the reason why whale sharks actually like the ocean at Kilindoni is because it's like Uswazi. 
Um, and the use of the term Uswazi is particularly interesting because Uswazi refers to uh, a neighborhood where um, everybody's house is very close together. And there's a lot of culture there because there's a lot of commotion and a lot of people live right next to each other and you know what your neighbor is doing essentially. Um, and it's specifically interesting in Mafia because in Mafia, the majority of people live in the Uswazi. And if you don't live in the Uswazi, you live in Uzunguni or which it refers to where the white people live, or you live in Warabuni, which refers to where the Arabs live. So the use of the term Uswazi here is actually including the whale sharks within their own community. And here we see how the Swahili community in Mafia is being influenced. When we look at the perceptions of um, the marine environment, here we have a very interesting phenomenon. Um, and this phenomena actually occurs, well, it's an aerial view of a pheno this phenomena, which occurs uh, during Kaskazi and during the beginning of the Kaskazi period. Um, and those in Mafia who have a Western scientific education will say that this is because the, the waters from uh, the Rafiji River are flowing out to Mafia and there is more of an algae production within the ocean. But the people of Mafia actually refer to it as a ritual that occurs every single Kaskazi where the ocean cleans itself and it spits out all these materials that it no longer wants, which is why the ocean has a specific smell. And it's also why the shores are littered with seaweed and plastic. The people of Mafia view the ocean as something to be feared and loved at the same time. There's so many stories about how fishermen have gone further and further into the ocean to chase greed and never came back. And um, when you're a girl and, or when you're a woman in mafia, you'll be told, uh, don't go to the ocean during high tide because that ocean might take you, the current might take you and pull you further into the sea. Um, and actually some of these stories are backed up by dead bodies, actual dead bodies that will wash up on the shores of mafia. And these also come with stories where is it the fishermen or the young girls that went out, out uh, during high tide or is it from bodies in, in Somalia's civil war or is it from killings in Comoros? So these are all the different kinds of stories that you find um, that are horrific. But at the same time, it is the fishermen who uh, after a long day on the ocean, go and jump into the ocean and they frolic along the seaside. So they are very connected to the ocean at the same time. And it's also the people of mafia who have these horror stories who refer to themselves as Wachwapwani, we are the people of the ocean. Or uh, they will tell you, Twende tukatupa shirazetu baharin. So let's go throw our worries away into the ocean. So I would like to conclude my presentation today with a personal reflection. Um, I speak Swahili fluently, uh, but when I went to Mafia, uh, I realized that there was a language barrier between me and fishermen. I was speaking Swahili, they were speaking Swahili, but I did not understand a single thing they were saying. And this would come about because they would tell me things like, Unaona lile wimpi pali, lile ni mwanafunzi. Ukiangalia chini, mavuvi anatembea shakala bakala. Na hii ni kwa sababu tuko katika msimu, uh, mwezi watatu katika msimu wa kaskazi. And so to translate that, they would tell me, you see that wave over there, that is a student wave. If you look underneath, the fish are moving in a chaotic manner. And this is because we are on the third day of this lunar phase during uh, the Kaskazi season, so the Northeast monsoon season. So it, it was a completely different uh, mindset. And what I'm speaking on today might seem quite abstract, but in Mafia, it's a day-to-day -day reality. And it's only when I actually shifted my perception to view the ocean, the wind, the moon, marine oh. animals within the ocean and the, the fishermen on top of the ocean as an interconnected entity that I was actually able to understand them. And it's only when you shift that perception that you'll be able to understand because otherwise you'll start asking yourself, Hivi, yule mvuvi, alikuwa asema kusuma vuvi au wavuvi. Or in translation, you'll start questioning yourself, was that fisherman talking about fish or fishermen? Thank you. <laughs> 
thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I'm sure maybe there are some questions, see the interconnectedness, but we're just going to go through to the last presentation and then um, uh, we will take some questions from the floor and, and from online. So I think our next speaker is online. Uh, okay, no, no, you go. Uh, Cristina Nicolini, um, I hope you, you can, um, you are there and uh, we will um, uh, ask you to uh, share. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, so yes, the title of the presentation is Weaponizing Literature, Swahili Novels on HIV AIDS uh, Partigiani in the Epistemic Resistance War. Um, Christina, welcome. Christina is a SOAS alum. Uh, she's just completed a PhD at SOAS, um, I think is a couple of years ago now. Um, so welcome back, Christina. And uh, the floor is yours now, and you can start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you just confirm that you can see the slideshow? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can ah, see the slideshow. Okay, and I think you uh, guys on the audience uh, online, you should be able to see it as well. Okay, thank you. So first of all, I would like to congratulate Ida on a great work of translation, and of course, the Nobel Prize winner. Um, and yes, my presentation is about um, this concept that I called weaponizing literature. So it's a kind of metaphorical way um, that speak about how to use literature as a tool uh, to operate a kind of conceptual decolonization of quotes. And so I started with this metaphor so, uh, as a kind of comparison between the partisans of creation resistance and the resistance of local epistemology, as described in Afrofront literature, which are active in this resistance movement against the intellectual occupation uh, since colonial time. And thus, I define literature in African languages as kind of partigiani fighting against the epistemological fascism. We know that we had a long history of, of epistemic injustice, um, which happens to, to be in very different forms, like uh, especially hermeneutical or testimonial. And uh, a great work has been done from a sociologist, uh, De Sousa Santos, who describes the modern Western thinking as an abyssal thinking, which divides social reality into this side of the line and the other side of the line that is produced as non-existent, so as to grant the monopoly to modern science. This epistemological fascism results in epistemicide, um, which has been described as the murder of knowledge. However, on the other hand, we have also um, this movement called the Epistemology of the South, which is a cluster of multiple epistemologies born in struggle and anchoring the experience of resistance which engender a new process of both production and validation of variable knowledge, whether scientific or non-scientific. In this framework, uh, African-centered knowledge are also located, which are conceptualized as the third African-centered space in between uh, Eurocentrism and Afrocentrism. It also includes the African struggles for epistemic freedom against Eurocentric thinking, so as to provincializing Europe while deprovincializing Africa. Particularly one example of the struggle of knowledge from the global south are exam or, an, or an example of epistemology of resistance is the case of traditional healing practices in Africa. Therefore, the treatment for illness in literature has become a form of epistemic resistance. And in fact, from my analysis of Swahili literature, I define HIV AIDS as a divisive disease and indeed the divided debate about HIV AIDS treatment consists in a kind of balancing and rebalancing of the scale in between modern hospital and traditional healer performances who have their, their epistemic role to play. In fact, the inadequacy or inaccessibility to hospital care pushes people to prefer the traditional expert counseling who intervene to alleviate AIDS related disease. Particularly in Swahili literature, the healers are portray portrayed either as professional or as swindlers, as well as the hospital are unquestioned for scientific efficacy, yet they are viewed as morally corrupted. In my case studies, um, I will explore three selected Swahili novels from Tanzania dealing with HIV AIDS. 
namely Kisikiki Kawa or the dry stamp, Firauni, the debauche, and finally Kua Kua Maua, the existence of flowers. The first novel, Alvin Mutembi's novel, um, Kisikiki Kawa, is a historical and documentary novel entirely based on his empirical uh, um, findings collected during the author's research on the ground conducted in the Kagera region in between 92 and 2006. And the novel is set in the aftermath of the Uganda-Tanzania conflict, also known as the Kagera War. A period between 1969 and after 1983, when AIDS started spreading in the country. In, this, in the period described in this novel, HIV AIDS was an unknown and uncurable disease, which was challenging both hospital and herbal treatments. In addition to this, the region was economically devastated because of the war. Thus, not only were the hospital lacking adequate equipment and treatments, but also swindlers and cheaters took their advantage of the situation pretending to be professional healers. Hospitalini hawakuona ogonja wawote, kumuambia rudi nyumbani. Wakaona heri waende kwa waganga wajadi kuuliza kulikoni. Alikuwa amepigwa na yembe. Jini analo tupiwa mtu na watu wabaya. Alikuwa na jini. Yembe hilo ni lao gawebuni. Sio yembe la kawaida. Na kuliondoa yembe lilolotoka nchi zangambo, sio kitu cha mchezo. So here is presented this vampire spirit's theory as an explanation for HIV AIDS. People were struggling and starving because of the war and because of the ignorance of both medical doctors and healers about this new disease. Therefore, in the end, the solution to both injustice and AIDS seems to have a supernatural key element. In fact, uh, the off-screen voice of an invisible narrator who is bewildered in the face of dissonant epistemologies that clash one against the other, maintains that the solution which appears closest to popular understanding is the one that must be allowed to prevail. Mimi si kukubali kama walikuwa na yembe, wala si kuweza kukata ilo. Afadali suala la yembe, lilileta mantiki kutokana na duruma. So once again, the bloodsucker theory was the first explanation. In the second novel, uh, Afumani Mawia's novel, um, is a realist novel set at the threshold of the 90s, which criticizes the social political condition of the Tanzanian society following from the process of neocolonization started after the implementation of the neoliberal reforms. The effectiveness of scientific medicine for treating HIV AIDS is unquestioned in this novel. However, not only the privatization of the, the health sector made hospital treatment expensive, but also corruption spread among medical doctors. As a result, once again, traditional healers, both honest and dishonest, came into play to cope with the situation. Daktari alikuwa muaji, asiekuwa na maadili ya udaktari, hakika ni firaun. On the other hand, the healers perform genuine efforts to cope with kitigo, which is a typical disease among the Zingu ethnicity, which affects people who have incestuous relationships, and it has the same symptoms of AIDS. Nimigumu kutufuatisha ukimu ina kitigo. Kitigo kinadawa, ukimpata mganga na yujulia, ugonja u, unapona maramoja. To sum up, science and modern medicine are unquestioned, but cure unavailable for those who cannot afford it. In fact, several so sociopolitical institutions are criticized because of the cut and the privatization of the health sector as well as because of the networks of corruption and bribery. In the end, the fairest answer to both social injustice and AIDS has a kind of supernatural witchcraft. Finally, in um, William Kufia's uh, philosophical novel is a fictional work based on an intellectual quest regarding the meaning of life, sexuality, fear of death, fate, an existential absurdity in connection with HIV AIDS, which celebrates both scientific and embodied knowledge. Thus, the realistic narration is often, um, often unexpectedly enchanted by the complementary inclusion of these ontologies from the spiritual world, as well as extrasensory perception and paranormal cognition. Buyu Wonkwesi, the climber Baobab, is the guardian of Mayuyu, the fleeting mortals. 
aliyebaki ni mkwezi peke yake lakini hata mkwezi hata mkwezi alichojia mtu huo ni, ni mabuyu sio kisa na kini cha mayuyu shani yandamanyo kuwa kwa so once again the solution is shani so it's surrounded by some kind of mysterious answers and the principal symbol of connection between the material world and the supernatural world are the owl, the, bon the bundi, or the lightning bauba, mbuyu waradi, which are also means of access epistemology of Marburg through paranormal cognition, extrasensory perception, and parapsychological phenomena. Mbuyu alimsikia bundi akiuchukulia kwa ulozi, akizusa na kunuiza. So the, ba the baobab could hear the owl's ominous chanting of an evil spell. And divination is a way to access the supernatural and the unknown. Diviners and the and diviners unveil a hereditary curse, Kindalam Lapeke, the chick who eats alone, or the child who loves only himself. This is a traditional course which implies someone whose existence destroys the other existence. So in conclusion, we can say that Swahili narrative describes the treatment of illness as a battlefield wherein plural epistemologies clash and coexist. Swahili prose fight against the epistemicide with, with its own style by means of different static weapons, stylistic and narrative devices, such as generic fracturing, fragmentation, self-reflexive narrative, metafictional devices, made up of intertextuality, meta-references across chants and magical realist style, where the conjuring of spiritual ontologies, magic and the supernatural interfere in the phenomenal world and where clashes between diverse ontologies and incompatible epistemologies are displayed. So not only are Swahili novels partisan in the war of resistance against epistemological fascism that they fight by means of narrative style and aesthetic of language, but they also are an example of a preemptive style of writing to avoid repeating epistemic violence and injustice, which was perpetrated in the past. And score, if you would like to discover much about this research, you can read uh, my monography, which was uh, published in July 22. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Christina. Um, okay, we can stop sharing now. Uh, perhaps we can give it uh, a few, a little bit of time for a few questions, and then um, we're going to conclude the day. Um, I will show you, um, uh, I think I've seen in the program, um, a new da database that we have created about the Kanga. Uh, but perhaps before that, uh, maybe we can take some questions from the audience or um, also online. Um, yeah, is there any question? From the audience first. Yeah, Clarissa, have you got a question? You can speak, you need to unmute. Yes, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question actually to, to Martin Walsh or probably also to um, Miriam Dehan about um, dialectal variation of the fish terms because you also have along the coast, of course, the ecological, the maritime environment is similar, but also you have, on the one hand, you have different fish population as well and then of course you have different languages or different dialects so i was just wondering if martin would want to say something about dialectal variation thank you thank you for beautiful presentations oh it's a very good question and because of time obviously i couldn't go into a lot of detail but to look at each fish name it would typically take me at least half a day or a day to go through all the the sort of vocabularies and dictionaries for different dialects that I have. And then there are also resources that are, are not written by linguists, but by, you know, there's, there's the FAO data from Fishbase and, and other, other literature. So what I'm talking about is actually based on data sheets, which, um, we, 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 in which I, 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 I've written down or typed um, all of the variations that I know of, and as far as it's possible to know where those terms were recorded. Um, so in, able to, in, in order to reconstruct, for example, a term to Proto-Swahili, you obviously need to find it in, in Northern Swahili and Southern Swahili dialects. You also need to be sure that it's not a loan word from one to the other. So the, the sort of starting point of this is the 
detailed data. Um, and this will also give me an opportunity to say to anybody who has a list of fish names and dialect knowledge of fish names, please, please write it down, publish it, and before that, send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> because data are the key. And so for some groups of, of species, this is really hard to do because of the lack of data. It's quite difficult because I don't have a lot from Northern Swahili dialects. Um, I've not been through the sort of classical literature of um, Northern Swahili, but uh, have relatively little data from you know, Bajuni and, and Mwini and, and um, you know, the, the dialects in the Lamo archipelago. So that's a constraint on your ability to do that. But it, 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 you're right to ask that question because it's fundamentally about that detail. And we now, at least I, you know, from sort of personal communications and the literature and, and work I've done myself when living on Pemba and in Wasini and elsewhere, um, <clears throat> You know that 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 I I couldn't do this without all that data, and that's why you know during lockdown, my wife's a, a Zanzibarian, a speaker of of Kiungudja as well, so I have an extra resource there. But I I couldn't do that work without without that that level of um, of of detail. Yeah. Excellent. And and please please, if you have it, don't throw <laughs> don't throw it away. Give it to me or or anybody who 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 who, who is interested in it, because. Some of this knowledge is, is disappearing. And you're right, there's a, there is a lot of variation. And I didn't focus in the talk upon variation. But if you looked at some of the etymologies I gave, you'll see there's quite a few differences. But there are some terms, like the snappers, for which there are a whole series of different terms. There's that Dumbwara, there's Tembo, there's Kungu, there's Mbawa. And there are other ones that I haven't listed. So it's a really big job. I mean, I kind of think, you know, well, if I have nothing else useful to do, maybe I can spend part of the rest of my life just teasing out some of these etymologies because I find it fascinating. And it's about the sort of historical genius of the language. And it tells us something about where it came from. It, it's only one view. Um, it's based on reconstruction. You have to match it with other evidence. We'll never know everything, but it's it's. I think it's a it, it's a you know a really fascinating aspect of, of Swahili, of our historical roots. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin. Um, okay, unless anybody has any other question, we can just move on quickly to. Um, um, the, as I said, I just want to um, thank you so much, Clarissa. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I just want to quickly show you now. Hopefully, it's going to work. Um, okay, so just very briefly, uh, the Center African Studies at SOAS um, has, uh, has been partnering with the uh, Victorian Albert Museum, um, who is, that is currently um, exhibiting uh, an exhibition called Africa Fashion. I'm sure many of you have probably seen it. If you haven't, you must go because it's the most uh, one of the best exhibitions I've seen this year. And um, so it's called Africa Fashion at the Victorian Albion Museum. Uh, because of the exhibition, uh, we have decided to create a partnership and we are doing a series of artist talks um, at SOAS and at the v &A. Uh, We launched the first event uh, um, a few weeks ago with um, uh, the new director of uh, Victorian Albion Museum East. I'm not sure if you're aware the Victorian Albion Museum is opening a, a new site in East London. And the director is our alum, Dr. Gus Caselli Hayford. Uh, so we are very excited. And Dr. Gus Caselli Hayford is also one of our professional practice. And he has been uh, helping us with the series. We launched it uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so we're going to have more events coming up um, again. So follow us at the Center of African Studies. If you're not on the newsletter, uh, let us know. We can add you and then you will receive all the information about the upcoming events. Um, so uh, just in brief, uh, as part of the uh, this a series of events. Um, um, we uh, basically, at SOA, there is a, a scholar called Esbeth Court. She's an expert on East African art. And in fact, she's very sad not to be here today. She's a aficionado of Baraza. She's been coming many times. And she's an expert on uh, a Kenyan, in particular, but also Tanzanian uh, cont uh, contemporary art. 
and uh, she's also been collecting kanga for many many years as the court is you know it's fairly elderly lady now she is uh, an emeritus and so she had this big collection of kanga and the victorian Army museum uh were very interested in seeing the collection and so they asked us uh well that's elizabeth uh, to create a spreadsheet to create a sort of database and, uh, and so uh, i helped her with the um, development of the spreadsheet and today as it was supposed to be here to present the spreadsheet but today as is turning 80 years old uh, so she had to have a, she had a big family uh, party uh, that had been booked for you know a, a couple of years given the the big milestone uh, but she's uh, sending the greetings and then she's hoping that the resource that I'm going now going to open if I manage with the help of of my assistant <laughs> yeah Okay, move it over. No. Okay. Uh, there you go. Okay, so we, we, we're bringing it up to you. Uh, but then, yeah. Um, yeah. There you go. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, what we did, ah, yes, another thing I didn't mention, very important, obviously. Uh, okay, so now uh, talking more specifically about the, the, the database, as you can see. Um, so uh, this database is now available on the uh, Center of African Studies website. And we hope that it can be used as a resource for teaching, as a resource for those interested in art, but also those interested in culture and language. Uh, because one big element of this um, database, as you can see, uh, I'm just kind of scrolling. Um, where am I? Okay. There you go. So uh, we, uh, I just want to show you the, the, the entries that we capture. Uh, so we capture the image, we capture the, um, you know, the dimension, the manufacture, which is very interesting. When Elizabeth Court collected it, what she bought it from. Uh, so there's a lot of things that she collected from the 80s. Uh, onwards and and then there is obviously as you all know the metalli the um, uh, the, the proverb on each kanga and uh, that uh, those metalli have been translated by our own ida and adam i can see them next to each other uh, yeah, a big uh, thanks to them because uh, they've been very, very, very supportive of these. They, they translated um, uh, most, I mean, Esbeth and I tried, but then, uh, yeah, we had the editing of the expert of Swahili language. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so there is also like in notes about how some of the kangas are used, inscription. Uh, but again, uh, what we would like to also uh, do is maybe um, if you find information that is not correct, uh, for instance, or um, especially when it comes to these parts like the, uh, the themes, the notes, um, we're trying to sort of bring up a little bit more information about what they offer, uh, what they can tell us. And so it's, it's a, an initial study, basically. It's just a sort of a way of trying to um, make, make the collection more available uh, to the younger audiences and then maybe foster further research around the use of kanga, about what kanga mean for Swahili culture and language uh, as well. So um, yeah, so I hope you will, uh, you, you will browse it. And uh, thank you so much for listening about this. I, um, okay, so now uh, we're just going to move on. Uh, it's been a quite a long day uh, for everyone. Ah, yeah, Wangui has a question. Uh, there's a question, yeah? Swahili as well. Yeah, yeah, it does here. Yeah, like, um, <laughs> as you can see, I mean, from the image, you can see it very well. But over here, here, uh, I'm just a little bit scared of opening. Uh, I might lose the, the image. So, but I think you can zoom in, you can see the metalli, the, the proverb, and then we typed it out here. Uh, because if you see the top, so that will be the inscription. So those are, that's what it's in Swahili. And then there is the translation. Um, I mean, we did find a few, very few, uh, in not in Swahili, but obviously most of them are. And then uh, there is the translation, uh, the translation there. Yeah, and the team as well, which I, we thought was maybe going to be quite useful for people trying to understand uh, the culture of Kanga um, in North Africa. So, 
yeah, so that's uh, the, the the database. As I said, is an initial. We might hope to also extend it. Uh, again, if anyone has, has collections of kanga they want to make available, maybe talk to us. We could, you know, take them on and also expand, add uh, to, to this database. Uh, because kanga, as you know, has been a topic of research for many, many, many years. There's a lot of book written about it. And I think it's a topic that interests still a lot of people. Um, okay, so thank you so much. Now I'm just calling my uh, co-convener, Ida, uh, uh, to come. Also, uh, we wanted to make a, a, a quick statement, uh, like um, um, we have our um, support today. Rep Cecile Makami is a SOAS PhD student, just graduate. She's been helping us a lot today. So thank you so much. And also people have been approaching uh, you if you wanna say a few words about, uh, where, uh, about the abstract, oh. yeah. Come. I had I had promised to the people that approached me about being sent either abstracts or papers of the presentations today that I will ask Angelica and Ida to circulate a paper for your emails. But Angelica has just made me aware that all of you who have registered online already have um, your emails inside with Angelica. And also online, the abstracts are there. But if you specifically want somebody else's paper from today, you can ask Angelica to talk to that writer or to that presenter on your behalf, and that, present, that, that presenter can send you their paper, if, if that's okay with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so now uh, we just have a few words uh, from Ida. Please come to the stage. Uh, yeah. Our, Sorry. No. Uh, yeah. Today, no, I just want to, yeah, we can close this. Yeah. No, now. thank you very much. I had actually wanted to say, Mariam Dehan, like I, I absolutely loved your presentation <laughs> and I wanted to hear more and I was waiting to hear about the Chunusi, the Joke Chunusi, that sort of like um, eat the fishermen when they're at sea and all that. So, Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for your presentations. Um, no, thank you all for coming. Tunawashukuru sana kwa kuja kujiunga nasi leo. Najua kila mtu takuwa sahibi kesha choka, mekula biriani, sasa hivi mnasikia usingizi. Na kahawa ilikuwa itosh, mabangu wa meniambia, sama hanini sana. Maka kesha, tojide hiyo itafonji itakuwa kahawa nyingi zaidi. Um, lakini kwa kweli asanteni sana unajua shughuli ni watu na kama nyie mgekuwa hampo leo tungekuja hapa na <laughs> screen zetu na birani yetu tukaangaliana kwa hivyo nyinyi ndio mmekuja mmefanya shughuli imekuwa shughuli na hii inakuwa tunafanya kila mwaka mwezi Oktoba kawaida kwa hivyo tunapenda hiyo wakati wa Black History Month um, kwa hivyo mwaka kesho kama mtu atakuwa na presentation tafadhalini karibuni kuna watu kama Martin Walsh walikuwa na sister yangu sikia kwanza tunaendelea pamoja watu wapya Mariam karibuni sana professor Lutz nashukuru sana kwa kila kitu um, 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 Salim Amar tunashukuru sana kwamba mnazidi mna, mna kuja kujiunga nasi jana tulikuwa na warsha ndogo ya tafsiri na tulipata wageni kutoka Marekani uh, Jay na Patrick wamekuja na Aurelie kutoka Ufaransa na tulikuwa na ilikuwa ni washa nzuri sana na sasa tumeamua kwamba tutaendelea kufanya kazi pamoja na kutafsiri na kufanya uh, kutafsiri iwe ni kazi ambayo inafanywa na wengi kwa pamoja kwa hivyo tutapeana moyo na inshallah kutakuwa kuna vitabu vingi zaidi na tutaendelea uh, hivyo. Sasa sijui kama kuna mtu angependa kusema kitu kingine cha mwisho. Nafikiri Jumanne kuna kitu hana ungependa kutangaza? Another talk and maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that I can see uh, also I want to say a big thank to Lutz Martin actually. Lutz, uh, thank you so much for being a fantastic chair as always. He's uh, always a very fantastic chair for Baraza. So next year uh, again. And yeah, Wangui, you have a question? No, I don't have a question, but I want to ask the audience yeah. to permit me to thank you very much and also to congratulate Ida for this translation. Because I think the first, because I think after Razak was here, today really, as uh, uh, Walter said, uh, Nota, Leo, me, we have seen. So yeah. I want to thank you all so much, and I'm very proud to be part of this. Thank you all. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, it, yes, I wanted to say, Ida, please say a few words. Yes. 
organize the mind through her we were able to, to, to get you know wow. so i think she supervised my masters and she remained my teacher throughout my supervisor my teacher and Hannah's teacher <laughs> and she's one of those teachers who when she's a teacher, she becomes your best friend and she just holds you. Oh, and it's just amazing. I'm thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you so much. And on the note, yes, I wanted to say also again that uh, uh, this year Baraza, as we remember some of you, maybe the last Baraza we had, it was a commemoration of the work of Farouk Topan. And uh, so for me, uh, this year Baraza has been a celebration of Ida Ajivajanis. And uh, so the old generation, the new generation, and as I said personally as well for myself, it's been a pleasure working with Ida. Thanks to her, it's like we really feel now we really want to continue with Baraza because myself, I've been here for so many years and it's always like a bit of a struggle to keep going. But then when you have colleagues like that, you just see that it's actually worth continuing. And um, thank you. Are you <laughs> Everyone. And uh, yeah, I think we close it now. Uh, we all had a long day. We probably want to go home, but to, um, yeah, we hope to see you all again soon. Let's stay in touch and uh, let's keep talking. Thank you.